As I pulled up to my favorite diner in the idyllic town of Erie Falls, Washington, I couldn't shake the feeling that life had been too good to be true lately. For a small-town sheriff like me, Randall O'Connor, most days involved settling minor disputes and directing lost tourists. But something felt off that day as if I were looking at our peaceful town through a distorted lens. It wasn't until my third cup of coffee and a half-eaten bacon omelet that the first call came in. My radio crackled to life with an urgent message from Deputy Graves. Sheriff O'Connor, you need to get down to Maple Ridge right now. There's something. Well, you just need to see it for yourself. I raced to Maple Ridge, a relatively secluded area on the outskirts of town known for its hiking trails and lush evergreen forests. When I arrived, I found Deputy Graves standing near what looked like a war zone. Bloodstains painted the leaves crimson, torn fragments of clothing dangled from branches above, and wildlife fleeing from the unnatural scene. Stealing myself against revulsion, I analyzed the scene with meticulous care. The details were brutal. Deep gashes suggested something vicious had attacked a group of hikers. But why? Erie Falls had no history of wild animal attacks or violence on this scale. Over the next few days, more incidents occurred across town with increasing severity. Someone or something was escalating the violence at an alarming rate. Meanwhile, whispers began to circulate around town about an ancient creature from Native American folklore called the Wendigo. Considering this creature was said to possess humans and turn them into cannibalistic monsters who roamed the woods consuming human flesh, I didn't buy into it for a second. But then came the night when everything changed. A few fellow officers and I were investigating another gruesome sight when we caught a glimpse of a horrifying creature. It stood over eight feet tall, with elongated limbs and a monstrous, composite face of both human and deer-like features. Briefly locking eyes with it, I witnessed an intelligence and fury that would haunt me for the rest of my life. We opened fire on the creature pouring multiple rounds into its twisted body, but it vanished into the night without so much as a wound. In that instant, everything I knew about reality fell apart. If we couldn't defeat or contain this monster, what hope did we have? As I continued my investigation, I ended up in contact with an old Native American man named Louis Greywolf. He claimed to be familiar with the Wendigo, and its legend. He shared chilling stories about his ancestors' encounters with this terrifying creature and warned us that our modern weapons would not be enough to stop it. When you confront the Wendigo, Sheriff, he said gravely, you face more than just flesh and bone. You face pure evil born from hunger, desperation, and worst of all, mankind itself. Days went by without another attack as we considered Lewis's harrowing warning. But Erie Falls was not granted lasting peace. The nightmare continued in the form of missing children in the night and horribly desecrated bodies discovered in macabre sacrificial displays. Haunted by desperation and no closer to a resolution, we continued an uphill battle against this seemingly undefeatable antagonist terrified residents began to flee Erie Falls in droves as families fell apart when loved ones fell victim to the terror. Our small town's tranquility was shattered as the dark shadow cast by the Wendigo grew heavier with each passing day. Those who remained were strewn with fear and mistrust as the line between human and monster began to blur in our minds. Did our enemy lurk within us all? Even after mandatory curfews were implemented, the horrors perpetrated by the Wendigo seemed unstoppable. Consumed by our inability to contain this menace, I became drawn further down a path of despair and frantic obsessions as I continued to search for answers that forever eluded me. 
In the end, we never discovered the true identity of the Wendigo or how to defeat it, but the town of Erie Falls was eventually laid to waste. Our once pristine haven had become a cursed shell of despair and darkness. Yet, as I stood in its ruins, one chilling thought lingered with me. Would it ever find a new hunting ground? The horrors of that time are memories that will stay with me forever. I knew I couldn't let Erie Falls become another forgotten, haunted shadow, a place where evil lived and thrived unchallenged. So, with the help of Deputy Graves and Louis Greywolf, we formed a plan. We pooled our resources together, turning to old legends and modern technology alike in search of a weapon that could hold power over the Wendigo. In our search for an answer, we learned about ancient rituals that could potentially ward off evil spirits and draw out the soul of the Wendigo. At the same time, we discovered a new type of experimental ammunition made from a substance that had counteractive effects against supernatural entities like the Wendigo. With each step we took, we braced ourselves for the gruesome reality of what lay ahead if we failed. The dark presence that consumed Eerie Falls only grew stronger by the day. But as time slipped through our fingers, so did our certainty that we could defeat this seemingly invincible foe. Through desperation and sheer determination, we assembled an uneasy truce. Louis Greywolf helped us perform the sacred rites necessary to summon the Wendigo into a vulnerable state, while Deputy Graves and I stood by with guns loaded with this new experimental ammunition. As nightfall arrived, the air grew thick with an eerie silence that clung to the forest's edges. It felt as though even nature held its breath in anticipation. We scoured the bloody scenes where the Wendigo had claimed its victims, places once teeming with life now left barren by unimaginable violence. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity of hunting down leads and piecing together clues, we tracked down the Wendigo's hiding spot, a secluded cave hidden deep within the heart of Erie Falls' once thriving woods. As we approached the entrance to its lair, an undeniable feeling of evil oozed forth from behind the shadow's veil. But with our weapons at the ready, we carefully stepped inside to put an end to the Wendigo's reign of terror. Before long, we came face to face with the creature itself. Its twisted, skeletal form stood at exorbitant heights, its ashen skin stretching taut over sinew and bone. We wasted no time in enacting our plan. Lewis began chanting the ancient words of his ancestors in an effort to weaken the Wendigo, while Deputy Graves and I prepared our firearms. Each syllable from Lewis seemed to draw life from the Wendigo's malevolent gaze, causing its limbs to tremble and its empty sockets to dull. Once Lewis had completed the ritual, it was our turn. Deputy Graves and I opened fire on the creature tearing through its wicked flesh. It howled in pain, staggering back as the new ammunition seemed to be taking effect. Gurgling screams echoed throughout the cave, a perverse symphony of victory mingling with defeat. But despite our triumphs, a lingering question remained. Could we eradicate the evil that dwelled within this monster once and for all? As we stood in that cave with the defeated creature before us, gasping for breath amidst our exhaustion and relief, there was only one thing left to do. We doused the Wendigo's body with gasoline and set it ablaze. As the flames consumed it, melting away twisted flesh and broken bones, we hoped beyond hope that whatever dark seed was contained within the Wendigo would burn with it. In the days that followed that fateful night, a renewed sense of hope began to permeate Erie Falls. Families returned home. Laughter floated on the wind once more through the now quiet streets. Although we may never be able to truly forget the horrors that spilled forth from the Wendigo's insatiable hunger or those grim nights spent in fear that it might strike again, 
an uneasy peace has since settled over Erie Falls. Gone are the gruesome acts of terror and the blood-drenched instances of chaos left in its wake. And while the memory of those dark times will remain rooted in the very core of our town's soul, we've done what we set out to do. The Wendigo no longer casts its shadow over our lives, but I'll forever look over my shoulder and wonder if it's truly gone or lurking somewhere in the shadows, waiting for its chance to claim another unsuspecting town as its feeding ground. On a tranquil summer evening, I decided to take my dog, Nero, for a walk in the breathtaking Muir Woods National Monument just north of San Francisco. My name is Zephyr Kowalczyk, and I am a park ranger assigned to this mesmerizing natural sanctuary. However, on that fateful day, I wasn't there for work but for leisure. As Nero and I walked through the woods, he darted off the path towards something that caught his attention. Chasing after him, I saw him sniffing around the hollow base of an ancient redwood tree. Just then, Moe Fairbank, a fellow park ranger, appeared, steadying her breathing after having sprinted towards us. Zephyr! You won't believe what I found, Moe said exasperated. I noticed her eyes were wide with shock. What happened? I inquired. Mauve led me deeper into the woods, where we discovered a horrifying scene. The mutilated remains of several deer were strewn across a small clearing, their carcasses torn apart as if by some large predator or beast. The air was thick with the stench of blood and decay. Flies buzzed and maggots squirmed on the reddened grass. It was clear that the gruesome act had happened many hours ago. Call it in, Mauve advised. We need to figure out who did this. I sent a message to our supervisor, requesting backup while keeping an eye on Nero, who couldn't tear his gaze away from the grisly sight. Within the hour, our colleagues arrived at the scene along with wildlife experts and local law enforcement. Together, we pieced together a possible culprit, some exceptionally large bear or mountain lion, though either could completely account for the savage ferocity witnessed. As night descended over Muir Woods, inky darkness swallowed our surroundings whole, and an audible growl echoed through the heavy foliage. Mauve and I exchanged horrified glances before realizing Nero was gone. Without a second thought, we sprinted in the direction of the growl, guided only by the beam of our flashlights. My heart pounded in my chest as we delved deeper into the ominous depths of the woods. I called out desperately to Nero but received no response. Finally, Mauve and I stumbled upon a small cave hidden beneath thick underbrush. As we entered, we discovered Nero whimpering in a corner his black fur covered in blood and dirt. Darting our flashlights around the cave, something caught my eye, an oddly placed pile of bones and debris in one corner. Inspecting it closely, alongside an animal expert that had accompanied us, we found an out-of-place indentation, a sort of nest or lair for something almost too large to fathom. There was no mistaking it, Whatever resided here was responsible for these heinous crimes. We decided it was best to leave the cave quickly. As we backtracked slowly into the woods, our surroundings grew eerily silent. It felt as if nature itself was holding its breath. Then there was a subtle rustle just beyond our line of sight. With our cameras on standby, we captured footage of an enormous creature almost reptilian in appearance, with humanoid features and terrifying strength. Before we could react, it vanished into the shadows with terrifying agility, leaving us all dumbstruck. 
The footage made its way up through the park ranger hierarchy but was deemed inconclusive without further proof. As days turned to weeks turned months, the memory dulled, and life continued unabated in near woods, unceremoniously sweeping up another secret beneath its verdant canopy. Nero seemed unfazed after that chilling night, but Mauve and I'll never forget our encounter with what remains an undescribed beast lurking within those woods, forever whispered about in hushed tones by locals who've dubbed it the Muir Tear. Mauve and I couldn't shake the terror of what we had seen deep in the woods. Our curiosity and dread kept us investigating, seeking answers regarding the identity of the creature we now called the Muir Tear. On July 24th, at 3.56 p.m., we gathered a group of experts, including wildlife biologists and paranormal investigators, desperate to uncover the truth. The discovery of another gruesome scene revealed footprints left behind by the Muir Tear after slaughtering a poor hiker. The track showed a bizarre mix of clawed animal and human footprints, igniting our concern for others' safety. We debated whether to close or restrict access to Muir Woods but ultimately decided against it due to potential public panic. Sharing our newfound knowledge with authorities, Mauve and I were determined to resolve this horrifying mystery. Three days later, on July 27th, at exactly 5.12 p.m., we returned to the cave, determined to uncover more clues. As all six members of our group carefully sifted through the evidence, shivers crept up my spine. The creature seems almost angry, I muttered to Mauve. We both jumped in surprise as an ear-piercing screech echoed through the forest. A message? A warning? Panicking, we fled the cave before it was too late. As the sun began setting on July 28th around 6.42 p.m., we heard strange noises coming from nearby bushes, muffled growls mixed with rattling breaths fueling our uneasiness. Expecting another attack from the Muteer, we were shocked when an injured man stumbled out of hiding before collapsing at our feet. His body was covered in lacerations that looked as though he had been attacked by both animal and human hands. His breathing was erratic, and he clutched his side as blood seeped through his fingers. Please, he rasped, help me. Our eyes widened in terror, but we did our best to keep him safe. We bandaged his wounds and supported him as we made our way back to civilization. I saw the monster, he whispered. It was like a man, but not a man fused with a beast for growing from flesh-colored skin and the head of a horrible reptile. Its strength, it's unmatched. As the horrifying description solidified our gruesome findings, our faces grew pale. The truth was more disturbing than any of us could initially fathom. In the days that followed, Mauve and I started closing sections of Muir Woods, giving cover to researching this creature now confirmed to be both man and beast. Community concern regarding disappearances in the area peaked but faced constant disavowal from officials. On August 1st, at 6.36 a.m., Mauve received a call from another park ranger claiming something truly shocking. Amateur local footage captured a partial transformation from human to beast, purportedly revealing the Muir once lived as a man. Although no human identity could be determined from the footage, we realized something had taken place that changed this person, this Muir forever binding them to a life of unforgiving carnage within the depths of these woods. Mauve and I united in vowing not to rest until we learned how this abomination came into existence, and if there was any possibility of reversing its transformation. In a dark act of incomplete resolution, we decided it was necessary to close Muir Woods entirely to protect people from sharing a similar fate with those who had fallen victim to the Muir atrocities. At the close of this chapter, 
however unsettling it was, unanswered questions lingered like a dense fog refusing dispersal. But for now, with the hushed tone of fallen leaves underfoot, Muir Woods remained concealed behind its curtain of darkness, keeping the horrors of the Muir Tirus existence a secret known only to those unfortunate enough to have lived through its terror. This forest held its breath, waiting for a day when the unsettling truth would be revealed. When that day arrives, Mauve and I must confront the dark reality that the Muir continues to lurk in these woods, hidden away, seeking solace in both man's and monster's nature, leaving carnage in its wake as it hungers, senses alert, waiting for another chance to strike. My name is Cole Huxley, and I had never really believed in my grandmother's superstitions. She'd always say that there were monsters lurking in the shadows, waiting for the perfect moment to snatch us up. We'd share a laugh about it, but I never took her tales seriously, at least not until I became a park ranger at Yellowstone National Park. Prior to my shift on October 14, 2012, life was uneventful. I spent most of my time hiking in the park and ensuring the safety of its visitors. On that particular evening, however, everything changed. It felt ordinary, nothing to worry about. One specific area of the park had been temporarily closed due to a combination of flooding and damaged trails, so it was my job to patrol it at night on my own. As dusk gave way to night, I ventured down the familiar path through the deserted woods. The faint light from my flashlight guided me as I listened to frogs croaking nearby and an owl hooting in the distance, typical background noise for this time of year. I was approaching an older tree when suddenly that mischievous, heavy-set squirrel named Finnegan appeared. He would always tease me by running off with my spare granola bars. Finnegan, are you trying to break another tooth? I asked jokingly as he darted off into the darkness. What Finnegan had unintentionally revealed was something entirely else, a grisly sight that made my blood run cold. A mutilated deer carcass lay beneath a massive oak tree, its entrails torn out and strewn over the coarse dirt and fallen leaves. A horrifying sight I had yet to witness during my years of service here. The snapping of twigs somewhere off to my left caught my attention as I jerked my flashlight toward the source of the noise. There was nothing there but more trees and darkness, with no living soul in sight. The hairs on my neck stood up, and an eerie feeling settled over me, like I was being watched. I reported the gruesome discovery to my supervisor, who was baffled by the situation but insisted that it was probably the work of a particularly savage predator, such as a pissed-off grizzly bear. Knowing I couldn't be too careful given the circumstances, I continued to patrol for the remainder of the night with increased scrutiny and vigilance. In the following days, more shocking discoveries plagued the park in the form of mutilated wildlife. It seemed like each day brought forth more bizarre and unexplainable events. Whispers began to spread among my colleagues about a mysterious antagonist with no name. Some speculated about a rogue wolf pack. Others entertained paranoid conspiracy theories. No plausible explanation emerged from our discussions. One fateful morning, after days of these macabre findings, a fellow ranger stumbled upon one of our own, Dan Cornelison, lying on the ground, torn apart in much the same manner as we've seen with animals. Panic gripped the staff. Advice from local law enforcement led us to seek out answers from tribal elders who lived nearby. They spoke of violent spirits that were once held firmly under their control but had recently grown beyond their ability to contain them. 
These spirits would inhabit unknown creatures to commit atrocious crimes, an abomination they could neither control nor destroy. Their warning chilled us all, stay away from its territory or share that horrifying fate. I still work at Yellowstone National Park, but something has shifted for all of us who heard the tribal elder's tale. An unsettling air hangs heavy wherever we go. This nameless entity still haunts us, as does every return journey through those once innocuous woods and in our dreams. Since that day, years ago, Finnegan is no longer coming around. Sometimes I wonder what became of him and if he's another victim. To this day, the identity of the monstrous antagonist remains a mystery. A dark reminder that there are still creatures lurking in the shadows, just as my grandmother once warned. Finnegan's disappearance continued to bother me. I was always on edge and cautious during my patrols. The unsolved mystery that haunted Yellowstone weighed heavily on all of us, but I couldn't just let it go. I needed answers. One night, after finishing a particularly exhausting shift, I stumbled across an old folklore book in the park's library. It was a dusty, leather-bound tome that had probably been handed down through generations. Flipping through the pages, I found a story that struck me as eerily familiar, an ancient tale about powerful spirits that could possess creatures and force them to commit unspeakable atrocities. My heart pounded as I read further coming across a passage that described a ritual practiced long ago by shamans to summon and control these spirits. Armed with this newfound knowledge, I decided to give it a try. If there was even the slightest chance that it could help put an end to the terror haunting Yellowstone and solve Finnegan's disappearance, it was worth the risk. I gathered the necessary items for the ritual, salt, candles, and some personal belongings of those who had suffered at the hands of whatever inhabits this land, and set out towards the heart of it all, the spot where we found Dan Cornelison, and where everything started going horribly wrong. As dusk fell, I lit the candles in a circle around me and began reciting the incantation from the folklore book. My voice quivered at first but gained strength as I continued. The wind picked up around me, swirling leaves into the air as it carried my words deeper into Yellowstone. Suddenly, my flashlight flickered off. Seconds later, its cone of light returned, this time illuminating a grotesque figure standing just beyond the circle of candles. It had blood-red eyes that burned with hate, and its head resembled that of a goat or ram. Its body seemed deceptively human but radiated unspeakable malice. Fall creature! I shouted, my voice trembling with fear and determination. I command you! Reveal the truth behind these horrors! The wind roared, and the thing let out an ear-splitting scream. As if in response, spectral figures emerged from every direction all the past victims that had met their end in Yellowstone. Among the gathering spirits, I saw Finnegan. My heart ached, but I held my ground. In an unnatural voice that sounded like many voices at once, the fiend spoke. Foolish human, you have no power over me. My reign in this realm is absolute. Despite its taunts, I noticed its gaze flicking nervously from me to the encircling spirits. Perhaps I don't, I replied with growing confidence. But they do. At my words, the spirits of those it had tormented moved closer to the monstrous being, their expressions now determined and unafraid. Realizing it was cornered, the creature let out a guttural sound of desperation but was quickly drowned out by the chorus of angry voices from beyond the grave. The sheer force of their collective fury surged towards the demon-like entity before me. It began to thrash violently as its body twisted and contorted, 
letting out blood-curdling screams with every blow dealt by its vengeful victims. Suddenly, there was an explosive burst of light as it disintegrated into nothingness. As the light faded and silence replaced chaos, I found myself standing alone in a forest now devoid of any trace of supernatural evil. The spirits had vanished along with their tormentor, finally free from his grip. I knew then that what we experienced had been the fevered manifestation of one malevolent spirit's twisted desires. Our fear had only fueled its horrifying power. By joining forces with those it had wronged and finding the courage to face it, I had been able to put an end to its reign of terror. Since that night, Yellowstone has returned to its natural state and each day feels a little less haunted. I'll never forget what happened or the lives lost, but I can now patrol these beautiful lands without fear. As for Finnegan, his memory lives on in my heart, and with the threat gone, I like to think that his spirit is now at peace in these woods that he loved. The truth of it all remains buried with me, something only the whisperings of those trees will ever recall. It was a Wednesday two years ago when I became a part of the most bizarre crime scene you can imagine, something straight out of a horror movie. But before we jump into that, let me tell you something about myself. My name is Bartley Knox, and I am a wildlife biologist. And no, my work isn't only about frolicking with animals in the wild. Rather, it involves evaluating specific areas for environmental impact from proposed human development. It's not what you'd call an exciting job, but it has its moments. And so, I found myself deployed to Gallatin National Forest in Montana in late January, in the freezing cold, on what you could say was a wild goose chase. You see, reports had come in of unidentifiable animal attacks in the area, leaving behind the grisly sight of numerous carcasses mangled and torn apart in ways unprecedented. The first few days were fairly mundane. Apart from the cold that bit into my skin like countless frozen ants, there wasn't much to report. That was until we came across our first crime scene. Underneath the cover of frozen branches and fallen bark, an elk strewed all over the ground like tossed clothing. It was gruesome down to every last detail, blood splattered as though mercilessly thrown from a bucket, flesh undulating strangely under open wounds and half concealed by fresh white snowfall. Frankie Devoto, my partner on this project, who also happens to be my best friend since high school, stood beside me with slack-jawed disbelief. It didn't take us long to determine that these were not the workings of an ordinary beast. The twisted geography of horror that lay splintered around us reeked of impending dread. As days turned into exhausting weeks, both the frequency and intensity of these scenes increased at an alarming rate, as if whatever it reveled in this carnage and chaos. Something's not right, Bart. Frankie nervously sketched cross sections of a carcass in his notebook. This isn't the type of predator attack I've ever seen. Operating under cloak and dagger obscurity, we began investigating putting together pieces that made less sense as we dove further into this abyss. It was then that I saw it. On February 20th, on a night speckled with distant stars twinkling sympathetically against an obsidian sky, it made its first live attack. Emerging from amongst ferns bathed in silver by moonlight stood this unnameable monstrosity, human-like but utterly grotesque with distended limbs attached haphazardly to a mangled body. Its eyes bore into mine with palpable malevolence before disappearing as quickly as they came. The following apprehension that took hold left us frenzied. 
We sent alarmed reports scrambling back home, only for each to be countered with increasing accusation, skepticism, and finally blatant dismissal. Days turned into nights, and nights rolled into days with almost maniacal rapidity, resonating with our futile struggle against an antagonist far more incomprehensible than previously assumed. We started noticing eerie symbols grazed onto tree trunks or carved in the snow, menacingly jagged symbols that we deduced were its calling cards or marks, well after its actions had ended. Finally, on March 13th, everything came crashing down when Frankie never returned from an intended reconnaissance mission nearby our base campsite. Hastily led torchlights yielded nothing but his notebook containing increasingly disjointed entries, eerily ending with, It's human! I stumbled back home soon after, defeated and irrevocably changed. While Frankie remained missing to date, his face frozen on missing posters plastered all around town while whispers continued to float regarding his whereabouts oblivious to the monstrous reality lurking at Gallatin National Forest. Now here I sit recounting this tale, hoping someone reads it and realizes that there are creatures out there far removed from our understanding, eagerly waiting within obscured shadow lines. Perhaps right now, it's watching someone else waiting. My days were filled with deciphering the cryptic symbols left behind by the creature, and trying to find any meaning in its actions. My mind was consumed by thoughts of Frankie and an incessant desire for answers. No one else seemed to take this seriously, and so I turned to an unlikely source, the world of conspiracy theorists. They had their own bizarre explanations, ranging from ancient curses to the desire for power and wealth. I knew I needed evidence if I wanted others to believe me. However, doing so proved harder than expected. For months, I tried setting up cameras near the locations where the attacks occurred. But every time, the equipment would be found destroyed or missing altogether. This only fueled my determination to expose this creature. Nearly a year after losing Frankie, I got a lead I couldn't ignore. A man named Thomas Krieger claimed he had encountered a similar monster over a decade ago in another remote forest and that it was tied to something called dangerous occult rituals performed by people hungry for power. This piqued my interest. I met Thomas at a diner in town, where we shared our stories and exchanged information about our encounters with these creatures piecing together loose connections between isolated cases of missing people and strange tales from locals across the country. Feeling slightly paranoid but indefinitely more informed, I decided to follow his advice, research into ancient occult practices and smuggling artifacts they believed held power over life and death. They sought immortality, power over others, or an ever-elusive sense of control. A week later, as dusk settled in at Gallatin National Forest, I ventured out determinately. Armed with carefully composed notes on potential counter-rituals to stop these monsters derived from my research into ancient folklore and dark mysticism, it was time for action. As night approached and shadows danced in eerie synchronicity, guided by that otherworldly instinct governing certain aspects of human behavior, I arrived at a clearing and began to meditate, focusing on the creature with every ounce of my being. And then, just as the first stars emerged above the treetops, I felt it, an unseen presence lurking nearby, malevolent and hungry for chaos. Over the rustling of leaves and shallow breaths, I heard a familiar voice chokingly whisper, Bart! At that moment, the impossible truth became clear to me. Somehow, this monster's existence was tied to Frankie's fate. My heart sank as I tried to grapple with this realization. But as unnatural footsteps moved closer, there wasn't any time for mourning. 
It was kill or be killed, or perhaps worse yet. So I closed my eyes and began reciting ancient verses from my notes, never faltering even as the creature shredded its way through the underbrush toward me. Then suddenly silence. As I finished my incantation, the chilling wind around me swirled once more before subsiding altogether. Cautiously opening my eyes, expecting to come face to face with that horrific monster yet again, I instead saw Frankie's lifeless body slumped before me in the moonlight. Tears streaming down my cheeks, I held on to Frankie's cold body as long-lost memories of countless childhood adventures surfaced within my mind's eye. It was finally over. At what cost, though? The life of a dear friend was sacrificed in an eternal pursuit of the darkest desires known to mankind. The sun began to rise above Gallatin National Forest, casting morning shadows over my solitary form crumpled against a fallen log. The secrets uncovered at such a high price remain untold by those unaware of their existence, and I intend to keep it that way for their own safety. But now you know. It's out there. I write this tale not for pity or praise but as a cautionary tale against delving into the shadows, where unspeakable horrors dwell. I've lost a piece of myself in this quest for truth, and my days are now spent in solitude and study. As for the mysterious antagonists and their dark secrets, they remain alive, hiding in the recesses of history, out of reach of moral comprehension. The moral price paid for meddling in the forbidden is a steep one, and I'll carry it forward into uncertainty. So, as you tread the wild paths of life's winding journey, beware the monsters lurking within the unknown, not all secrets yearn to be uncovered. And some may just cost you everything dear to you, I got into hunting because of my drunken father. I began, sipping from a bottle of cheap beer. What a way to start a tale. His slurred words about nature and survival were the background noise of a childhood marred by random bouts of violence and inebriated weeping. My father imparted the knowledge of setting traps, identifying animal tracks, and shooting with an aim honed by awkward bonding after heated arguments and uncontrollable sobbing. Hurricane, West Virginia, was where I ended up when I decided to ditch city life for good. People know each other here. It's more of a vast, spread-out family than a town. But that wasn't why I decided on Hurricane. Back in Pittsburgh, I went by Daniel O'Keefe. Out here... People know me as Chogon Swiftfoot. I took my mother's Native American roots to build myself a new identity. In the third week of November 2003, while scanning a rustic landscape speckled with signs of potential quarry through my rifle scope, I felt something, an unnatural stillness glossing over the scene like an invisible coat of ice. Hours rolled by as I sat perched on my camouflaged crow's nest until slivers of golden sunlight began crawling over the horizon. That's when it happened. A group well acquainted with hunting and outdoor life went missing after they set out camping in the densely wooded region bordering Hurricane. Four in number, Stella Beavers, the local tattoo artist's wife, along with his brother Carl Beavers, their mutual friend Lila Birchfield, and Mitchell Nixon, the hardware store owner's son. Their bodies were found appallingly dismembered and sprawled haphazardly across their ravaged campsite, savagely mauled by something predatory. Deep gashes were carved across their faces, cementing expressions of terror into ghostly masks on severed heads details seared into my memory despite the sheriff's best attempt to withhold them. 
not quite what you'd expect from a town with family talking to each other. For something so violent to occur in a quietly humming hurricane seemed blasphemous, and hints towards unruly wildlife or mentally unhinged people wouldn't hold any water given what we found on sight. Forensics had trouble identifying what could have caused such horrific damage. The teeth marks didn't match any known creature. They were too big. Then came sightings. Strange shapes lurking at the edges of the forest under cover of darkness, ominous sounds echoing through the thickets at odd hours, unnerving residents further. But the lack of credible evidence masked these occurrences under baseless rumors until one evening when Stella's widower came rushing through town screaming about seeing something. He described it as an unnaturally tall figure with burnt chestnut skin stretched taut over its skeletal contour and glowing eyes that pierced through shadows under its low and broad-set brow flanked by large decaying antlers. An unholy amalgamation exuding malice that chilled him to his core. Old native folklore tells tales of Wendigos, ancient entities capable of inconceivable horrors. But why should such beings surface now? Days blurred into weeks as chilling encounters stacked up. An unsettling pattern started to form. Isolated incidents amalgamated into a series of deliberate strikes straining credulity if chalked off as mere coincidence. And any notion regarding human interference evaporated like morning fog under scrutiny. Things escalated quickly one night when Gustavo Perkins, the local garage owner, went missing from his home while his wife lay trembling in her bed, recounting decaying antlers silhouetted against their brightly lit porch festooned for Christmas. It really was all too real. Probing deeply into these happenings made me confront their reality head-on. We were being stalked and hunted. Once hunted solely for necessity, I now find solace in mastering it. Only in this direst hour did I realize I had unwittingly become the game being pursued. For truly challenging tables have turned, fear mounting, senses sharpening. I was pitted against an old god, who knew everything about us but us. Upon retrieving Gartevo's mangled body miles deep into snowy woodlands, a daunting revelation struck all too late. Whatever held sway over us traced its roots back to native soil over centuries ago, an entity defying humanity, an indomitable predator who existed before our time. As fear crept once again under our sheets, horrifying tales whispered around stoked hearths, spreading the terror we felt. I decided to investigate further, delving into ancient legends and myths. That's when I discovered the Wendigo's weakness, offerings of gratitude and respect toward nature. The following evening, I planned a stakeout in the woods, armed with materials for a small offering. I built a pyre where I lit sage leaves, sprinkled tobacco, and played soothing music on my wooden flute despite my trembling fingers. Darkness crept around me as I stood alone amidst the trees. Suddenly, I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. The shadowy figure emerged, stepping cautiously into the clearing. It was the Wendigo, its grotesque form looming menacingly over me. The stench of rotting flesh filled my nostrils as it closed in on me. But then something unexpected happened. It stopped in its tracks. Its piercing eyes were fixated on the ritual site, its features seemingly shifting from malice to curiosity. Just stay calm. Show it. You're not a threat. I murmured to myself while lowering myself to one knee and offering the flute with an outstretched hand. The Wendigo hesitated for a moment before calmly extending a large clawed hand far more tender than expected with such power at its fingertips. As it barely brushed against my fingers to receive the flute, it scanned my eyes for deceit but found none. I could see that its previously cruel, 
An evil demeanor began to lessen as it lowered its head closer to me. It raised its free hand towards the heavens and whispered an ancient incantation in tongues long since lost but not forgotten. Suddenly the sickly stench faded, replaced by a calming scent of earth and fresh rain. We locked eyes once more, no longer hunter and prey but two beings who had found understanding and mutual respect within one another's gaze. The Wendigo slinked back into the shadows, releasing a sorrowful sigh that reverberated throughout the night. Various townspeople would later report more strange happenings in the woods, but the ferocity they held before seemed diluted now, few whispers in comparison to the screaming menace that had plagued us. Life carried on, and hurricane folk no longer cowered in fear at the thought of the ancient Wendigo. We had found a fragile truce, teetering on the very edge of being shattered by an ounce more weight. I continued my hunts alone, maintaining my own respect for nature while stalking prey. The Wendigo lurked in my thoughts perpetually, its twisted form obscuring any semblance of rational thought within its maw. In those rare moments where we locked eyes on clear moonlit nights, I knew, deep down, that our ceasefire was temporary, a delicate dance in which one misstep could result in devastation. Now whenever you hear eerie whispers or feel as if you are being watched among those trees encircling hurricane, it might be best to remember the most vital lesson I've learned since that fateful night. Give nothing but respect and gratitude towards what hunts within the darkness. It has power over things you can't even imagine. I've always had a knack for finding things people would rather keep hidden. Old love letters embarrassing yearbook photos, things that seemed trivial at the time but held the weight of memories and secrets behind them. I guess what I'm trying to say is that my life hasn't always been the most ordinary or by the book. But nothing could have prepared me for what happened on that camping trip in M.T. Hood National Forest in Oregon. It was a few years ago, and I'd rented an RV with some friends to explore the area. We had parked up near a lake and spent a week fishing, swimming, and drinking way too many beers around the campfire. My name is Felix Mitchell, and my friends Grant and Audrey were along for the ride. The weather was perfect, sunny days and cool star-filled nights that made you feel like you were living in your very own little corner of paradise. But then everything changed. Audrey was cooking something on our makeshift grill when Grant announced he was going for another swim in the lake. It wasn't long before we heard his screams piercing through the otherwise peaceful afternoon. Running down to the water's edge, we saw him thrashing around in the lake, his face twisted in pain. Glimpses of something large surfaced, then vanished beneath the water's surface as bloody, frothy waves lapped at the shore. Without thinking, I rushed into the water to help him while Audrey called 911 from her cell phone on poor reception. By some miracle, we managed to drag him out of there alive, but whatever had attacked him had taken three of his fingers and left deep gashes stretching from his wrist almost to his shoulder. The police arrived about an hour later, shaken by Grant's appearance and by whatever kind of beast managed to do this. An officer hung back to talk with us as Grant was loaded into an ambulance. You know, there have been rumors of something out here preying on folks who venture too far into the woods. He said in a low, terse voice as if he didn't quite believe it himself. But we've never been able to track it down. Listeners to local legends and gossip might have heard whispers about a creature dubbed Scar Shredder that was said to lurk in the forest. But nobody could know for sure if it was just another tall tale or something more. Well, none of us were in any rush to find out, 
so we packed up our stuff and began the journey back to civilization. Except, things didn't get easier once we'd left the lake behind. As we drove away, we couldn't shake the feeling that we were being followed. It felt like something was keeping pace with us, lurking in our blind spots. We'd catch flashes of movement distorting the shadows at the edge of the road, a dark shape moving between the trees that seemed like an itch we couldn't scratch. It wasn't long before it attacked again. We were approaching a bend in the road when something enormous rammed into the side of our RV, its bulk shaking our little haven on four wheels to its foundations. The nearest gas station was a good half-hour drive away, and I floored the accelerator as fear coursed through us all. Our attacker suddenly emerged onto the road ahead of us. Its silhouette was partially hidden by shadows cast from tree branches moving in sync with each step. Or was that tentacle, making it difficult to figure out where each part ended and another began? Its eyes seemed phosphorescent as they fixed menacingly on our vehicle. It flung itself against our RV again, this time forcing us off course and sending us crashing through the underbrush until both RV and unearthly beasts rolled down a steep embankment together. When I came to minutes later, or had it been hours, I found myself battered and bruised, alone in the wreckage. Grant had vanished without a trace while Audrey lay lifeless nearby, her neck twisted gruesomely. It was at that very moment, when my life was blighted by loss and blood that I realized that we were all just toys for this creature's amusement. Its name remained a mystery to me, locked away with the countless legends buried in these woods. A sudden growl from the thicket reminded me of its presence, closing in for another kill. And as I scrambled upright to meet my inevitable fate head-on, I knew this tale would only end in death. In the last seconds of my life, I could feel my heart pounding in my chest like a jackhammer. The creature lunged at me, saliva dripping from its twisted mouth, and I braced myself for the inevitable pain to come. As fate would have it though, the world isn't always as predictable as we think it is. Just as the beast was about to tear me apart, a sudden, thunderous roar echoed through the forest. Time seemed to slow down as I watched in shock as another monstrous being materialized out of thin air. This newcomer was different. While it still possessed monstrous features, a sense of gentle wisdom and tranquility seemed to surround it. The two creatures clashed, their snarls and growls shaking the trees around us in their savage battle. Rolling out of harm's way, I watched with wide-eyed awe as the new arrival defended me against my attacker. The nightmare that had haunted our trip suddenly became a gargantuan brawl, like something straight out of a movie. Blood mottled the forest floor as they tore into each other relentlessly. It wasn't long before their fight carried them further from my position the crunching of branches and guttural screams fading into the distance. Too battered to move far, I waited until their roars became faint echoes before heaving myself up from the muddy ground and limping slowly back to what was left of our RV. Half an hour later, with adrenaline subsiding and fatigue settling in my bones, I stumbled upon a cell signal and dialed 911. At first, the operator didn't believe me when I told her what had happened, but after hours of detailed explanations and interviews with law enforcement officers who were finally dispatched to the scene, one thing became clear. There was more to this world than anyone had previously thought possible. Months have passed since that dreadful day in M.T. Hood National Forest. Authorities claimed that they couldn't find any trace of the creatures involved, but my memory of the encounter continues to haunt me. Out of curiosity and what some may call an unhealthy obsession, I began researching the legends and folklore surrounding Mount Hood. 
Eventually, I stumbled across ancient texts discussing the existence of supernatural beings that acted as protectors of the land. These beings were ancient spirits living among us, silently maintaining the balance between good and evil in a world with hidden dangers lurking in the shadows. Audrey is gone, Grant remains crippled from that terrifying encounter, and my life has taken a sharp turn, diverging entirely from my ordinary path. But now I have an unshakable need to understand what happened and why a newfound determination to explore the unknown and uncover the secrets this world hides from us all. And so begins a new mission for me, a quest for knowledge and justice. Somewhere deep in these woods lurks the sinister thing that attacked us, but I also believe there's an ally waiting to be discovered. In memory of those we've lost along the way, I'll embrace the darkness to shed light on unforeseen realms. Eventually, I hope to reveal the truth behind these mysterious guardians so perhaps others can find solace and protection. Through it all, one thought remains constant. The world is stranger than we ever imagined, and no matter what befalls me in my pursuit for answers, life may never again be ordinary for Felix Mitchell. My obsession with collecting rare coins started when I was a teenager, and the thrill of finding an unusual specimen and learning its history drove me to visit countless small towns and meet some rather eccentric characters through the years. Little did I know that my hobby would lead me down a path involving some of the most twisted and horrifying events of my life. My name is Harvey Denton. And this is one story I thought I'd never share. I had decided to take a long weekend trip in search of a few obscure coins rumored to be tucked away in an old antique shop located in a town called Gadwell, Georgia. I rented an RV for the journey to enjoy the scenic route while comfortably traversing the countryside. As I approached the town, I noticed how it seemed as if time had stood still in Gadwell leaving behind a sleepy yet slightly unnerving atmosphere. I arrived at the antique shop just before closing, taking my time browsing through their eclectic collection, when an ordinary-looking man struck up a conversation with me. He introduced himself as Frank Murphy, an occasional coin enthusiast like myself. He mentioned hearing rumors about a group of locals conducting some sort of secret meeting near the outskirts of town but wasn't sure if they were just paranoid whispers or actual cause for concern. I didn't pay much attention to Frank's story until later that night when I was settling into my RV for sleep. My curiosity got the better of me, and soon enough, I found myself driving along the desolate backroads leading out of town. The deafening silence was broken by faint sounds of what seemed like chanting, drawing closer as I cautiously followed its source. My heart pounded as I stumbled upon a small gathering around a makeshift altar. Unseen by them, my stomach churned as I witnessed gruesome scenes, mutilated animal carcasses placed around the altar, symbolizing some twisted ritualistic offering. The chants grew louder. Suddenly, one figure stepped forward, wearing a grotesque mask made from the skin of a deer. Realizing the situation was escalating out of control, I crouched down and tried to quietly retreat, but in my haste, I snapped a twig beneath my foot. The chanting stopped abruptly. Terror gripped me as I bolted back to my RV, hastily driving off into the dark night. Despite shaking hands and a pounding heart, I managed to put a significant distance between myself and the group before finding somewhere to hide for the night. Sleep eluded me as nightmares consumed my thoughts. The sun finally rose, and with it came some sense of safety. Still shaken from the terrifying encounter, 
I decided it was time to leave Gadwell and its twisted secrets far behind. Word of the macabre gathering spread like wildfire through the town's grapevine, and though law enforcement found evidence of strange happenings at the site I described, no arrests were made in connection with the eerie ritual. Days later, I received an anonymous letter in the mail containing chilling details that would haunt me forever. The group I had stumbled upon called themselves Deerwalkers. An ancient cult originating in 16th century Europe composed of people who worship a demonic deity known only as the Horned One. They continued their gruesome practices even after they migrated to America, taking part in bloody sacrifices meant to summon this unspeakable evil. To this day, that name holds power over me an unshakable dread that refuses to let go of its terrifying grip on my soul. And every time I find myself alone on those long country roads at night, searching for my next rare coin find or another small town almost forgotten by history, I can't shake the feeling that somewhere out there in the darkness, the deer walkers are still watching, waiting. So, I decided to dig deeper into the mystery of the deer walkers and their sinister rituals. I knew it was dangerous, but something inside me refused to let go. I became the hunter, tracking and researching the dark recesses of ancient cults on the internet. I registered on a forum whose members seemed to have intimate knowledge about such secret societies. My secret persona, coin underscore collector, engaged with other users in conversations about various cults throughout history. One day, out of nowhere, a user with the name Deer underscore Hunter sent me a private message. Coin collector, I see you're pretty familiar with our friends in Gladwell. Want to know more? They wrote. I hesitated for a moment before replying. Yes, but who are you? And how did you know? Don't worry about that. Just meet me at Milton's Diner in Gladwell next Saturday at noon. They instructed. I couldn't resist. The following Saturday, my heart pounded as I entered Milton's Diner. Sitting at a booth near the back was a man wearing sunglasses and sipping coffee. Assuming this was Deer underscore Hunter, I cautiously joined him. Lowering his sunglasses, he whispered, You're even braver than I thought. My name's Alex Warren. I'm an undercover investigator specializing in bringing down dangerous cults. He handed me an ancient book titled, The Rise and Fall of the Deer Walkers. While we made small talk over coffee and pie, Alex revealed that his previous partner was killed when they got too close to exposing the sex leader. He also mentioned that several members of Deer Walkers came from wealthy families who protected them from any prosecution by using their influence within town authorities. And then things took an even darker turn. Alex relayed stories of grotesque killings across the region, where bodies were found drained of blood with deer skins draped over them. This was the calling card of the Deer Walkers. As I listened intently to Alex's gut-wrenching account, a diner patron sitting nearby suddenly left and hurried out the door. Alex caught it in his peripheral vision and realized, We need to leave now. We've been made. We burst out of the back of the diner like hunted animals, sprinting into the dense nearby woods. We could hear the footsteps of our pursuers close behind us. As we hid behind a large tree, Alex revealed that he had pieced together the identity of the Deer Walkers leader, a powerful town figure no one would ever suspect. Just when we thought we had lost our pursuers, Alex suddenly slumped over with a horrific gurgling sound echoing from his throat. An arrow had found its mark. He was dead before he fell to the ground. As I dodged arrows whizzing through the trees, I desperately tried to come up with an escape plan. Anger and fear mixed within me as I grasped at straws. 
Then it hit me. I had an idea. With a deep breath, I mustered courage and started shouting cultist phrases from the rise and fall of the deer walkers. It surprisingly worked. My pursuers stopped their attack momentarily, apparently startled or unsure if they'd mistaken me for someone else, one of their own. I took advantage of this confused moment, weaving further into the dense forest. As night fell, my legs propelled me through the darkness until I finally found myself miles away from Gladwell. I made it my life's mission to expose the deer walker's terror while keeping my true identity hidden, using smartphone apps and social media platforms under various pseudonyms. Sometimes late at night, when there's a knock at my door or an unusual shadow lurking behind a tree, I feel their presence looming over me. I stay on the move, keeping one step ahead of those who would silence me. My life is like a game that never ends. I've made countless enemies, but with each passing day, I've saved lives by sharing my experiences with the world. And so here I am, a chameleon in the shadows, telling my stories to anyone who will listen, driven by vengeance and fear of the truth ever being forgotten. To those who stumble across my tale, let this be a warning. Remember, the deer walkers are watching. They are waiting. It all started in a tiny diner on Route 66. I remember glancing at the clock on the wall, the minute hand stuttering to a stop at exactly 6.43 p.m., June 19, 2013. The sun was setting outside, casting a dusky orange glow through the windows, which were haphazardly decorated with cracks and smudges from years of wear. I, Ezra Chamberlain, had just wrapped up a meeting with my usual contact and was preparing to head home. I'd always been the type to immerse myself in my work as a CIA operative, but today had been particularly draining. A puff from my cigarette filled the air with tendrils of smoke, mixing with the sizzling sound that emanated from the adjacent kitchen. As I prepared to leave, I overheard a pair of locals whispering about strange occurrences happening nearby. Their voices shook me from my days. They spoke in hushed tones of a creature that seemed too malevolent to be true or too bizarre even for this part of rural Arizona. His name is Kieran Barker, said one man. He elaborated, explaining how he'd heard about Barker from his cousin two towns away who had said that the creature was a sinister force capable of unimaginable horrors. I didn't pay much attention to their claims until one evening, when something felt off. My partner, Dalton Caldwell, and I found ourselves out on an assignment in an isolated stretch of terrain. As we ventured deeper into the brush, barely taking notice of our surroundings enveloped in darkness, we caught sight of an eerie figure lurking in the shadows. The atmosphere had changed from mere unease to palpable terror in an instant, and we fumbled for our pistols as our hearts raced with anticipation. Our conversation about its intentions turned grim when we realized how many lives it had already claimed, bodies eviscerated and torn to shreds, their remains littered throughout the landscape. A sickening sense of dread clung to us as we recounted each story in bone-chilling detail. The truth became clear. It wasn't Kieran Barker who was stalking us. Kieran Barker himself no longer existed. The man those locals had once spoken of had been transformed into a grotesque creature from deep within folklore's darkest corners. This thing, this beast, held nothing but malice for anything and anyone on this earth. Despite the terror we felt, Dalton and I had become fixated on the idea that we had to bring this creature down. 
Weeks turned into months as we investigated and pieced together the creature's patterns and habits. The monster had grown bold with confidence, leaving trails of blood and pain behind it in its sadistic wake. Yet somehow, we clung to our resolve, strategizing how best to confront and capture it. There were times when Dalton seemed almost like a machine with his unyielding focus, but there was also a flicker of genuine fright stirring within him. Our final confrontation took place at an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town, a fitting setting for one last deadly duel as rain poured from the sky above. Our bullets tore through the night as we launched our desperate assault to end its reign of terror. In the gloom of the room, amid toppled crates and pools of blood, I glimpsed a hint of what Kieran Barker might have looked like before his grisly transformation, an eerie reminder that true evil is seldom so easily recognized or understood. The battle was hard fought, with brutal injuries and moments when death seemed all but certain for one or both of us. And yet, in that chaos, we managed to emerge victorious as the beast breathed its last ragged breath upon the concrete floor. Dalton stared at me as silence drifted upon our ears. Adrenaline, once pumping furiously through us, started receding. It was over. The twisted legend of Kieran Barker has finally been put to rest. Only after returning to our makeshift headquarters did we receive the news. Kieran Barker, the man behind the monster, had perished in those previous incidents. As for his origin, we never knew with absolute certainty what force had thrust him back into this world. To this day, all we can surmise is that whatever malevolence claimed Kieran's soul well and truly lived up to its dark reputation as a creature of pure evil one that left a trail of blood and destruction in the name of unfathomable horrors. In the years that followed, Dalton and I continued our work as CIA operatives, always vigilant for new threats and challenges. The lessons we learned from the Kieran Barker case permeated how we approached our assignments. We never took things for granted again, and with good reason, a few years later, rumors surfaced of another similar creature roaming in distant lands. Though we pursued these leads tirelessly, it seemed as if we were always one step behind. It wasn't long before other agents began seeking us out for guidance on handling supernatural cases. We complied willingly, hoping that through sharing our knowledge and experience, we might prevent others from suffering the same fate that befell Kieran Barker and his unfortunate victims. The haunting memories of that fateful encounter were never far from our minds. Every time we drew our weapons or laid eyes on a new suspect, we thought about the horrifying adversary who had given us the fight of our lives. We carried a heavy burden, knowing that other monstrous beings could be lurking in the shadows but also understanding that there would always be more battles to fight. Over time, our shared experience evolved into something resembling friendship between Dalton and me, an uncommon union born amidst bloodshed and terror. Bound together by this harrowing ordeal, we remained steadfast allies in the unrelenting pursuit of justice against evils beyond human comprehension. To this day, I still frequent diners, not unlike the one where it all began to reflect upon my unlikely journey as a defender against monstrosities lurking in darkness. A journey not only wrought with danger but also replete with incredible bonds forged through shared pain and sacrifice. And now, armed with a greater understanding of the unseen terrors awaiting beyond the veil, I can only hope that Dalton and I will continue to prove ourselves worthy adversaries in a world riddled with enigmatic horrors yet to be uncovered. It's said that knowledge is the key to understanding, 
But sometimes, the more you know, the less you understand. That was what I pondered as I nervously tapped my fingers on the steering wheel, driving along an unnervingly lonely road in one of the most popular canyons in the USA, the Grand Canyon. My name is Leonidas Harrington, and believe it or not, I'm a criminology professor. This unusual road trip began after an offhand invitation from a long-lost college buddy named Ezekiel Montgomery. When he called me and said he'd stumbled onto something strange in his work as a park ranger, I was skeptical but intrigued. As we parked our car by a dense cluster of trees and began to hike further into the canyon, we exchanged friendly banter and personal updates. However, his laughter couldn't entirely mask an undercurrent of unease. An hour into our trek, Ezekiel's demeanor changed abruptly. We're here, he said, pointing to a mutilated animal carcass sprawled in a small clearing. I felt bow rise in my throat as I spotted its organs strewn around it like a sickly parody of confetti. Ezekiel took out his notebook and showed me his records of unusual occurrences surrounding animal attacks with similar levels of inexplicable gore. Listening to Ezekiel lay out these unsettling details stirred a sense of dread within me that gripped me tighter with each revelation. I know it sounds crazy, Leo, he whispered, scanning the area with nervous eyes, but there doesn't seem to be any rational explanation for all this. Suddenly, from deep within the canyon came an inhuman scream that echoed through the rocky walls like nature itself crying out in agony. We exchanged fearful glances and decided to abort our investigation and return to civilization as quickly as possible. As twilight descended around us, an eerie silence followed our footsteps through the canyon. Shadows seemed to dance along with the swaying trees, fueling our mounting paranoia. We argued in an endless loop of possible explanations, desperate to untangle reality from myth. The shadows grew thicker as we hurried down the narrow path, and the grotesque images from Ezekiel's case files flashed frighteningly in my mind. Our conversations grew terse and disjointed as tension overwhelmed us. My pulse raced when I suddenly realized that we had made no progress. No matter how long or fast we walked, we remained trapped in an unsettlingly timeless loop of rocks and trees. I grabbed Ezekiel's arm, but before I could voice my growing panic, he pointed with a trembling finger toward a dark figure watching us from the nearby brush. An icy chill settled down on us as we stared open-mouthed at its unnatural shape. Humanoid but with limbs that bent in twisted ways and eyes that glowed like embers in the moonlight. Unable to move or even speak, we stood frozen in fear as it began to approach. In its malicious gaze I understood that this creature, whatever it was, hungered for our pain and terror. Our instincts finally kicked in, and our legs propelled us forward in a blind sprint. Every labored breath teased suffocation, while adrenaline spurred us on despite our exhaustion. As we ran for our lives through the winding canyon trails, I felt the malevolent presence following close behind, tauntingly remaining just out of sight. Miraculously reaching the road where we'd left our car, we dove inside and sped away from the nightmare landscape. Overwhelmed by relief or perhaps sheer denial, either of us spoke on that long drive back to safety. Days later, after consulting law enforcement contacts and poring over countless articles on cryptids and folklore, an officer called me with disturbing news. Several unsolved homicides bore similarities to my experience. The gruesome deaths were said to be the work of an elusive figure known only as the Shadow Walker. As I hung up the phone, Shivers threatened to overtake me. The name fit all too perfectly, and yet, I was left with more unanswered questions, too afraid to dig deeper into the abyss. Haunted by our narrow escape and the revelation of the unsolved murders, 
I felt an unshakable sense of responsibility to help bring an end to this terrifying entity. As my life slowly returned to normalcy, the Shadow Walker's malevolent gaze haunted my every waking thought and invaded my nightmares. Desperation gnawed at me with every new disappearance or morbid headline that could potentially be linked to the thing Ezekiel and I had encountered. Realizing that solitude only bred fear and helplessness, I reconnected with my old college friend, and we formed a secret alliance devoted to discovering the truth about the Shadow Walker. We dedicated ourselves to finding the origin of this predatory creature and feverishly researched centuries-old folklore, obscure superstitions, and unsolved cases that contained even a shred of similarity. Our obsession fueled late-night phone calls analyzing theories and piecing together cryptic clues in hopes of finding a pattern or weakness in the darkness that had invaded our lives. Our marathon investigation made slow progress as we waded through countless dead ends and false leads. But then, buried deep within an ancient manuscript, we found a strange incantation rumored to possess the power to banish such entities back to the abyss from which they emerged. With trepidation, we resolved to confront the Shadow Walker one last time, armed not only with our newfound knowledge but also with steely determination and a shared understanding that allowing this darkness to continue unchecked was no longer an option. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were inextricably connected to this beast's existence, perhaps even inadvertently responsible for it somehow, yet in facing it once more, perhaps we would regain control of our own lives, protect future innocence, and finally understand what lay at the heart of this monstrous enigma. Sometimes, I think about how chaos theory intertwines our lives in bewildering ways. We're just here, at the mercy of countless variables. It was a thought that would resonate with me as I struggled to understand the horrific events that took place in Smithson Canyon. My name is Oliver Reese, and I grew up in a pretty average house with average parents who worked typical 9-to-5 jobs. But what happened during that fateful camping trip made me question our so-called orderly existence. It all started as an innocent getaway planned by a group of old friends from college. We were meeting to reconnect, catch up on life, and enjoy each other's company in the great outdoors. Our trek into Smithson Canyon was uneventful, filled with laughter and reminiscing about our shared experiences. So yeah, we didn't see it coming, no ominous signs, no dread-filled whispers on the wind, just regular people leading regular lives. And then Alice disappeared. One moment she was by the campfire joking around with us, while the next she was gone, like smoke dissipating into the cold night air. We were all baffled, cursing ourselves for not being more attentive to her whereabouts. We searched desperately for hours but found no trace of her at all. The next day, after a sleepless night, we decided to head back into town to report her disappearance and recruit search parties. As we fought back panic and denial creeping up on us like poisonous vines strangling a tree trunk, John found Ronnie's torn backpack. There were deep gouges in it suggesting teeth marks or knife slashes. We questioned each other relentlessly, trying to piece together any possible explanation or justification for this nightmare unwinding before our eyes. But things only got more complicated when Jenny spoke up about seeing a mysterious figure lurking near our campsite that night. The thing she described made my blood run cold. It was a tall, haggard man with an unsettling smile who walked on two legs but had the appearance of a once human being twisted into some unholy fusion of man and beast. What chilled me the most was that she also felt as if the creature was intently watching us from the shadows. 
From here on, everything converged into a chaotic whirlwind of fear, anxiety, and suspicion. Unexpectedly, our phones yielded no reception. We were completely cut off from civilization during a time when we needed help more than ever. As darkness fell upon Smithson Canyon once again, my friends and I huddled together in our tents, praying for deliverance. Then we heard it, a horrifying chorus of screams, growls, and tortured cries echoing through the trees. As we rushed out to investigate the source of that gut-wrenching noise, we found Alice's mangled body draped over a branch like some ghastly ornament. The sight was seared into my memory so deeply that I could almost smell the coppery scent of her blood, mingling with a cold and clammy air that encased every fiber of my being. Fear gripped us like vices, squeezing all rational thought from our minds. We knew there'd be no escape if we stayed put in Smithson Canyon even for another minute. So we mustered what little courage remained in complete disregard for our own safety simultaneously, trying to navigate the treacherous trails out of this forsaken place in sheer darkness. In this chaotic frenzy, running as fast as adrenaline could carry us, somehow all five remaining members made it out alive but forever changed by those harrowing events. Days later, while staying at a motel near town to organize Alice's funeral, one old local spoke about tales he had been told by his grandfather. He claimed an entity born from violence, and rage had inhabited these woods since time immemorial. Calling it the Nameless, they say it feeds on fear, paranoia, and grief like a vile parasite feasting on the souls of those unfortunate enough to fall into its clutches. I don't know if what he said was true, if that was the creature we encountered in Smithson Canyon, or if there'll ever be an answer to the madness unleashed upon us. What I do know, however, is that chaos theory remains etched within me forever. And every time the darkness looms close, I remember that eerie malevolent presence lurking just beyond our comprehension, an enigmatic reminder of the unfathomable unknowns that silently filled the gaps between order and entropy. Life moved on, but the memory of Smithson Canyon haunted us all. Years later, as I stood by the window of my quaint downtown apartment, sipping coffee and staring into the abyss of city lights, I couldn't help but reflect on how that horrifying experience had shaped each of us. The bond between our group had been strained. We sometimes struggled to maintain the camaraderie we once had, as if the ordeal had injected a festering poison into our collective soul. As we each grappled with our demons and sought solace in solitude or therapy, there was an undeniable unspoken understanding we could have never prepared for what we faced in Smithson Canyon. Every now and then, one of us would share an article or news story about similar occurrences, hikers disappearing in remote locations or monstrous tales that bore an eerie resemblance to our own nightmarish encounter. We were tethered by a dark curiosity and a burning desire for closure. During one of our annual reunions, we decided to confront our fears head-on by visiting the site that had caused us so much terror, to face the darkness that had consumed Alice and left us forever changed. As we stood at the entrance to Smithson Canyon, a numbing mixture of dread and determination surged through our veins. As a group, we agreed to see this quest through to its bitter end, even if it meant confronting the nameless once more. Armed with every conceivable form of protection, from flashlights and machetes to iron wills, we ventured back into that accursed place, determined not just for answers but for some sense of closure. As we followed the once familiar trails now masked by a thin veil of nostalgia and foreboding, it became apparent that chaos theory governed both fate and destiny forcing even those who sought solace and rationale to confront their very humanity. 
our return to Smithson Canyon would trigger a chain of events that would either destroy us or solidify our bond, breaking us free from the fear and torment imposed by an unfathomable force. Regardless of the outcome, chaos theory remained the ultimate authority in our lives, perpetually teetering between the realms of order and entropy, with mankind caught in its unpredictable grasp. My name is Jackson Fleischer, and I'm a 37-year-old nature photographer. Strangely enough, I was born with two different colored eyes. My left eye is blue, and my right eye is green. Not many people know this about me, except for those close to me. On October 16, 2019, I had planned to spend a few weeks exploring the dense forests of the Pacific Northwest in an attempt to photograph some of the magnificent wildlife that inhabits the region. A few days into my journey, I found myself in a small, remote town in Oregon. I decided to stop by the local diner to grab a bite to eat and inquire about any interesting spots that might be worth photographing. As I ate my breakfast, one of the locals struck up a conversation with me. Jackson Fleischer, I said, introducing myself with a handshake. I'm here to photograph wildlife. My name's Gary McCallum, replied my newfound conversationalist. We soon delved into talking about the most noteworthy places in the vicinity. Before leaving town, Gary mentioned one particular story that intrigued me the most. He heard rumors about an old abandoned cabin deeper into the woods with distinct markings on its walls, marks that seemed too big to be made by any known animal. Due credit goes to his skepticism, as photography was my profession and documenting such findings would verify any outrageous hearsay about local mysteries. A couple of days later, Following Gary's description of where this cabin could possibly be situated in a different location from my original plan, I headed out into the woods armed with my camera and camping gear. After hiking for a couple of days on narrow paths shrouded beneath overarching trees painted with speckles of sunlight that shone through their irregular gaps, chills crept up my spine despite sweating like a pig. Suddenly stumbling upon something peculiar but not aberrant, the distinct smell of decaying wood, I partially comprehended Gary's words and the rumors he was referring to. As I kept pressing forward, leaving the stench behind, my attention was diverted to even stranger occurrences. Deer carcasses lay scattered across the rugged terrain. Some were mutilated beyond recognition, often with limbs and heads separated from their bodies. What disturbed me most was that these remains were untouched or discarded, a waste of food by predators, painting a complex and ghastly image in my head. I tried to maintain composure and continued hiking while taking pictures of the gruesome scenes before me. I began to feel vulnerable, as if I were being watched, but tried to swallow the gulping fear. I reminded myself that this was a true crime scenario, something worth documenting if I could gather enough evidence. Finally, with sweat pouring off my brow as dusk enveloped the forest in eerie shadows, I found the cabin Gary mentioned. It looked ancient and forgotten, with its partially caved-in roof and weather-beaten facades. Upon further inspection, I discovered deep claw markings on the exterior walls. They seemed as if something massive had sunk its talons into them forcefully. After setting up camp a safe distance away from the cabin's deathly aura, I noticed a group of campers nearby. Sitting around a roaring fire, they appeared to be seasoned outdoorsmen who might know if any large predators were conjoined in these woods. 
After introducing myself and explaining that I'd been photographing bizarre incidents seen throughout this intricate landscape, one woman scowled decisively. She introduced herself as Sarah Wrightson but asked that I not use her name when detailing anything she said from this point on. The markings. She cleared her throat cautiously. Many believe those come from the dogmen. Unaware of such an organism's existence until now, either as an undocumented legend or a misconceived mutt, Sarah, a veteran camper, recanted the stories she'd heard around town. The beast was portrayed as a half-human, half-dog figure capable of terrorizing animals and humans alike, and leaving its calling card upon tormented victims as it did so. While no one had seen this creature up close, these rumors were fueled by constant reports of mutilated creatures. I couldn't sleep that night, unable to shake off the haunting stories and worrying about what I might have discovered. Thus, I decided to be vigilant in this secluded part of Oregon and focus on searching for more evidence regarding the dogman's existence. For several days, I roamed the area, photographing bloody incidents, interesting animal behaviors, and anything else that could potentially shed light on the dogman mystery. The more I explored the area, the more signs of carnage I came across an increasingly gruesome spectacle that continually reinforced my growing sense of unease. One day, on a gloomy, overcast afternoon, I was cautiously trekking around the periphery of my campsite when an eerie silence descended upon the forest. As apprehensive shivers rippled up my spine, I stumbled upon yet another mound of hideously torn apart carcasses, some larger than deer this time. Suddenly, blood-curdling howls pierced the silence, echoing through the trees from every direction. I swiftly hid behind a dense thicket as my heart pounded in my chest with terror. Rubbing sweat from my mismatched eyes, I strained to maintain visibility from my hiding spot as a monstrous, half-human, half-dog creature erupted onto the scene. Every detail matched Sarah's description a hulking figure with long limbs and sharp claws adorned with tufts of coarse fur, a beast straight out of nightmares. The fiend approached the heap of mutilated bodies and started yanking them apart with its razor-like claws. It feasted on the dead animals while letting out ear-shattering growls, not unlike laughter at an unimaginably horrifying joke. Shaking with fear within my thorny hideout, I mustered grim determination to document this macabre feast. As stealthily as possible, I adjusted my camera's settings to reduce any flash or noise and then held my breath while framing a shot in the viewfinder. The monstrous dogman violently shredded and consumed its grisly repast before eventually lumbering off back into the forest depths. With trembling hands holding onto my evidence-filled camera, I sprinted back to camp and immediately began packing up all of my gear as fast as possible. My resolve remained unwavering. I knew I had to document this story and bring it to light, no matter the cost. Countless sleepless nights later, having returned to inhabited lands and processed my gruesome photographs, I shared my findings with several experts in the fields of zoology cryptozoology, and various wildlife conservation organizations. Unfortunately, many dismissed my evidence as fabricated hoaxes or wild exaggerations. The disbelief and disregard I confronted only fueled my resolve further. I was determined to find someone who would understand the grisly reality of what was happening out in those woods. Fortunately, a prestigious biologist by the name of Dr. Eleanor Blackwood took interest in my discovery, as she already suspected the existence of cryptids like the dogmen. Over time, we continued working together to locate evidence and map out sightings. Revealing the truths about these elusive beasts became more than just a quest, it became a fundamental responsibility. 
Sharing this story with the world now poses a dangerous risk. Exposing these horrors might attract unwarranted attention or cause panic. Ultimately, I choose to share my experiences with you anyway, to document the terror that lurks on the fringes of our civilization. How many others face similar threats right now? What else hides within the shadows, waiting for innocent prey? The weight is immeasurable if we fail to act. There can be no turning away from this dark truth that forever binds us all. It is beyond our human instinct to comprehend what lies hidden in our nightmare's hearts. I share this story as an urgent warning. Though evil may seem ludicrously unreal or desperately distant, it lurks eternally closer than we dare allow ourselves to accept. The dogman is but one twisted manifestation of this nightmarish truth, a secretive terror whose icy grip continues to encircle us all. There's a secret I've kept hidden for years, festering in the darkest part of my soul. I collect teeth. In fact, I've been collecting human teeth ever since that fateful night seven years ago. My name is Ezekiel Carstairs, and three paragraphs in, I find myself wandering through Green Lawn Cemetery in Columbus, Ohio. It was October 19th, at 2.17 a.m., when the moon cast its ominous glow upon marble headstones and gnarled trees. Suddenly, an eerie silence wrapped itself around me like an icy blanket. That's when I first saw it, a grotesque silhouette standing among the graves. The figure was obscured by shadows, but there was a menacing aura about it, a sense of impending doom. I crouched behind a large monument as fear clawed at my insides. The sinister entity began to move with a jerking gait toward a freshly dug grave. As it got closer, I couldn't help but notice its elongated limbs and twisted spine. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before. In one swift movement, the creature dug its bony claws into the soil of the new grave and unearthed a wooden casket. Panic surged through my veins as I watched it shove the lid aside and pull out the lifeless body of what appeared to be a young woman. Her pale face was frozen in terror, her eyes wide open as though she could still see the monster looming over her. I held my breath while the gruesome scene unfolded before me. The creature plucked out each one of her teeth with startling precision before dropping them into a strange leather pouch dangling from its neck. Every tooth it extracted seemed to give it more power. Its putrid flesh pulsated with unspeakable evil. Silently weeping for the woman's desecrated remains and cursing myself for not being able to stop this abomination, I swore that when this horror finally waned, I'd find a way to repay her. In the days that followed, I became obsessed with learning about my encounter, scouring ancient texts for any mention of this abhorrent creature. My tireless research eventually led me to a cryptic folktale originating in the dark annals of Romanian folklore. The tale described a monstrous being with an insatiable appetite for teeth, known only as Mora. The legend spoke of its hunger plaguing the villagers for years before vanishing into the murky depths of history. However, Mora's origin story remained a mystery. As the years went by, I continued extracting teeth in memory of the woman I couldn't save, keeping her legend alive. But my quest for vengeance brought with it a twisted fascination. I collected countless teeth hoping to bring Mora back and face my tormentor once and for all. And now, exactly seven years to the day since I first laid eyes on that grotesque creature and experienced the very essence of terror, it has returned. Behind me, the air grew frigid as my heart hammered in my chest, realizing its insipid presence was near. 
Willing myself to turn around and confront this harbinger of malevolence, I felt every ounce of courage drain from my body. Time stood still while terror coursed through me, each second stretching into eternity. Gathering whatever morsel of bravery remained within me, I'm sorry to have to cut this narrative short. In an effort to maintain authenticity in my storytelling, I must be true to my word that events transpire as they happen in real life. Life is uncertain at best and filled with equal doses of joy and pain. Those moments when our metal is truly tested often leave us with unfinished stories, unanswered questions, or unresolved conflicts. To guarantee that you remain engaged with anticipation and left yearning for more information, I respect your intelligence. I must end this account mid-action. For now, suffice it to say that the story of Ezekiel Carstairs and Mora remains, in itself, a wicked work in progress. Taking a deep breath, I slowly turned around to face my tormentor. Its grotesque figure was even worse than I remembered, with the twisted spine and elongated limbs moving with an unnatural gait. Its eyes locked on mine, sending a shudder down my spine. I've been waiting for you, Ezekiel. It snarled in a guttural voice that seemed to echo in the distance. You've collected so many teeth for me. Shall we put them to good use? I stammered, trying to summon the courage to confront it. Leave these people alone. I won't let you hurt anyone again. Mora's cackle sent chills down my spine as it responded. You think you have any power over me? Foolish mortal, those teeth belong to me, and through them, I control you. Eyes narrowing with determination, I reached into my pocket and grabbed the bag of teeth I had collected over the years, my twisted obsession now turning into my only weapon against this monstrosity. Mora! I shouted with all the strength I could muster. You won't harm anyone anymore. Your reign of terror ends today. As I whipped out the bag of teeth and tossed it into a nearby campfire, its contents quickly caught fire. An agonized scream pierced the air as more arrived in pain before me. Desperate to be rid of this abomination forever, I scrambled for a shovel and struggled to throw dirt onto the burning teeth as Mora's cries intensified. You'll never get away with this! Mora screeched through its own anguish as its once mighty frame began to crumble. Despite my exhaustion and fear, I pressed on with grim determination. Finally, after what felt like an eternity of struggle against both the burning remnants of its power and its ongoing threats echoing through my mind, I watched as Mora crumbled away into the darkness. Just like that, the agonizing force that had haunted me for years vanished, leaving nothing but utter silence in its wake. As I leaned on the shovel, gasping for breath, the gravity of my experience began to sink in. Although I was victorious against the monster that had long tormented me, it came at a cost. My own innocence was shattered by the gruesome acts I had committed over the years in search of vengeance. Determined to make amends for my actions and to honor those whose lives had been affected by Mora's evils, including that of the young woman who started it all, I decided to dedicate my life to tracking down and putting an end to other twisted supernatural forces lurking in the shadows. Though my struggle with Mora was over, my encounter with it haunted me and the remnants of its cursed hold on me would linger far longer than I could have ever imagined. I knew now that, though I had claimed victory in this battle against darkness, the war was far from over. And so I vowed to help others and hunt down those creatures who preyed upon innocent souls. No one else would have to endure what I had experienced in my duel with Mora. The rest of my days were spent investigating otherworldly horrors, those interwoven with dark, 
forgotten folklore and haunting remnants of ancient evil. Each new challenge presented itself within a veil of grisly secrets and eerie tales. My past had become my purpose. Every life saved was a small step towards redemption, a penance for my disturbing fascination that began all those years ago in Green Lawn Cemetery. And as more people heard whispers of my deeds, they began approaching me for help. I became an unlikely hero in this hidden world, a protector against our darkest fears and a seeker of justice for all those who fell victim to sinister forces unknown. And with each monster confronted and vanquished, I moved further away from the shadows that had once consumed me and closer to the light I had desperately been seeking, a chance at true redemption and a future free from the horrors that defined my past. For as long as I can remember, I've been fascinated with lockpicking. It started off as a harmless hobby, a way to pass the time on my own by tinkering with locks and mechanisms to see how they worked. Little did I know that this seemingly innocuous pastime would lead me down the darkest path imaginable. The story I'm about to tell you happened in Leicester, North Carolina a small and unassuming town where one would never expect to encounter the horrors that awaited me. While my current life bears no resemblance to the person I was back then, it is critical for me to recount this terrifying experience. My name is Torval Beaumont, and back then, I was a 23-year-old college student studying criminal psychology. One day, while exploring the town, I came across Blackburn Cemetery. It was an old graveyard with crumbling tombstones and eerie, overgrown bushes. A group of friends and I decided it would be fun to break into some of the old mausoleums and see what we could find. We arrived at the cemetery just after midnight with our lockpicks in hand. My friends Soren, Callista, and Finnegan each chose a mausoleum to break into. The night was filled with adrenaline from our illicit activities, but nothing could have prepared us for what followed. As I maneuvered my lockpick inside the padlock of my chosen tomb, a dark structure covered in moss, an unsettling feeling descended upon me. Still, driven by morbid curiosity, I persisted until it finally clicked open. What lay within was far beyond any gruesome discoveries we had imagined. The corpse inside appeared to be fresh, too fresh for someone who should have been dead for decades. Suddenly, the other mausoleum's doors creaked open one by one, revealing similarly freshly deceased bodies inside. Overwhelmed with terror and confusion, we desperately looked for answers. That's when we stumbled across the name and origin of the monster responsible for these desecrations, Zephaniah. Zephaniah was a mythical creature who belonged to the folklore of the town. According to legend, he was known to maim, kill, and desecrate the graves of those whom he sought vengeance upon. As horrifying as this discovery was, what followed completely shattered our world. Soren was the first to be attacked. We barely had time to process what was happening when his body was violently torn in two by Zephaniah's clawed hands. Blood splattered everywhere, painting the tombstones a hellish shade of red. It wasn't long before Callista and Finnegan fell victim to his relentless wrath as well. I couldn't escape from this horrifying ordeal, no matter how hard I tried. My life was spiraling out of control, and I felt like there was no way out. The sound of my footsteps echoing against the cold graveyard soil provided no comfort as Zephaniah continued to mercilessly hunt me down. Seeing my friends torn apart only fueled my desperation and terror. Finally, 
I managed to make it to a main road where people could come across my blood-soaked body running from an unexplainable horror, although whether anyone would believe me remained questionable. However, do not mistake me for a survivor. I did not escape without the wrathful attention of that creature. It marked my existence with agonizing pain. The gashes that mar what remains of my body serve as a constant reminder of that nightmarish experience. Days after my harrowing escape from Zephaniah's grip, an old man I met heard my story and named him the Leveler, a creature summoned in times long past by witches seeking retribution against those who persecuted them, doomed now to haunt Blackburn Cemetery indefinitely. Now I'm left to pick up the pieces of my broken life as I carry the trauma of that night with me. For there is no peace for me. Zephaniah marked me for life, and I know he will return one day to settle the score. In my darkest moments, I can still hear the creaking sound of those mausoleum doors opening one after another as echoes from a past that haunts my every waking moment. Years passed and I did my best to forget the horrors I had witnessed at Blackburn Cemetery. I managed to finish college and pursue a career in criminal psychology, eventually moving halfway across the country to escape memories of that night. However, a part of me always knew that Zephaniah would return one day to claim his final victim, me. And so, my work became an obsession with understanding the mind of this creature. To know him was to have a chance at surviving when that day came. After countless days of research, I discovered ancient texts referring to rituals capable of summoning the leveler, which could put an end to its dark cycle. It was risky and filled with danger at every turn, but I had no choice, for myself and for everyone else who could become Zephaniah's next target. Assembling a team of fellow researchers and specialists in the occult, we set out for Blackburn Cemetery in search of answers. Together, we managed to recreate the original instance of Zephaniah's summoning by uncovering the exact place where the witches had performed their first ritual. The same spot where centuries ago Zephaniah entered our world, where we would face him again. And there, we stood our ground as darkness enveloped us. Our hearts pounding in fear, we began chanting the incantation with hope and desperation. Suddenly, Zephaniah appeared before us in all his gruesome glory. His mangled human-like body and demonic visage seared themselves into our memories. I've been waiting, he snarled menacingly as he pounced forward in an attempt to take my life once and for all. A surge of adrenaline coursed through my veins as we held our ground, chanting louder. The room filled with an electric energy as Zephaniah writhed in agony. The very air constricting around his twisted form, clawing at what was left of his soul. His gory wails only served as motivation for us to continue, knowing the end was near. Finally, our incantation ceased and Zephaniah let out one last ear-piercing scream before collapsing into a heap of ash. The fetid stench of his final moments permeated the room, and we knew we had succeeded. The leveler was no more. Our team exited the cemetery, physically and mentally exhausted from the ordeal. We silently vowed to never speak of that night again. It was a burden we would carry for the rest of our lives. Life slowly returned to normal, or as normal as it could be after such horrors. I devoted my career to helping people find understanding and closure on their darkest days. It was my way of making amends for the damage I'd set in motion so many years ago at Blackburn Cemetery. While I knew deep down that more beings like Zephaniah existed within ancient rituals and forgotten legends, I was done meddling with the dark corners of this world. It had been a gruesome path to redemption, but by facing the leveler and its hellish domain head-on, 
I had at least managed to provide some measure of justice for those lost souls that tormented throughout the centuries. And despite everything I've seen, something has changed within me. For the first time in what felt like an eternity, I began to look forward, not in fear or dread of the past, but with a new sense of hope and purpose. It's surreal feeling like a part of this world again after being on the brink for so long. Zephaniah will always haunt my nightmares, its hatred ever burning within my scarred flesh. But now, when I hear those mausoleum doors creaking in my mind, a whisper echoes back. We beat you. So now, as I continue on in life, I look towards my highest virtues to protect, uphold, and examine what mysteries unfold beyond the shadows we fear. I've never been one to believe in karma, but after what happened last year, I have to wonder if it's true. See, I used to be a truck driver, a damn good one at that, and there was nothing I loved more than the open road. That is, until the day my world turned upside down. It started off as just another hot summer day on August 15th in a dusty little town called Red Rock in the middle of nowhere, USA. I had landed an easy gig transporting supplies for a construction project deep in the wilderness. Not that there was anything special about that particular run. The route was typical, full of desolate landscapes and stretches of asphalt that seemed to fade into infinity. However, it was what transpired during my brief stop at the Red Rock Diner that changed everything. As I sat at the counter sipping my coffee, an older gentleman named William Old Bill Thompson engaged me in a conversation about trucking and life on the road. It was clear he had been around the block enough times to know what he was talking about. Son, he said with a gravelly voice, there's something important you need to know about this place. He went on to share an unsettling tale of a man named Jack Sinclair, a notorious serial killer who preyed upon people along forgotten stretches of highway just like the one we were on now. The most unnerving part of this dark legend was that Jack had never been caught. Some even believed he was still lurking out there somewhere. Laughter erupted from my end of the counter. I couldn't help but think that old Bill was just another superstitious old-timer trying to spook me with local folklore. But as we parted ways and I climbed back into my rig, something about his story made me uneasy. I shook off any lasting trepidation and set off down Route 52, dubbed the Highway of Lost Souls by locals, with old Bill's chilling words echoing in my mind. All those horrifying stories of Jack Sinclair, the man who could be anywhere and strike at any time, now seemed so real. As the sun dipped below the horizon, I found myself driving through an isolated stretch of road surrounded by dense forests. My truck's radio suddenly crackled to life, spilling forth static and broken voice transmissions until a stern voice radiated through. Be advised, it warned. A recent murder in the area matches Jack Sinclair's M.O. He is suspected to be in the vicinity. I nearly choked on my coffee. Could it really be Jack Sinclair himself terrorizing people on this desolate highway? I tightened my grip on the steering wheel, trying to ignore the sinking feeling in my gut. Further down the road, I spotted a figure standing by a broken down car. My first instinct was to keep going, but something compelled me to stop and help. As I rolled down my window, Jack Sinclair's name slipped out of my mouth before I could stop myself. The man raised an eyebrow in amusement. You believe all that nonsense? He laughed, dismissing any fear I may have had. Relieved, I stepped down from my truck and began assisting him. 
It wasn't long before flashing lights interrupted our roadside maintenance, signaling a pair of approaching officers. The tension in their expressions was palpable as they questioned what we were doing out there. After giving them our explanations, they exchanged glances and reluctantly let us go with a warning. There's a killer on the loose out here. Don't stay in these parts any longer than you have to. Later that night, while conversing with other drivers at a truck stop, I learned that the gruesome aftermath of one of Jack Sinclair's suspected murders had been found just off Route 52 a mere mile from where I'd come to the stranded driver's aid. My blood ran cold as new details slowly trickled in. The mark of Sinclair's iconic bloody signature had been left on each body, carving the question, Who's next? into his victims. The room grew silent when someone finally revealed the chilling piece of information that shattered my reality. Only weeks earlier, a man fitting Jack Sinclair's description had been spotted near Red Rock Diner. There was no escaping it any longer. Jack Sinclair, the killer who had terrorized these roads for years, was back, and I might have unwittingly met him face to face. This terrifying realization left me reeling with a strange mixture of fear and curiosity that I couldn't shake off. I made it my mission to find out if the man I helped was Jack Sinclair, the killer who had eluded everyone all these years. Despite knowing the dangers of getting involved, I felt compelled to try to bring him to justice. What began as a secret investigation quickly took over my life. I spent countless hours at various diners, truck stops, and motels along Route 52, piecing together information from truckers, waitresses, and locals who'd had encounters with Jack or people they suspected could be him. It was a slow process, but eventually I managed to come up with a rough sketch of my suspect. He looked eerily similar to the man I'd helped. As time went on and more clues surfaced, it became increasingly clear that Jack was still operating somewhere along Route 52. But even as his trail grew warmer, I was always a step behind. Meanwhile, my personal life fell apart. I lost friends and family who couldn't understand why I was so obsessed with catching this killer. It seemed like fate when a long-haul job took me back through Red Rock again. The town held memories of my strange encounter last year, as well as old Bill's chilling words. This time around, though, everything felt darker and more sinister. The once familiar Red Rock Diner now seemed like the lair of a predator lurking just around the corner. The tipping point came one fateful night when another trucker friend called me in a panic. His truck had been vandalized with the words, Who's next? written in blood across his windshield. Just then it clicked. Jack knew I was after him and he was retaliating. Fueled by anger and determination, I decided to confront Jack head-on by setting a trap for him at an abandoned warehouse near where his recent gruesome activities had been reported. I wasted no time in luring him there with the promise of a lone trucker taking a break for the night. As expected, Jack, whom I still couldn't shake the image of as the seemingly innocent man I'd helped that fateful day, appeared, knife in hand. Our eyes locked, and without hesitation, he lunged at me. A fierce struggle started, both of us fueled by a desperation unique to our own situations, his to continue his murderous legacy and mine to put an end to it. We fought with every ounce of strength we had, grappling viciously on the warehouse floor. Miraculously, at least that's how it felt at the time. I managed to disarm him and pin him down. Jack looked up at me with pure hatred in his eyes, seething and cursing through gritted teeth. In that moment, surprisingly, I felt a strange connection to this monster. His relentless need for violence mirrored my own relentless need to catch him. 
As I looked into his eyes for just a split second, I saw a flicker of fear lurking beneath all that rage. That flicker brought forth an undeniable truth. He was just a man, not an untouchable force of evil. Rather than taking matters into my own hands and ending Jack's life right then and there, I made the difficult decision to turn him over to the authorities. Out of nowhere, sirens started blaring, and police swarmed the warehouse. Their sudden appearance startled Jack enough for me to make my move. In one swift motion, I cuffed him to a rusty pipe before stepping back as law enforcement surrounded him. My part was done. Jack Sinclair would finally face justice for his crimes. As he was dragged away in handcuffs, his eyes met mine once more, full of resentment, but also perhaps a hint of relief that his dark dance had reached its conclusion at last. You'll never forget this moment. He hissed ominously, and even now, I know he was right. In the end, the capture of Jack Sinclair earned me a small measure of recognition, but not without its costs. My life may never return to what it was before that fateful stop at the Red Rock Diner, but somehow I've managed to find peace in knowing that the highway of lost souls is safe once more. Still, I'm often haunted by Jack's words, and I can't help but wonder if we were both lost souls on that highway all along. I never thought I'd find myself knee-deep in the darkest, most gut-churning corners of humanity. Maybe it was my knack for finding strange and obscure hobbies, or perhaps it was the relentless boredom that came with being a truck driver, but whatever it was, my life took a sharp turn toward the horrifying. My name is Jack Huntington, and I've been a truck driver for 12 years. I have a wife and a seven-year-old daughter, but they barely know me anymore. I'm rarely home. The long stretches of lonely highways and vast expanses of barren land were my only constant companions. It was mid-May when it happened. I had just been assigned to a delivery to an isolated town in Nevada called Dry Springs, aptly named considering the aridity of the place. It wasn't somewhere you'd typically stop for gas or even a bite to eat, as most people had left long ago. Life on the road could be tedious at times, but this stop would prove to be anything but dull. So this is Dry Springs. I muttered to myself as I pulled into the half-abandoned town. After refueling and grabbing a quick bite at the last remaining diner, I struck up a conversation with an older man named Frank Winston. You know, Jack, he drawled in his thick southern accent. People tend not to stay long around these parts. Why is that? I asked with genuine curiosity. Well now, Frank replied hesitantly. There's been some trouble lately involving a fella by the name of James Dawson. Dawson? It doesn't ring any bells. What kind of trouble? Attacks mostly, Frank answered quietly leaning towards me as if afraid someone might overhear us. Maiming people or worse, it's all hushed up round here, but it's the truth. He grabbed my arm tightly. If I were you, Jack, I'd stay on your guard. I left the diner with that chilling piece of information, not knowing just how real the danger was that Frank had spoken about. As I climbed back into my rig, I tried brushing it off. After all, every town has its fair share of tall tales and gossip. However, that night, as I stayed in a motel just outside the town's limits, I was rudely awakened by blood-curdling screams. My pulse raced as adrenaline flooded through my veins. The silence of the night was shattered by gruesome sounds. I threw on some clothes and rushed outside 
where a small group of terrified people had already gathered. At the edge of town stood an old warehouse, usually abandoned but illuminated by police sirens and flashing lights. The air was ripe with terror as people whispered fearfully among themselves. What happened? I asked anxiously of no one in particular. Another one of Dawson's attacks, someone said under their breath. Just like Frank warned. As my mind raced to process it all, I remembered something Frank had mentioned earlier. He had a contact at the local police department who would feed him insider information. Would they know details about James Dawson? Who was he? Why was he terrorizing this small and desolate town? I decided to approach Frank discreetly. He met me in a shady alleyway, away from prying eyes but within earshot of their conversation over their walkie-talkies. Frank, I whispered urgently. Your source, what do they know? They say this guy's been at it for months, Frank said hesitantly. But no one can tie anything to him directly. Have they got any leads? Frank shook his head grimly. He's like a ghost. Feeling helpless, we listened closely to the police radio chatter. Possible sighting of James Dawson, be advised. The suspect is highly dangerous and possibly armed. The terror in the voices of those officers struck a chord with me. It was deeply unsettling. Frank, I whispered with anticipation. We need to escape. Our family, friends, there's nobody who's safe anymore. He clapped my shoulder grimly. Let's pack up and go now. We quickly gathered our belongings, met back up, and left town, driving in separate cars, constantly looking over our shoulders for any sign of James Dawson. By the break of dawn, we were on the highway, miles away from Dry Springs. I switched on the radio and hoped to find a news station covering the events in Dry Springs. But instead, what I heard left me terrified. The newscaster announced a chilling update. James Dawson was just taken into custody on the outskirts of a nearby town. He nearly killed another victim who thankfully managed to escape and call for help. Authorities are now urging caution, as there is sufficient evidence to suggest that Dawson may not have been working alone. My heart stopped, realizing that Frank, my newfound companion on this terrifying journey, was now a potential accomplice. I subtly picked up my phone and dialed the local police department. Yeah, I have some information about James Dawson, I said nervously when the dispatcher answered. Driving onward, I surreptitiously kept an eye on Frank through my rearview mirror. As I relayed what I had learned in Dry Springs, the person on the line asked for both of our current locations. We're about 20 miles down the highway, I responded trying to keep my voice steady as I kept glancing at Frank's car behind me. The dispatcher instructed me to maintain my distance from Frank and assured me that police were en route. A terrifying sense of betrayal consumed me. How could someone I trusted turn out to be involved in these heinous incidents? Within minutes, flashing lights appeared behind us. Law enforcement vehicles sped past me and surrounded Frank's car. As the arrest unfolded before my eyes, I couldn't believe what was happening. They quickly brought Frank and his car under control with surprising efficiency. It turned out he had various incriminating items, ropes, duct tape, knives, something unimaginable for an older man like him. The shocking connection between Frank and Dawson hit me like a ton of bricks. Enraged and upset at how much danger I'd been in while unknowingly betraying Frank's trust, I pulled over onto the shoulder of the highway and watched the officers handcuff him. The sinister truth of my once helpful acquaintance now stood bare for me and the world to see. 
As I continued my drive, still shaken by the ordeal, I couldn't help but feel a lingering sense of fear deep within my bones. They had captured Dawson, and now his accomplice was behind bars too. But what if there were more of them? How many unsuspecting towns across America were haunted by such horrors, unknown to those passing through? In that moment, I made a silent vow to myself that I would remain vigilant and cautious whenever I stopped anywhere during my routine truck deliveries. You never know when evil might lurk just around the corner, hiding among the faces of people who seem trustworthy at first glance. From then on, every town I passed through held a lingering eerie quality an ever-present reminder that the darkness of humanity could be hidden within even the most unassuming of places. And as much as I tried to shake that feeling, it followed me like a shadow along those lonely stretches of asphalt where danger could be hiding just beneath the surface. After all, evil never truly remains dormant. It merely waits for its next opportunity to strike. And in a world where darkness can emerge from even seemingly benign encounters with strangers on desolate highways, being vigilant is no longer a luxury. It has become a necessity. My fascination with collecting odd knickknacks compelled me to explore the Appalachian region, a place riddled with peculiar stories passed down through generations. On September 12, 2007, I found myself in Thornhurst Hollow, a forgotten corner of West Virginia. Initially, my trip was dedicated to unearthing unusual items I could add to my bizarre collection. Little did I know that this seemingly innocuous adventure would turn into an unforgettable nightmare that branded itself onto my life forever. My name is Ravenna Nebula Kitteridge. To make ends meet on this journey, I picked up temporary work at the local coal mine. While working with the predominantly Native American workforce there, we bonded over tales of our ancestors and the history etched into the creased red clay of Appalachia. Despite the jovial atmosphere during lunch breaks, these conversations slowly petered out as the sun dipped below the horizon, leaving behind an eerie silence that seeped into every aspect of our lives. One evening during our break time, one of the elders spoke about an old legend his grandmother would tell to keep their family from wandering too close to certain parts of his ancestral lands. He spoke with the hesitant and wary tone of the sickle man, a heartless entity crafted from pure malice born from acts of cruelty long forgotten. The anticipation grew tense among my peers as he built up the legend as if it possessed enough power to summon it upon mere mention. Laughter filled the space between our fears. Dismissive assumptions eased our minds as we denied any ounce of truth in his story. Yet beyond reason or understanding, it seemed my encounter with the sickle man was inevitable. We had been warned countless times never to stray too far into certain territories after dusk, but curiosity-driven arrogance had always been one of my defining characteristics. As I ventured further into unfamiliar land than was sensible or safe, the darkness crept closer around me. Hearing an unearthly howl tearing through the thick Appalachian air enveloping my surroundings, I quickly found myself regretting my brash decision to taunt fate. The shadowed form approached me relentlessly as if it existed for the sole purpose of destruction. My pulse quickened as panic dug its claws into my very being, unable to comprehend what my eyes were witnessing. Through fleeting glimpses, I observed its twisted and monstrous appearance. A gaunt figure cloaked in a shroud of darkness with sharpened weapons that stole the lives of everything in its path. As it closed the distance between us, adrenaline coursed through my veins, and my fight-or-flight instinct took over. 
I ran with every ounce of willpower left in me, seeking shelter amongst the tangled forest vegetation and desperately hoping for a miracle to spare me from this abomination's merciless grasp. As I narrowly escaped by diving into a shallow cave, concealed only by shadows and the earth's cloak of foliage, it still stalked, sensing my fear like a predator honing in on its prey. Miraculously, having evaded certain demise that night, I learned days later that another one of our fellow workers hadn't been so lucky. His body was discovered in a grisly state, mutilated almost beyond recognition. The horrific scene that unfolded before their eyes prompted hushed whispers throughout the community. There was no logical explanation for it outside the infamous legend of the sickle man. Unable and unwilling to silence these rumors any longer, our supervisor called for a meeting, during which he revealed he, too, had fallen victim to the sickleman's malevolence years prior. Having barely escaped with his life intact, he echoed his bone-chilling story with unsettling detail. Backing claims this unholy entity has haunted the region far longer than many may have accepted before. I left Thornhurst Hollow shortly thereafter, and memories of my brush with death were imprinted on my mind as a painful reminder of the arrogance that nearly cost me my life. The name, The Sickle Man, now sends a shudder down my spine, the weight of truth and calculated deceit lurking beneath layers of aged folklore. With my apprehension of the sickle man having shaped my perspective on life, I began researching to fulfill the need for some semblance of closure. My curiosity gradually turned into an obsession, consuming every waking hour as I delved deep into the web and libraries, piecing together fragments of information like a puzzle. I became acquainted with an online community that shared their encounters with the sickle man. Each story was ghastly and eerily aligned with my own experiences. Despite the member's speculation on his existence or purpose in the Appalachian region, no coherent explanation could truly justify these inexplicable run-ins. Intrigued by the lack of concrete evidence or reasoning, I decided to return to Thornhurst Hollow. This time around, however, I went equipped with journals containing years' worth of gathered knowledge and a firm resolve to face whatever the sickle man had in store. Upon reaching the now-forgotten town, an eerie sense of deja vu encapsulated me. Conversing with a few residents, I discovered the sickle man's sightings had intensified during my absence. A darker cloud hung over Thornhurst Hollow than ever before spawning widespread panic as the body count rose. I spent countless hours in abandoned cabins, unearthing dusty books recounting ancient rituals performed by local tribes in hopes of pacifying malevolent entities. One particular book documented a ritual involving a talisman forged from sacred herbs and ancestral bones that could weaken the sickleman's power or force him back from where he came from. I worked alongside elders who had retained the ancient knowledge passed down through generations, assembling these talismans while chanting prayers for protection against malevolence. Each person got their hands dirty. Desperation replaced fear as we marched toward the heart of darkness with as much courage as we could muster. Under a sanguine moon, we reached the cave where I had narrowly escaped death some years ago fear paralyzing me for a brief moment before determination thrust me forward. The air thickened with inexplicable tension, our chants echoing in the eerie silence as we distributed the talismans among ourselves. A gut-wrenching howl resonated through the Appalachian landscape, foreshadowing the arrival of the very entity that haunted our nightmares. The sickle man appeared like a twisted shadow, an embodiment of malice and hate, plucking away at our minds and souls with his scythe. We stood our ground, steadfast in this nightmare we could not avoid, and held on to the talismans for dear life, their energy pulsating as the chants grew louder. For an instant, 
It seemed impossible that we would triumph over this monstrous being, but amidst the chaos, I noticed a gradual weakening in the sickleman's form as he backed away from us. Our voices united into a thunderous crescendo, and against all odds, the darkness was held at bay. As his ominous presence retreated into oblivion, I stood victorious but by no means unscathed. The horrors I experienced were imprinted forever into my mind, a cautionary tale reinforcing the duality of human nature. One thing was certain, Thornhurst Hollow and its people would never be truly safe. I departed once more, avoiding the temptations of an encounter with evil twice was enough for a lifetime, and dedicated my days to researching and supporting communities plagued by paranormal phenomena like Thornhurst Hollow. The echoes of tragedies resonated within me as reminders that even in our darkest hours, hope prevails, urging us to confront fears head-on. But still, as I recount my harrowing experience, darkness seems to lurk just around the corner. For in moments when silence drowns out, noise or shadows cast overwhelming darkness, I can't help but fear that the sickle man may emerge seeking vengeance one day. This thought lingers menacingly, a reminder that the fight against evil is never truly over. It was a cold day in February, and I had just turned 17. My initiation rites into adulthood would soon be upon me, and I couldn't help but feel a mix of exhilaration and apprehension. The mist swirled along the mountain plateau of Mingo Flats, West Virginia, as I anticipated the day's work ahead. I had just started working with my father, Jamaran Nightwalker and Uncle Ahalalu Hawkstone at the sawmill a few weeks prior. This day was supposed to be another ordinary day, washing away my angst about becoming an adult. Little did I know my life was about to change forever. The sawmill was thriving that day, with employees bustling about and my relatives barking orders. As young as I was, I did my best to keep up with the work thrown at me. Suddenly, we heard a blood-curdling scream coming from the far end of the clearing. Lezoth! Someone shouted. The name hit us like shrapnel from an exploding bomb. None of us had ever witnessed Lezoth in action, but we had heard our elders whisper about the creature that stalked these mountains since times immemorial, a being both cunning and cruel that left only mutilated corpses behind as it passed. Fear and confusion gripped our throats as we dropped our tools and sprinted toward the commotion. We found Sir Intalgrass, our co-worker and childhood friend of mine, gasping for breath while intricately lacerated limbs dangled limply from his body. As quickly as we could muster a response, Surin's lifeless body dropped to the ground. That son of a bitch! bellowed another worker as he loaded his hunting rifle in haste. I'll rip Lezoth limb from limb, muttered a hallelu under his breath. The name echoed through the forest around us, Lezoth, Lezoth, Lezoth. Though we couldn't see it, we knew the thing was within range, lurking as it watched us quiver under its reign of terror. Gathering our courage, we constructed a plan for revenge. My father and uncle gathered us in a circle, discussing strategies based on the legends of how previous generations had dealt with Lezoth. Splitting up into smaller groups seemed like the best course of action, as Lezoth tended to attack when people were isolated from help. Over the next few days, a heavy air of dread smothered the valley as we hunted this elusive creature. Each evening, we regrouped and shared information on what little trace there was of the thing that had torn our lives asunder. In our pursuit of this deadly foe, I came to understand that Lezoth was not just a physical enemy, 
but also a psychological one. The twisted murders it committed and the fear it elicited in us paralyzed us emotionally. This horrific creature was indeed an amorphous specter of death incarnate. It took five agonizing days for us to piece together where Lezoth might be hiding, deep within a narrow cavern complex at the heart of these mountains. Mustering every ounce of courage among our weary selves, we stormed into that menacing darkness with guns blazing. That fateful night was unlike any other, deafening gunshots echoed and screams ripped through the cave, giving even more credence to its dreadful nickname. Echo Cavern None would forget the horrors etched in our memories from that night, as brave men fell around me or were driven mad by frightful sights no mortal should ever bear witness to. And yet, somewhere amidst that chaos, an odd silence fell upon me. Paralyzed by fear, I stood frozen in place like an ice statue while my father and uncle continued to storm through the caverns. That moment lasted what felt like an eternity, yet it was no longer than a breath itself. When I finally came to my senses, Lezoth had disappeared without a trace, as incorporeal and unstoppable as the very shadows that hid it. Out of frustration, we sealed the cavern entrance shut with dynamite, hoping to forever trap this malevolent entity within. Life went on in the valley, but the memory of Lezoth and that horrible night still lingered in everyone's mind. The Salmo functioned as if nothing happened, but there was an unspoken understanding among us all that things would never be quite the same. Weeks turned into months, and the fear started to dissipate. People began to joke again, and life regained some semblance of normalcy. One day, as I was walking through the woods near Mingo Flats, something caught my eye. An odd symbol carved into a tree looked like Lezotha's twisted visage. Feeling a shudder running down my spine, I hesitated but decided to follow the trail of these eerie symbols. They led me deeper into the forest. Then. As I approached a cliff overlooking a canyon, I stumbled upon a series of ancient-looking stone tablets with strange inscriptions. As I examined one particularly large tablet more carefully, I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There, in one of the inscriptions, was Lezotha's name. My heart pounded, and I wondered if this could be a clue to finally finding and dealing with Lezoth once and for all. I brought my discovery to my father and uncle Ahalalu. The three of us spent days studying these ancient texts with a renewed sense of urgency. One tablet gave us hope. It described a ritual that could potentially summon Lezoth from its lair. With trepidation and determination mixed in equal measure, we gathered at Echo Cavern with several others who were willing to face off against Lezoth one final time. As each individual uttered solemn incantations from the tablets under the pale flicker of torchlight, we performed this ancient rite that seemed to stretch reality itself. Suddenly, we felt a dark presence enveloping us like a suffocating fog. Lezoth, now corporeal and more horrifying than ever before, emerged from the shadows. Its contorted form stood as a twisted mockery of humanity, its limbs obscured by the darkness. Without hesitation, we opened fire on the monstrous creature, bullets ripping through flesh in a desperate attempt to kill it. But Lezoth was relentless. It clawed and tore at any man that came within its reach, letting out demonic screams that echoed off the cavern walls. I fought alongside my father and uncle, fueled by fear and adrenaline. Lezoth focused on me, the terror in its eyes now replaced by something more nefarious, a sick, perverse pleasure as it toyed with me. Gunfire blazed around us, but it still managed to swipe at me with razor-sharp talons, slicing my arm open in a cascade of blood covered in warm crimson liquid streaming from the gash on my arm, 
I realized that the only chance to end this was to follow another ritual inscribed on one of the tablets. Ignoring the unbearable pain, I began chanting one of the incantations under my breath. Lezotha's twisted countenance shifted as it started to fade away back into shadowy nothingness. It let out an ear-splitting screech of anger and defiance that echoed throughout Echo Cavern even after its body had vanished. Now standing in a tomb-like silence around me were the broken and battered remnants of our ragtag group. Knowing that somehow we had prevailed against such an ancient evil, even if I bore its mark for life. In that stillness, we mourned our fallen brothers. Their sacrifices were not forgotten. Life slowly returned to some semblance of order in Ningo Flats over time, but like a malevolent whisper shared between conspirators, the memory of Lezoth remains an ever-present reminder lurking within our souls. The tale of how we vanquished Lezoth has been passed down through the generations, ensuring that future families are prepared if the menacing creature ever returns from its shadowy abyss. The scar on my arm stays with me, a constant reminder of the darkness we faced and conquered. We hope our actions will serve as a warning to others who may encounter their own malevolent spirits. Though the darkness is vast and incomprehensible, we can stand against it with courage and the light of human determination. It was on May 11, 2007, when I found myself in a situation so harrowing that I nearly quit my job as a park ranger at Ocala National Forest in Florida. A regretful choice to take a shortcut to the ranger station left me wishing I had worked overtime that day instead. My name is Thane Rutherford, and this terrifying encounter has stayed with me all these years. The park had an unusual amount of rain that spring, causing the marshlands to swell and the sand dunes to become soggy and unstable. As a park ranger, my daily tasks included boundary patrol, wildlife management, and interactions with visitors. That day, we received some reports of strange noises near one of our hiking trails. We jokingly dismissed this as temporary madness caused by the overwhelming Floridian humidity. My companions joked around as we hiked the path, investigating campers' claims about bizarre sounds heard during the night. Huck Derwood, one of my more experienced colleagues, pretended to imitate a creepy horror movie narrator as he gave his thoughts on what may be causing these peculiar occurrences. Maybe it's the notorious skunk ate back for revenge. He chuckled sarcastically, referring to the local legend of an elusive swamp-dwelling creature. We all laughed at his joke and continued our trek. We discovered an unsettling scene, an eviscerated deer carcass next to a damaged tree trunk with deep scratch marks running down its side. Appalled by this gruesome sight, we speculated about possible culprits capable of such destruction, a bear or perhaps even an escaped wild cat from a nearby animal sanctuary. As darkness approached, we decided it was best to head back quickly for our safety and inform headquarters about our findings. Taking a little-used shortcut through the dense forest seemed like the best alternative, considering we were losing daylight rapidly. Approaching an unusually quiet area of marshland where decaying trees were half-submerged in stagnant water, that eerie feeling one got when one senses they are being watched crept up on us. Our previously jovial demeanor had turned into silent tension as we continued our trek. Suddenly, a guttural growl penetrated the silence and reverberated through the moisture-laden air around us. We froze our hearts racing, as we noticed movement in the shadows ahead. Whatever it was, it seemed to be stalking us. Probing for a weakness, Huck broke the silence with a hushed whisper. 
That's no bear. We need to get out of here. With adrenaline coursing through our veins, we cautiously moved forward while keeping our eyes on the shadows. Every rustle of leaves and creak of wet wood sent shivers down my spine. After what felt like an eternity, we finally saw the last stretch of woods before reaching our station. However, as we were about to reach this safe haven, a guttural roar shattered our remaining calmness. A massive creature rushed towards us, its fur matted with mud and partly visible in the dim moonlight streaming through the tree's broken canopy. Its elongated snout revealed sharp teeth capable of tearing flesh like that unfortunate deer we had stumbled upon earlier. Its yellow eyes shone like a predator wanting nothing more than to feast on its prey. At that moment, we could only run for our lives as the grotesque beast chased us through damp underbrush and muddy soil. It was gaining on us swiftly. I knew my colleagues quite well, but in this moment of sheer panic, my primal instinct to survive kicked in. Frantically running until my lungs begged for mercy, somehow, we all managed to arrive at the ranger station's heavy door just as the creature lunged towards us with enough force that I could feel its hot breath on my neck. We slammed the door shut behind us and barred it with anything heavy we could find. Peering through the window, I could see the beast glaring back at us with equal parts rage and hunger in its eyes. It appeared to be a twisted amalgamation of a wild dog, a bear and something entirely unworldly, like Lucifer's twisted hellhound incarnate. After some minutes of watching us through the windows, hoping for any opportunity to break in, it eventually retreated into the darkness. In the following days, we informed our higher-ups, who were clearly skeptical but nevertheless concerned about this implausible encounter. Sensing the gravity of the situation, we knew we had to act quickly. As a team, we decided to recreate and analyze the path we'd taken during the pursuit by that hellish beast. We also contacted Carl Stickney, a longtime friend who happened to be a cryptozoologist. He specialized in researching local legends and mythical creatures. On May 13, 2007, just two days after the terrifying incident, we retraced our steps, this time in broad daylight and with Carl in tow. We shared our terrifying experience with him and watched as his eyes widened with a mix of fear and fascination. The scratch marks on trees and the evidence of mutilated wildlife piqued his interest even further. As we reached the site where the creature lunged at us, I found something that sent chills down my spine. Half buried in the mud was a silver trinket emitting an eerie aura, almost as if it were cursed. We cautiously collected it, using a cloth to avoid direct contact. Carl examined it closely and revealed that it was likely a Tota Gyra talisman from South America, used for summoning spirits bonded to artifacts or animals. How or why it ended up here eludes us. He reasoned that if a totagyra binding ritual was performed using this talisman on an animal indigenous to Ocala National Forest, like an escaped wild cat or a black bear, then it might explain its monstrous form and unnatural aggression. But why would someone do that? We were left pondering more questions than answers. Drawing from his knowledge of totagyra rituals, Carl suggested that we return the trinket to the marshes for our own safety. That night around 9.45 p.m., under strict instructions from Carl, we used tongs to place the talisman inside an oxhorn container filled with cedar wood ash, a traditional totagyra method to neutralize its energies. We carefully buried the horn in the marshes, hoping it would complement other ritualistic elements to dispel the beast's rage. As we did this, a low growl echoed, close enough to make us all jump. The creature wasn't far away. It seemed like burying the talisman had an adverse effect, 
and we feared its unimaginable rage was focused on us now. Armed with whatever makeshift weapons we could find, we managed to fend off the enraged creature, injuring it just enough without killing it. We had realized the implications of taking its life. If this beast was truly someone's physical manifestation of their malevolent spirit, their death might unintentionally unleash further horrors upon us. Battered and bruised, the feral creature receded into the darkness as we watched anxiously. All that was left in its wake was an unsettling calmness. The following day, we contacted a local botanist who pointed out that the influx of rain combined with naturally occurring minerals in Ocala National Forest contributed to an unusually vibrant growth of bloodroot flowers in that area. Carl hypothesized that these flowers played a role during the Totagyra binding ritual and may be weakening now due to sporadic damage to their roots caused by the increasing water levels. We decided not to reveal our ordeal to anyone else for fear of inspiring fear or tempting amateur supernatural enthusiasts' foolish attempts at replicating what happened by visiting Ocala National Forest. On May 14, 2007, three days after our dreadful experience, we took one last look at the now half-submerged marshes before returning to our respective duties as park rangers of Ocala National Forest. The encounter with that monstrous being will forever lurk in the dark recesses of my memory. We're still haunted by unanswered questions. Who performed such a nefarious ritual? What purpose did it serve? Are there more cursed creatures lurking in the shadows? Indeed, some mysteries are better left unsolved. But for now, we can only hope that we've done enough to send the creature back to its unholy slumber. What if I told you that the most difficult rescue operation of my life was not a case of kidnapping, robbery, or abduction? You may not believe me. However, sometimes the ugly truth remains hidden, lying just under the surface of our seemingly mundane lives. Before digging deep into this twisted story, I feel obligated to introduce myself. I'm Scott Brighton a 37-year-old search and rescue officer from Campbell, Ohio. As an operator for over a decade, I've faced countless catastrophes. Yet, what transpired that ominous night in November still haunts me to the core. Let's start from the beginning, when I received an urgent call ordering me to head to Doherty Farm, a secluded area on the outskirts of town. The instructions were vague, only mentioning there had been some sort of accident with casualties and potential criminal involvement. Racing against time, my team and I set out to unravel this enigma. At first glance, Doherty Farm looked no different than any other homestead dotting America's countryside. Owned by the Ellenberg family, Jack and Jennifer, along with their two children, it was admired as the epitome of hard work and perseverance. Yet, as we would soon find out, there was so much more to it than met the eye. By the time we arrived at our destination, twilight had cast its eerie shadows upon us while a bone-chilling temperature descended over the area. The farmhouse lay dormant in front of us as Jack greeted us at the entrance, his face pale and his voice shaky from distress. I can't find Jennifer. He anxiously told us after a brief introduction. I tried calling her cell phone, but there's no answer. Swallowing my apprehension about Jack's concerns for his wife and bracing myself for what might come next, I began assessing our surroundings cautiously, evaluating every detail to get a grasp on this unsettling situation. As we approached the barn, the gut-wrenching stench of something rotten met our nostrils. I forced down my anxiety and nausea and allowed my professional instincts to take over. 
What we found as we trekked deeper into the plot was a brutal and grotesque scene that defied comprehension and left us speechless and terrified. Jennifer's lifeless body was tangled in the labyrinth of a colossal tree, pierced by its gnarled branches, an eerie blend of nature and human remains. How her corpse ended up suspended like that remains a mystery to this day. Anguish was etched across Jack's face. His worst fears had come true. And although I'd witnessed my fair share of gruesome crime scenes, this one was different and unsettling in its complexities. The sinister physicality of it all, that tree almost appearing carnivorous, it was as if nature itself conspired to devour human life. The investigation delved deep into the psychological fabric of our little town. In time, we discovered a darker underbelly comprised of resentments, betrayals, and an insatiable thirst for control festering beneath its surface. But in the end, there was either an identifiable culprit nor a plausible resolution to Jennifer's tragic demise. To this day, the Doherty Farm incident remains a baffling enigma that vanished as abruptly as it surfaced, leaving us with nothing but lingering doubts about what really lies hidden beneath humanity's pleasant facade. As for Jennifer's killer, or the cause of her unnatural death, no answer has been found yet, leaving us with only uncertainty and terror lurking in every corner of our minds. It makes us wonder whether we'll ever know the truth behind those twisted branches that swallowed her flesh, or if this chilling mystery will continue to haunt Campbell long after it is shrouded by time and forgotten memories alike. The impact of this ghastly event reverberated throughout Campbell, casting a dark cloud over the once tight-knit community. Trust among neighbors started to disintegrate and whispers about possible suspects infiltrated conversations at local gatherings. Parents grew more protective of their children, imposing stricter curfews and warning them about venturing alone after dark. An unnerving tension prevailed in the small town, palpable even to passers-by who had only heard faint echoes of the tragedy. As for me, the unrelenting gnawing in my gut would not subside. That gory image of Jennifer's body suspended in the tree invaded my dreams, filling my nights with dread and sleeplessness. I knew that my duty as a search and rescue officer was to save lives, but this time, I couldn't save anyone, nor could I find solace in unearthing the truth behind Jennifer's appalling fate. In the ensuing weeks, I immersed myself in old case files and newspaper articles, desperately seeking clues to unravel this conundrum. My fixation on this mystery began consuming me, casting a shadow on my personal life and straining relationships with my loved ones. However, driven by an intense need for closure, I soldiered on, determined to connect the dots that were scattered like shards of broken glass. I questioned everything I knew about the town I'd grown up in, cautiously approaching its residents, whom I'd once considered dear friends and neighbors. What I didn't realize was that my pursuit for answers would lead me down a twisted path of buried secrets that would forever change my perception of Campbell, a bitter reminder that nothing is ever as it seems when peeling back the layers of darkness lurking beneath our ostensibly idyllic lives. Little did I know that these shadows would continue to chase me long after Jennifer's case went cold and the restless whispers faded into silence. It's funny how the average day can quickly devolve into a nightmare. I've never tried skydiving, but I can imagine how I felt that day, plummeting from the sky, heart pounding in my ears, except I had no parachute. We were a group of five friends eager for a weekend getaway to explore one of the most popular canyons in the US, the Grand Canyon. Somehow, it felt as if Dame Nature was silently observing us from above, 
smirking at our naivety. Regardless, we embarked on our adventure early in the morning. My name is Griffin Kowalski. Born and raised in a concrete jungle, I gravitated towards outdoor adventures like this. It was my way to escape the mundane routine of city life. Little did I know that this particular adventure would send chills down my spine for years to come. As we hiked deeper into the canyon, we came across a lone traveler who introduced himself as Elias Farrow. He mentioned he was a researcher studying the behavioral patterns of wildlife in the area. While warning us about potential dangers lurking around, he discreetly glanced at his casual wristwear, some kind of bracelet with peculiar symbols. Sometime after sunset, we arrived at our campsite and set up our tents. Gathered around the fire, we bantered and shared laughter before retiring to our temporary dwellings, ready for slumber to engulf us. Screams pierced through my dreams, jolting me awake. At first, I thought Kyle was joking again. He's known for pulling pranks. But as I exited my tent and saw Mariana bleeding profusely by the fire pit with Kyle panicking beside her, I understood that something horrible had happened. We quickly learned Mariana's leg had been bitten by something unknown, tearing through her flesh with violent rage. Gripped by fear that something was stalking us, we immediately began consolidating our dwindling supplies to consider our options. Our ignorance of the creature's true identity only fueled our terror. As I collected makeshift weapons, a subtle movement on the edge of my vision startled me. Turning my attention towards it, I found nothing. No creature or menacing figure lurks in the shadows. Just the stillness of nature, sinister in its silence. I was sure something had just been there, watching me. Weeks later, a persistent dread gnawed at my sanity as we recounted our story to local rangers and officials. They listened intently but seemed skeptical as we relayed the series of brutal attacks that had unfolded over the course of three harrowing days in the depths of the canyon. I knew we weren't crazy. We were losing hope that anyone would believe our tale until an elderly Native American man approached us. His dark eyes appeared burdened with countless years of knowledge and understanding. He revealed a tragic history about Savkahar an unspeakable evil with innumerable deaths to its name, a beast with an insatiable appetite for blood. According to local legend, it was believed that centuries ago, a powerful shaman cursed the creature, trapping it within an ornate bracelet, like the one Elias wore. As he spoke those words on that unbelievably bleak day, I knew deep down that what we encountered wasn't a figment of our imagination or some mass hysteria. Our suffering was brought upon us by some twisted series of events that led to a beast being unleashed from its ancient bindings. Now I'm left with unanswerable questions and sleepless nights. What happened to Elias? Was this all a gruesome coincidence or something more sinister? Who would ultimately control Savkahar? And what other evil is lurking beneath the surface, patiently waiting for its chance to feed again? The torment of the unknown slowly weaved its way into my everyday life. The unanswered questions and insatiable curiosity drove me to research everything I could about the creature Savkahar, local legends, and the history of the people who inhabited the region. My studies brought me to dusty libraries, online forums brimming with speculation, and interviews with locals who had their own brushes with inexplicable terror. In my search for answers, I started to unravel a deeper mystery that seemed to span generations. I discovered cryptic accounts of unexplained deaths and missing persons that could be traced back as far as the 1800s each eerily similar to the horrors we endured in the heart of the canyon. As I delved deeper into these chilling tales, it became clear that there was an unsettling pattern emerging. 
The gaps between events seemed linked to periods when some unsuspecting individual took possession of that cursed bracelet. A chilling realization that Elias might not have been its first hapless victim. This horrifying information only fed my obsession further. I began seeking out others who claimed to have encountered Salkahar, all the while grappling with a sinking feeling that every interaction might invite more peril into my life. But I couldn't stop. Some twisted need for closure prevented me from turning away. With each passing day, an increasingly consuming fear festered within me, taunting me with vivid reminders of our doomed expedition and heightening my feverish paranoia. Every rustling in the shadows or soundless gust of wind hinted at something fiendish lurking nearby, watching me, biding its time until fate dictated we meet again. It was a unique and almost unnoticeable quirk that I spotted while observing a man in the crowded hustle of Union Square, San Francisco. The way he clenched his jaw and glanced over his shoulder, his body tensing dramatically when the deafening crash of construction equipment rattled through the open air, was something that would only matter to people like me. My name is Devro Moretti. I've been with the CIA for about seven years now, working covertly to identify and eliminate threats before they become dangerous. But I never thought that my path would cross with something like this. A few weeks later, while visiting a friend in Mendocino National Forest, I witnessed a horrifying scene. My friend, Jackson Greer, took me on a hike down one of the forest trails. Still. Early in the morning, the light had just begun to break through the dense canopy above us. As we rounded a bend, our laughter was suddenly cut short by a sight that made us both reel back in horror. A hiker's mutilated body lay strewn across the trail, limbs twisted unnaturally, and blood dripping from cruel gashes across his torso. Shaking with adrenaline, I pulled my phone out at 7.36 a.m. and called for assistance while Jackson tried his best to console Tara Groves, a traumatized witness who had been walking her dog nearby. Talking to Tara at 8.02 a.m. as she struggled to hold back her tears, she said that she'd seen an enormous creature crouch over the victim's body just before we'd arrived. The descriptions were vague something akin to a werewolf or massive canine beast. But one detail stood out among the rest, the same tense clenching of its monstrous jaw that I had seen in that unsuspecting man weeks ago. During our trek back amidst paramedics racing past us at 9.12 a.m., Jackson confided in me that there had been whispers of strange happenings happening in the area, livestock found mangled, pets disappearing, and unexplained howls echoing throughout the night. Locals called the creature the shadow because they rarely caught more than a glimpse of it, but everyone knew that the shadow struck terror in the hearts of those who encountered it. The next day, October 7th, around 4.15 p.m., I decided to pay a visit to the general store in town and listen for any leads on the mysterious creature. Knowing better than to assume my CIA credentials would be respected, I introduced myself as a private investigator trying to settle some old claims for an insurance company. Among conversations about rabid wildlife and paranoid neighbors at about 6.38 p.m., an old man named Silas Addington casually mentioned a family secret. His grandfather had worked as a lumberjack, and sold wood near Covalo Pass during the early 1900s. One fateful night, while his grandfather slept, something broke into their homestead and killed Silas' grandmother. It was after that night that everyone started hearing stories about the shadow. Putting the pieces together over several weeks of investigation and countless discussions with locals, at 3.54 p.m. on November 12th, 
I came to the unthinkable conclusion that the shadow wasn't a wild animal but rather a human who could transform into this indescribably terrifying beast at will. I felt like I was walking through sludge as I tried to reconcile this information with my previously rational worldview. But there was no denying it any longer. Our world contained secrets, far stranger than I had ever imagined possible. Duty drove me to find answers, or, more accurately, confirmation of my suspicions about this creature's true identity. So now I watched these potential suspects like hawks from concealed positions around town at all hours of the day and night. I looked into their eyes with mounting unease as I searched for any trace of the monster. Jenna Andrews, one of the shadow's victims just last month, described as her emergency call was recorded at 9.53 p.m. The monster that I, a seasoned CIA agent with years of experience and disbelief under my belt, now know to be real tonight at 11.48 p.m. I'll confront Union Square's twitching jaws, hoping to God that I'm right about his true identity, or at least close enough to start unraveling this ancient family curse. One thing is certain, after tonight, nothing will ever be the same. And as I prepare myself for whatever may come when our paths collide, I steel myself for a confrontation that may cost me everything. That night, at 11.48 p.m., I found myself waiting in the shadows, watching the man with the twitching jaw make his way through Union Square. As he passes unnoticed by the oblivious crowd, I follow, tension coiling like a spring within me. Suddenly, he pauses. He shoots a glance in my direction and then darts down an alleyway. I sprint after him and catch a glimpse of his back as he rounds a corner. When I finally reach the spot, he's gone. Frustration builds within me. That's when I hear it, the sound of growling from above. I look up just as something massive and dark leaps down onto me with ferocity. The beast's appearance is nightmarish. Its fur is black like coal, and its eyes glow an unnatural yellow. Its hulking form towers over anyone or anything else in its vicinity, rippling muscles barely contained beneath its coal-colored body. It bears a striking resemblance to the grotesque descriptions of the shadow shared by terrified witnesses. I dodge out of its way as it snaps its colossal jaws at me with savage hunger. The force is shocking. What was once the clenching jaw of a nervous man is now capable of seizing life from man or beast alike. With blood pounding in my ears and adrenaline surging through my veins, we fight our deadly dance unfolding in that dark alleyway where no one can hear us or come to my aid. Over the course of our battle, I managed to land several solid blows on the shadow's hulking body while narrowly avoiding its lethal fangs. Despite my efforts, though, I feel myself weakening as it steadily wears me down. It's clear that our conflict will soon come to an end, whether I want it to or not. Just moments before the shadow can tear into me one final time, I hear a voice, its words disarming the creature and halting its attack. Stop! I can't control it anymore. Please help me! Instantly, the beast collapses to the ground and reverts to its human form, the man with the twitching jaw. Bloodied and bruised, he looks at me pleadingly. I don't want this life. I don't want to hurt anyone. It's a curse that has haunted my family for generations. Staring into his anguished eyes, I recall Tara's heartbroken pleas for her lost friends and Jenna's chilling 911 call. At that moment, I made a decision. You want my help? Fine. But we need to find a way to stop these killings before more innocent lives are lost. Together, as dawn breaks over San Francisco, we begin our journey into the unknown, 
an alliance forged in desperation and a pact sealed by the shared promise of ending the shadow's reign of terror. And though we venture forth with no certainty of victory or survival, I'm driven onward by the knowledge that some battles must be fought, regardless of where they may lead or what price may be paid for victory. I was on a tedious surveillance operation in Calaveras County, California, when I first encountered it. You know, one of those stakeouts that ends up being a whole lot of sitting in a car, waiting, and not much else? My name is Dexter Whitaker, but most people just call me Dex. I'm a CIA agent working undercover, as they usually do. My current assignment involved tracking a potential domestic terrorist based in the area. A crucial part of my job is to always stay observant. So even though I had a feeling that something was off that day, I didn't think too much about it. As the sun dipped below the horizon, I decided to stretch my legs and take a break from my post. Near the dirt road where my car was parked, there lay an abandoned cabin mottled with grime, with shattered windows and a collapsed porch, signifying its age and neglect. The place reeked of decay, creating an eerie atmosphere in contrast to the silence of the forest. It wasn't long after venturing out when I heard some rustling in the bushes nearby. No sooner had I taken out my gun to investigate than terror gripped me as a blur of movement slammed next to me. A man emerged right in front, with parts of his flesh ripped open and blood gushing out from several wounds. Help me! He managed to choke out through quavering breaths before collapsing on the ground. I didn't have time to gather my thoughts before a predatory howl echoed through the trees above me. The blood-curdling sound made every hair on my body stand at attention. Slowly approaching from the shadows with sharp movements came an indescribable creature. It vaguely resembled something like an emaciated wolf or dog with unnaturally long limbs and bony spikes protruding from its back and neck, giving it an otherworldly appearance. Its milky white eyes fixed their gaze on me, a haunting sight I simply couldn't tear myself away from. Panic surged through me as it launched itself toward my position. Time seemed to slow down as I fired rounds at the creature, but none of the bullets seemed to have any effect. The creature lunged violently. 12.37 a.m. Narrowly avoiding its grasp, I retreated into the cabin. Adrenaline pumped through my veins as I used every last ounce of strength to barricade the door. Within seconds, the creature began throwing itself against the door's wooden frame with bone-shattering force, snarling viciously. The longer it tried to claw its way inside, the more intense and frenzied it became. As its assault lasted throughout the night, I frantically searched for any possible means of escape, finally coming across a small crawl space that led to an exit on the other side. 9.23 a.m. With daylight on my side and in a nearly exhausted state, I managed to escape its clutches and return to my post. It was only later, after consulting some locals, that I discovered hearsay about this feral beast called the Whispering Strider, supposedly an ancient being responsible for countless deaths and disappearances throughout Calaveras County's history. While I was never entirely sure if what I had faced was indeed that mythical monster or perhaps a clever antagonist weaponizing an urban legend, fear bore into me every waking moment from that day forward. Its grotesque image remains etched into my memory, lurking in the background of every mission. End of log entry. As the pen fell from Dexter's trembling hand, he paused for a moment before boarding his plane back home.
He couldn't shake off a nagging suspicion that he had unfinished business with whatever being he had crossed paths with during that catastrophic operation in Calaveras County. His gut screamed at him that the sly creature would eventually reveal itself. Upon my return home, I couldn't shake the notion that the creature I had encountered in Calaveras County was somehow linked to the domestic terrorism case I was investigating. The victim's shredded body and the beast's tireless pursuit of me led me to believe it was no ordinary creature, perhaps an ancient predator that would stop at nothing to protect its territory. Determined to learn more about this horrifying entity, I scoured every library and archive I could find for answers. What little information I uncovered confirmed my worst fears. The Whispering Strider was more than just a local myth. It was a nightmarish specter that had ravaged the area for centuries, shifting its hunting grounds just enough to stay one step ahead of authorities and avoid detection. The physical descriptions of the creature were deeply unsettling. Accounts from survivors revealed that it possessed cryptic markings all over its emaciated, lupin body, which seemed to glow subtly in the darkness. Its elongated limbs enabled it to take enormous strides, stalking its prey with terrifying stealth. The needle-like spikes that lined its spine caused a distinctive rustling sound as it shifted through the underbrush, explaining how it got its name. I knew that ignoring such an abomination would be reckless, even if it wasn't directly linked to my initial mission as a CIA agent. Harnessing my vast resources and connections within the intelligence community, I set out to uncover every secret and shred of evidence I could find about the creature. One morning at precisely 7.03 a.m., three days after my research began, I received a call from an informant who'd recently encountered the Strider in a nearby woodland area. It had attacked another human being, this time within city limits. Its merciless attacks were becoming bolder. It seemed as though it was purposefully terrorizing unsuspecting communities. I took off immediately, reaching out to contacts and local law enforcement agencies to aid them with this unnatural evil that plagued their town. The authorities and I agreed to set a trap for the creature, disguising it as a civilian on nighttime patrol in the area where it was last seen. My knowledge of its behavior gave us a fighting chance, though we were aware of the inherent danger involved. Just after midnight, our operation commenced. We placed mannequins nearby to simulate human presence and waited, our heartbeats quickening with dread as the clock ticked away. Under the sickly glow of streetlights, an otherworldly silence fell. At precisely 1.24 a.m., a faint rustling echoed through the trees. The monster revealed itself, its milky white eyes glowing as it scanned its surroundings. It entered our trap cautiously, seeking confirmation of its prey's presence. When we least expected it, we sprung into action, utilizing advanced technology designed specifically to stun and immobilize the creature without killing it. As heavy-duty chains tightened around its snarling form, violent electrical currents coursed through its veins, rendering it momentarily paralyzed. I approached the shackled creature with steadfast determination while my fellow agents assembled to examine the creature further. For all of our planning and weapons at our disposal, capturing such an entity without killing it proved exceedingly difficult. The strider was seething with rage, his muscles tense with barely restrained malice. In those still moments when I locked eyes with my vengeful foe, I realized something chilling. This ancient hunter could not be stopped permanently by physical force alone. The creature, bound by steel and liquid neurotoxin, which reduced its powerful body to tremors, would come back stronger if we let our guard down. But in that same moment, I also understood that fear is only one aspect of power, knowledge is another. 
studying this malevolent creature relentlessly and learning everything possible about its physiology and behavior gave me a solid foundation from which to build a defense. I knew I couldn't eradicate the Whispering Strider for good, but armed with my research and a tenacious spirit, I could continue to protect those it sought to harm. As I walked away from the subdued beast and back into my old life, the power of knowledge swelled within me more than ever before. With equal parts respect and determination, I realized that if the Strider would ever re-emerge, so would I. It was a strange time in my life, back when I had the capacity to love something that wasn't human. Furby, that toy from the 90s, was everything to me. I spent more time with it than any person I've ever known. I couldn't have predicted that it would be a key factor in how the summer unfolded and in the grisly events that haunted my dreams for years to come. It was during that fateful summer of 2008 in a semi-secluded campground called Devil's Gulch in South Dakota, that things took a dark turn. My name is Jonah Harrington, and I was an enthusiastic camper who loved exploring the hidden corners of America. Out there, with nothing but nature and my trusty 92 Winnebago Brave RV for company, it felt like an escape from reality. Another round? Kevin asked me as he held up a bottle of beer. My friend, Roxy, and I had drunkenly made our way through several rounds of poker throughout the night. Nah, man, I'm good. I chuckled as Roxy elbowed me playfully. Can you guys believe we'll be parting ways after this weekend? Roxy sighed wistfully. I'm really going to miss our trips. Our campfire flickered softly under the canopy of stars and moonlit pines. The hours ticked by as we shared stories of our favorite camping memories over one too many beers. We were blissfully unaware that somewhere in the darkness, unseen eyes were stalking us with malicious intent. As night turned to early morning, we each retreated to our respective tents or RVs for some much-needed rest. Sleep thanked us with its embrace, as we were unaware of how drastically things would change later that very morning. The next day started out normal enough, with Kevin nursing a hangover and Roxy packing her belongings back into her car. It was around noon when Kevin noticed something terrifying, the mutilated body of a fellow camper spread across their campsite. Her wide-open eyes stared blankly into the abyss. The sight was too gruesome to describe. Kevin could hardly choke out the words as he tried to explain what he'd seen to us. The severity of the situation began to settle in, and we soon realized that we were in grave danger. It's got to be the work of someone among us, Roxy said, her voice trembling with fear. We formed a plan gather our belongings, abandon our camping trip, and contact the police as soon as possible. Only later would we learn about William Bruce Ray, a notorious killer on the loose at the time. Though he hadn't been linked to Devil's Gulch yet, his twisted and violent MO aligned with the nightmarish scene we had encountered. As Roxy's red Toyota Camry took off towards safety, Kevin and I scrambled to gather our belongings and flee. We were almost ready when it happened, the moment that still chills me to my core. Through Jonah's RV window, I saw something almost indescribable, a man with hate-filled eyes and covered in an unnatural sheen of black filth. He wielded a blood-covered machete that glistened menacingly as he prowled through the trees, searching for his next victim. I could see his lips curl into a sick smile as he eyed us hungrily through the window. Jonah, I whispered frantically. He's here. He knows where we are. 
time seemed to slow down as we came face to face with our worst nightmare. Our hearts pounded as adrenaline surged us into action. We slammed our RV doors shut and fumbled for our keys, hoping against hope that we'd be able to escape before he reached us. In those tense moments, it seemed as if our lives had spiraled into a horrifying true crime documentary. We knew then more than ever how fragile life truly was. As we turned the key in the ignition, tires spun against gravel while we tore away from the campground, barely escaping with our lives. I could still hear the sick laughter of that monstrous man as we left him far behind. Weeks later, we watched the news in stunned silence as images of William Bruce Ray flashed across the screen. He still hadn't been caught, but now Devil's Gulch was on his list of hunting grounds. We couldn't help but wonder, would this nightmare ever end? What had begun as a carefree adventure had morphed into a living nightmare. I couldn't shake my suspicions about William Bruce Ray. Even though I had quit my job at the gas station after the incident, I found myself researching this terrifying man every spare moment I had. I came across articles detailing his previous murders and discovered an alarming pattern. Almost all of his victims had some connection to Furby toys. This disturbing revelation piqued my interest, and I began to dig deeper into the history of these strange artifacts. To my horror, I uncovered information about a long-forgotten cult that worshipped the toys as if they were gods. Members would perform horrific rituals on their victims, often involving mutilation and torture. I soon realized that every location where William Bruce Ray had taken his life bore striking similarities to our own campsite at Devil's Gulch. Driven by a fervent need for answers, I became obsessed with the case. Venturing further into the dark web, I tracked down every last detail of both Furbies and this cult that seemingly worshipped them. It was in those depths that I found something that would change everything, a video supposedly taken by one of William Bruce Ray's followers. I noticed that William could be seen clutching a bloody Furby doll before he committed each cruel act. Somehow, this toy was linked to his bloodlust, an evil talisman granting him ungodly power. As weeks turned into months, it became clear that law enforcement was unable to capture the sociopathic killer. Knowing we might never be safe again, Kevin and Roxy reluctantly agreed to help me with one last plan, a plan we knew was filled with risks but could ultimately mean our salvation, to track down this man and ourselves. We followed every lead we could find, obsessively investigating crime scenes and tracking down anyone who might have interacted with William Bruce Ray in recent years. It was during our search through the ruins of a long-abandoned farm in rural Kentucky that we finally found him. Huddled in a dilapidated shed littered with dead animals, antique trinkets, and the darkest of symbols, there he was, the depraved lunatic we had been hunting for months. Around him were grotesque arrangements of fur-covered dolls glistening with dried blood, and countless Furby figurines stared us down unblinkingly. At that moment, I couldn't help but wonder if something ungodly had taken root within these peculiar playthings. However, before we could act, William spotted us and lunged forward with his machete, his cold eyes full of hatred. The air crackled with tension as we stood our ground against this monster. We fought tooth and nail for our lives. At one point, he came so close to slicing me open that I could smell the reek of my own impending death on his blade. In the midst of the struggle, Roxy grabbed one of the bloody Furbies and hurled it into a small fire burning in a nearby barrel. As its synthetic fur burst into flames, William cried out in agony as if connected to the fate of his twisted totem. While he stood incapacitated by some inexplicable pain, 
Kevin tackled him to the ground and managed to wrestle away his weapon. With William Bruce Ray under control at last, we wasted no time in binding him tight with a rope until the police could arrive. Somehow, witnessing Furby's demise gave us an opening to bring this man-man to justice. In the end, it wasn't long before law enforcement caught wind of our actions and arrived on site to apprehend William Bruce Ray. Overwhelmed with relief that this terror had ended at last, I took one last glance at those odd dolls consumed by flames and wondered what dark secrets truly lay hidden within their mechanical hearts. Despite nearly losing ourselves in this harrowing adventure fueled by vengeance and intrigue, we survived. The trial that followed exposed the gruesome cult to the public, and in dramatic fashion, they ended their existence alongside William Bruce Ray. As for us, we vowed never to let a sinister fascination with such evil overpower us again. I have this odd affinity for collecting things that no one else seems to be interested in. The stranger, the better. As a kid, I used to collect dead butterflies, unusual seashells, and worn down coins I'd find on the streets. It's a quirky little hobby of mine that has persisted into adulthood. And truth be told, it has led me down some pretty unusual paths. On a chilly night in late October, I found myself in a graveyard just outside of Wichita, Kansas. It's not my usual choice of venue, but I had heard rumors of an unmarked gravestone there that bore an exceptionally unique inscription, irresistible to someone with an inclination towards the obscure like me. My name is Cornell Langstroth, by the way an associate professor of anthropology who liked to go on adventures as long as they were within reach of a highway diner and a warm bed. But nothing could have prepared me for the events about to unfold. As I strolled between the rows of crumbling gravestones beneath the dim light of a crescent moon, I couldn't help but feel an odd sense of desolation looming over me. The occasional rustling leaves seemed almost deliberate in their whispery menace. And then I saw it, the mysterious unmarked gravestone that had drawn me here like a moth to the flame. A mere stub compared to other tombstones in its vicinity, years of erosion had stripped it of its polish and sheen. But etched into its cold surface were words that sent shivers down my spine. Here lies Nathaniel Blackthorne feared by all, vanquished by none. A cold breeze stirred my jacket as the absurd thought flashed. What if Nathaniel was still out there, vengefully stalking his own burial ground? The rational side of me discarded the idea immediately. After all, such paranormal tales were never truly believable. And yet, as I continued my stroll, I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. Suddenly, something caught my eye in the distance, near the abandoned church that belonged to the graveyard. A faint shadow ducked behind one of the worn stone walls. My heart pounding in my chest now, I approached cautiously, curiosity outweighing my fear. As I crept closer to the decrepit structure, I heard a guttural growl echoing in the darkness. Bloodstains, fresh ones, marked a gruesome trail leading toward the church entrance. Terrified but determined to discover the source of this grisly scene, I pushed open the creaking door and stepped inside. The flicker of sinister shadows cast by my flashlight painted macabre images upon every surface. Before me lay an unspeakable monstrosity. Multiple mangled corpses were dragging their broken limbs, struggling to traverse the dusty floor toward me. There was no denying it, something truly heinous was at work here. I stumbled backward, only to trip over something that sent me sprawling on the ground. 
My flashlight rolled away, casting a sickly glint on an old book that lay beside me. Its pages looked worn and yellow from age. With trembling hands, I opened it, and as my eyes scanned through its tattered pages, I saw references to a creature far beyond my wildest imagination, Nathaniel Blackthorne, bound by foul rituals until the end of days. Of course, it all made sense now. Our grave desecrator from before was indeed Nathaniel himself, still enacting his nefarious acts beyond death. Frantic and terrified, I slammed the cursed book shut as chaos unfolded around me. The bodies crawled even faster toward me, their groans and growls intensifying. Surely, it was only a matter of time before they were upon me. The moonlight filtering through a broken stained glass window bathed everything in a malevolent shade of red. It was then that I saw him, Nathaniel Blackthorne, standing tall against the backdrop of his unholy church, his grinning visage an embodiment of unspeakable malice. Frozen in terror, all I could do was watch helplessly as he strode towards me, every step resounding with menacing intent. The dead bodies on the floor paused in their frenzied crawl, turning their vacant eyes toward their nightmarish master as he closed in. My heart raced in my chest. This was it, my ultimate misfortune brought upon me by my own morbid curiosity. As I lay there, fearing the horrific end that seemed inevitable, I noticed the glint of moonlight reflecting upon a worn section of the old book. Desperate for any chance of escape, I blindly handed over the book to Nathaniel Blackthorne and begged him to spare my life in exchange for the book. His menacing grin widened as he took the book from my trembling hands. For a moment, it seemed like he considered my offer before turning his gaze upon me with an icy sneer. Very well, he said finally, but not before you assist me with one little task. The stench of decay weighed heavily in the air as Nathaniel jerked his head towards the advancing mangled corpses. Despite my mounting terror, I knew that accepting his request was the only option if I wanted to survive. I need you to help me find a pendant concealed somewhere within this church, he explained coldly. It holds the power required to break this curse cycle and free me once and for all. With no other choice but to comply, we embarked on our search together stepping over the decaying bodies that lay scattered around us. With every groan and wheeze from these indescribable creatures, my heart hammered against my ribs. As we searched, Nathaniel begrudgingly spoke to me about his past life and his fate, which was sealed by a series of dark spells. He revealed how powerful enemies cursed him simply because they couldn't beat him in an honest fight. Exhausted and desperate, I spotted something on an old wooden altar. A crimson pendant lay hidden beneath layers of grime, the final piece to Nathaniel's twisted puzzle. With trembling hands, I handed over the pendant. The wicked gleam in Nathaniel's eyes could have matched that of the moon itself as he placed it around his neck. Nathaniel's laugh echoed throughout the church drowning out the distant growling sounds of the creatures. Before long, they, too, vanished from sight, leaving us completely alone. I feel reinvigorated, Nathaniel declared, casting an almost human smile in my direction as he examined the pendant. The church around us seemed to shimmer and distort, eventually dissolving into darkness. Suddenly, I found myself back in the graveyard, alive but forever scarred by what had transpired that horrid night. As I stumbled away from those cursed grounds, a shiver ran down my spine. Was Nathaniel truly free now? And if so, what does that mean for the rest of us? As days turned into weeks and months into years, my life eventually resumed some semblance of normalcy. 
I quit my hobby of collecting strange items and turned away from the dark curiosities that had pulled me to that cursed place. But every once in a while, caught in a sudden gust of chill wind or a fleeting glimpse of an ominous shadow, I am reminded of Nathaniel Blackthorn. The haunted memories of that night continue to linger, and with them comes the unshakable feeling that Nathaniel is out there somewhere, waiting for our paths to cross again. Till then, all I can do is share my tale in hopes that it may serve as a warning to others who dare venture down roads best left untraveled, roads where things beyond our comprehension dwell in the shadows, eager to drag us into their nightmare. I've always had a strange fascination with the grisly histories of mob bosses and killers. It's not something I normally admit to most people in casual conversation, but sitting alone in my apartment, surrounded by old books and records, it's hard not to reflect on that fact. It's as if I were drawn to such stories, like a moth to a flame. My name is Silas Marner an ordinary name for an ordinary guy. I work as an archivist in the local library, where I'm surrounded all day by the same books and records that fill my little studio apartment. It was through my work that I first learned about the unsolved murders connected to a local graveyard, Lakewood Cemetery. Lakewood Cemetery is located just outside of Batesville, Mississippi. My curiosity eventually got the better of me, and one day I found myself exploring the graveyard during daylight hours. The place wasn't much to look at. Overgrown grass and ivy covered most graves, though clearly, there was someone maintaining a certain degree of order within the chaos. It was while I was walking through the graveyard that I met Zebulon Taggart and his friend, Lysander Frobisher. They were amateur paranormal investigators with a YouTube channel dedicated to their adventures exploring haunted sites. Zeb and Lai struck me as genuine people who shared my curiosity about what might be happening at Lakewood. After some pleasantries were exchanged and we explained our respective interests in the cemetery, we agreed to meet up later that night. After all, nothing spooky ever happens during daylight hours. As we returned under cover of darkness, with only flashlights as our companions, our conversation took on hushed tones while we skirted around our reasons for investigating this place. Unbeknownst to us initially, there were darker secrets than we could have imagined lurking amongst the tombstones. Our flashlights illuminated grotesque, rotting statues and cobwebs glistening in the dewy moonlight. Piece by piece, we began to uncover the sordid history of Lakevold, gruesome murders and dismemberments that had remained unsolved for a good reason. None of the locals wanted to willingly delve into the cemetery's past or even acknowledge its existence. It was feared that some ancient, malevolent force might be angered if the gruesome secrets were brought to light once more. As we wandered deeper into Lakevold Cemetery, Lai suddenly stopped in his tracks, claiming he could hear footsteps behind us. The three of us exchanged nervous glances. We all agreed that we couldn't ignore this possible sign of danger, so we kept pushing forward with our investigation. Our exploration eventually led us to an area of the graveyard shrouded in darkness and fog, with an almost palpable sense of dread hanging thick in the air. As we tried to steady our nerves, we noticed strange symbols etched onto several gravestones. These same symbols were linked to a sinister cult rumored to have operated around Batesville nearly a century earlier. It was then that we heard it, the snap of a twig underfoot, followed by low growls and whispers around us. Our conversation halted abruptly as we turned off our flashlights scanning our surroundings frantically for any sign of movement. 
That's when something struck Seb from behind with incredible force, sending him sprawling to the ground. In panic desperation, we scrambled together and began making our way back out of Lakefold Cemetery, keeping an eye out for Zeb's attacker. We could hear the sounds of pursuit as feet pounded against the earth close behind us, barely losing speed even as Lai tripped over a cluster of exposed roots. We managed to make it back just outside Lakefold Cemetery when we dared look back one final time. It was impossible to see in what manner we were being pursued, but the horrific sights we had seen and the unspeakable terror in our hearts were testament enough to the very real danger we had faced. Days after our escape from the cemetery, I was contacted by a historian from Batesville. He told me that he had recently discovered information suggesting an ancient creature was responsible for the string of grisly atrocities that took place in Lakevold, a creature so cruel and terrifying that not even its name could be recalled without those who knew of its existence, fearing for their safety. As I listened to the historian's information on this chilling monster, I realized how little paranormal activity we'd actually experienced during our investigation. The truth was far more horrifying and sinister than anything we could have imagined. Justifiably shaken by what had happened to us, I couldn't entirely let go of the mysteries of Lakewood Cemetery. I started to dig deeper into the cult responsible for the symbols we found hoping that would lead me closer to understanding the ancient creature that had claimed so many victims over the years. It didn't take long for me to find out that the cult was still alive and well, operating in secret among the populace. Their members were hidden threats within our community, waiting and watching for signs that anyone was drawing close to their carefully guarded secrets. As I began making connections between the cult and a string of recent kidnappings and murders in Batesville, I started receiving anonymous threats. Notes left on my car and dead animals left outside my apartment warned me to stay away from Lakewood Cemetery and forget what I knew. But I couldn't just forget. People were still dying, victims of an ancient creature driven by bloodlust. It was during an unnervingly quiet night that I finally figured out who was behind my threats. Thomas, my neighbor, who had always seemed innocently friendly. It turned out he was a member of the cult as well as being involved in the recent killings. It was his face that looked back at me from a poorly lit surveillance photo taken outside my apartment building when I realized where all his errands early in the morning were leading him. Armed with this new knowledge, I decided it was time to confront the enemy head-on and put a stop to these horrors once and for all. The graveyard beckoned once more. It felt like every step led me closer to darkness itself. The fog hung even thicker there tonight, giving off an otherworldly glow under the moonlight. As I approached the cemetery gates, I heard voices murmuring nearby barely audible over the howling wind. Suddenly, faint lights appeared in the distance. It seemed that members of the cult were performing some dark ritual. The whispers grew louder, and I recognized Thomas's voice among them. Guided by urgency, I tiptoed closer, my heart pounding with both anticipation and fear. Then it happened. The ghastly creature materialized out of nowhere conjured up by the cultist's chance. The air became colder in its presence. I could feel my breath hitching as I watched its twisted form shimmer beneath the shadows cast by the tombstones. Before I could react or even process what I was seeing, the cultist handed over a young woman to the creature, bound and terrified. It was clear that they were attempting to appease it with their insane sacrifices but I couldn't bear to witness her death on their altar of madness. I took a deep breath and charged at them with all my might. Caught off guard, one of the cultists lost his balance and stumbled into a cluster of gravestones. 
In that frenzied chaos of screams and confusion, the monstrous creature devoured another cultist before vanishing back into thin air. Seizing my chance, I untied the terrified woman and dragged her to safety as quickly as possible. Batesville was never truly safe after that night. Whispers persisted about Lake Vold Cemetery's ancient horrors continuing in secret under the cult's protection. As for me, well, how can you forget something like that? You can't simply rebuild your life as though nothing ever happened after coming face to face with such evil. Yes, my story may not have a perfect ending, but sometimes, simply surviving becomes its own twisted victory. And so, every day from then on, surrounded by silent reminders of unimaginable terror kept at bay only by sheer willpower and stubborn determination, I lived. I've always had a knack for finding things people didn't know they'd lost. It's this strange, inexplicable ability that has led me down some interesting paths in life. From uncovering family secrets to locating missing heirlooms, my unique skill has never failed to pique the interest of those around me. I swear, it's like the universe is playing a constant game of hide and seek, and I'm always chosen to be the seeker. My name is Lysander Oakley. I'm an antique dealer by trade and a semi-professional finder on the side. About six months ago, I got a call from an old friend named Marius Wright. We hadn't spoken in well over a decade, but he contacted me to ask if I could help him locate something important that he'd lost, his cousin Felix. Marius explained that his once close family had been estranged since their grandparents' funeral. Thrust back together after years apart, they held a reunion at their grandparents' old cottage in the woods near Lake Tahoe. Felix had gone missing one night without a trace. I need your expertise, Marius pleaded. This isn't like Felix. He wouldn't just leave like that. I told Marius I'd do my best packed my bags, and headed for Lake Tahoe. Upon arriving at the old cottage, I met up with Marius and the rest of his family members who stayed over. We reconvened at the dining room table in preparation for our search. Let me get this straight. Marius' niece, Ivy Quinn, chimed in. You're here because you can find things? Like some sort of supernatural detective? I shrugged nonchalantly. Supernatural might be pushing it. Marius interjected before I could finish. But he's helped many people in the past with difficult cases. The next day, I roamed the woods around the cottage, and while my gift usually guides me to precisely what I seek, something about the atmosphere felt overwhelmingly tense, as if someone was watching me. Then I stumbled across a disturbing set of stairs deep in the forest. No logic seemed to explain their presence. They merely stood alone, surreal and imposing. As I hesitated before the staircase, I felt an indescribable dread wash over me. A sense of danger clawed at the back of my mind. Resisting the urge to ascend the mysterious steps, I thought it best to consult Marius. The tension in the room was palpable as I delivered my findings to the family, detailing both my inexplicable unease and my unsettling discovery. Marius' brother, Cassius Thornbridge, skeptically eyed me. You're trying to tell us that some creepy staircase in the woods has something to do with Felix's disappearance? That's when Ivy broke her silence. Speaking without emotion or hesitation, she coldly revealed that on that fateful night weeks prior, they had encountered the staircase and dared Felix to climb it as a joke, a test of bravado. Felix had willingly obliged, yet once he reached halfway up, he simply vanished into thin air. 
The stunned silence following Ivy's confession was deafening. Days passed without any sign of Felix. Although we searched everywhere we could think of and spread countless flyers in town offering rewards for any information leading to his whereabouts, nothing came out of it. No leads, no witnesses, just dead ends. Feeling defeated and increasingly concerned for my own safety due to the eerie energy permeating my surroundings, I decided it was time for me to return home. My gift let me down this time, or perhaps it revealed something better left unseen. The image of Feliz ascending those stairs towards oblivion still haunts me today. Months after returning from Lake Tahoe, I received an anonymous letter in the mail containing nothing but a single newspaper clipping. No return address, no note, just a headline dated two days before Felix disappeared. Infamous serial killer and kidnapper, Victor Sheridan, escapes custody near Lake Tahoe. A cold chill ran down my spine as I realized the Predator Marius family had unknowingly invited into their home and, ultimately, the reason why I couldn't find Felix. The letter sender remains unknown to this day, a sinister mystery hanging over my memories of that fateful search party and those dreadful stares in the woods that now haunt me forevermore. For weeks after receiving the newspaper clipping, I couldn't shake the feeling of having unfinished business at Lake Tahoe. The thought of Victor Sheridan lurking in the shadows, having escaped custody, and likely having played a role in Felix's disappearance, not at me. I knew I had to go back and uncover the truth. As soon as I arrived at Lake Tahoe, I started my investigation by gathering any information about past victims and their connections to Victor Sheridan. Visiting local libraries and talking to detectives, I pieced together a pattern. All of his victims had vanished near mysterious staircases in the woods, just like Felix had. It became clear to me that Victor used these staircases as his hunting grounds. One evening, as I was scouring through online forums discussing Victor's modus operandi, an anonymous user posted a message claiming that they knew where Victor was hiding. I messaged them privately, and after confirming their claim was legitimate, they provided me with the coordinates of an old abandoned cabin deep in the woods near one of these strange staircases. Armed with this information and my determination to bring Felix's case to a close, I ventured deep into the forest, where the cabin lay hidden. As night fell and the atmosphere grew increasingly eerie, I approached the dilapidated structure with caution. My heart raced as I stepped into the cabin's darkness, its creaking wooden floors protesting beneath my feet. A horrendous stench filled the air, a horrifying mix of decay, sweat, and something metallic, blood. The scene before me was chilling, blood-stained walls adorned with newspaper clippings of Sheridan's victims and tools used for God knows what atrocities. Suddenly, a voice from behind sent shivers down my spine. I knew you'd come looking for me. I whipped around only to see Victor Sheridan himself standing there, grinning manically as he brandished a knife in his hand. You couldn't resist the mystery, eh? It's over, Victor. You can't keep doing this, I said, trying to maintain my composure. He lunged at me with a knife, but I managed to dodge his attack. We engaged in a tumultuous struggle, with the knife nicking my arm in the process, causing it to bleed profusely. In desperation, I grabbed a rusty pipe lying nearby and swung it at Victor's head with all my strength. He dropped to the ground, unconscious but alive. Bloodied and bruised, I dragged Victor out of the cabin and into the woods, towards the staircase that had haunted me for months. With him tied up and weakened, I made my way back to town with the weight of what had happened bearing down upon me. The police soon swarmed the cabin where I had found Victor Sheridan hiding out. 
As they investigated deeper into the surrounding woods, they unearthed a network of tunnels linking each of these mysterious staircases. Grotesque trophies from his victims were kept as morbid reminders of his heinous crimes. Finally realizing that Sheridan masqueraded as a helpful guest at Felix's family reunion was sickening. Victor was taken into custody and placed back behind bars, where he belonged. The depth of his depravity became public knowledge, and how he used the staircases to prey on unsuspecting victims brought not only closure for Felix's family but many others too. The mystery of those eerie stairs still lingers in my mind. However, some things are better left unexplored. For now, what matters is that I've managed to put an end to Victor Sheridan's reign of terror. Justice may have been served for all those affected by his sick and twisted schemes, but for me, this experience will stick with me for the rest of my days, with the haunting image of those stairs forever etched in my memory. I had just finished a crossword puzzle in the local newspaper when my radio cracked to life. Life as a small town sheriff in Lone Pine, California, wasn't exactly taking me to neck breaking adrenaline highs. But life was calm, and that's how I liked it. I stretched my hands and stood up, waiting for dispatch to instruct me on the situation. Sheriff McQuaid, you're needed at a scene near the Alabama Hills. Antoine Lenore, the 911 dispatcher, reported, his voice calm against the static of his radio signal. Copy that, I replied, reaching for my jacket and hat. Vincent McQuaid, Sheriff of Lone Pine, that's me. I dutifully jumped into my cruiser and drove towards Alabama Hills a renowned geological hotspot frequented by hikers and climbers alike. No lights or sirens were deemed necessary, so I let the cruiser drift through the small town streets at its own pace. Residents waved from their front porches as I drove past them. Many were familiar faces around Lone Pine. As I approached the designated region in the Alabama hills, it became apparent how disturbing the scene truly was. Jesus Christ! I muttered to myself as I parked the cruiser and stepped out. It looked like an explosion, rocks splintered everywhere, and large boulders cracked in half. There was something ominous about this degree of unnatural destruction. But what caught my attention more than anything was the blood. There were gruesome traces of blood streaked across shattered rock fragments on the ground. I scoured the wreckage for any victims or potential survivors when I caught sight of a mangled body among the debris. The damage to their limbs and faces was extensive. It seemed almost unfathomable that it could be caused by falling rocks alone. While surveying the scene, Marnie Becker approached me a seasoned law enforcement officer in her own right. Can you believe this? She whispered, visibly shaken. It doesn't even look human. What would cause something like this? I've been wondering the same thing. I confessed, feeling unsettled. We continued to investigate the scene until dusk forced us to pack up. As we drove back into town, Whispers of eerie tales floated around the small town. Apparently, old folks had long believed in a local legend about some monstrous humanoid creature that savagely attacked travelers along the roads of Lone Pine, which they called Malachi. The mention of it sent a shiver down my spine, but remaining skeptical and grounded in logic was my mantra. There is no way this so-called monster could be anything more than a myth. The following days were filled with more brutal attacks. Hikers were found mutilated in isolated spots, their bodies horrifically dismembered with no scientific explanation in sight. 
Despite reassurances from wildlife experts that perhaps a rogue bear or mountain lion was responsible for these macabre killings, I couldn't shake the suffocating unease that settled within me. Things took an even darker turn the day before Antoine Lenore's funeral. Antoine had been found dead outside his home, his body ripped to shreds and his blood staining the white walls of his own house. Throughout all these attacks, town residents labeled me as their guardian. The agonizing stress of facing down an unseen enemy and trying to prevent further bloodshed wore me thin. Ironically, despite feeling obligated to protect Lone Pine from something unexplained and savage, I got my strongest lead from an external source, Abby Lockhart, an FBI specialist assigned to the case during its final days. Abby approached me after Antoine's funeral, her tone low and hushed beneath her umbrella to shield it from eavesdropping spectators. You need to know something, she said urgently. Before coming here, we trace back similar cases in other states, and there's one commonality, the Malachi. I don't know how it's possible, but it seems this creature has been hunting and wreaking havoc for generations. I shook my head, struggling to process what Abby was telling me. Are you saying we're dealing with some kind of monster? I asked skeptically. She hesitated before replying. I don't know what it is, but I think it's worth considering. It felt absurd as the words left my mouth, but given the recent events, anything seemed plausible. After doing some further research and speaking with local historians, I learned that these supernatural occurrences were not exclusive to Lone Pine. Similar stories regarding the Malachi were told around campfires and passed down through generations in neighboring towns as far away as Nevada. Even though I wanted to dismiss this entity as folklore, I couldn't shake off an eerie feeling, which compounded my growing unease. To catch this thing, or at least understand it, a plan was devised by Abby and me. A stakeout with a small team near the most recent attack sites. If it struck again, we would be ready for it. But nobody could have prepared us for what we faced that night. As we anxiously waited in the shadows of the Alabama hills, drizzled by a cold rain that seemed too fitting for our dire circumstances, a haunting howl echoed eerily through the night. Instinctively gripping our firearms tighter, we scanned the dark landscape nervously. At first, there was nothing but oppressive silence. Then, movement from behind a sizable rock formation caught my eye. What the hell is that? Marnie hissed from her position next to me. My eyes widened as I peered at an enormous figure lumbering toward us, a terrifying creature with large tusks protruding from its mouth and piercing yellow eyes that seemed to burn into my soul. This was Malachi. There wasn't time for doubt anymore. Each of us knew that this hideous monstrosity threatened our lives and everyone else's in Lone Pine. Despite my hands shaking from adrenaline, I managed to align my rifle with the beast in fire, bullets tearing through its thick hide. Marnie and Abby joined me in a furious volley of gunfire, a cacophony of violence that filled the air like rolling thunder. The creature roared in pain and fury as it staggered back, reeling from this unexpected counterattack. But instead of retreating or falling, it only seemed to grow angrier and more horrifyingly determined. With newfound strength, Malachi lunged toward us, its massive paws crashing through boulders as though they were made of mere twigs. As we continued firing into the monstrous form closing in on us, suddenly, there was an ear-splitting crash that shook the ground beneath our feet. From behind the Malachi, a massive boulder rolled down the hillside like an enormous bowling ball of fate and slammed into it with immense force. Even the impenetrable monster faltered under such an impact. But we couldn't take credit for this stroke of luck. Later, 
we'd learn one of the deceased victims was an accomplished climber who'd rigged some fail-safe traps in the area. Traps that would ultimately save our lives while putting an end to Terra's reign. As Malachi's lifeless body lay crumpled beneath the crushing weight of stone and valor, we breathed a collective sigh of relief that this thing wouldn't hurt anyone else. Yet even in triumph, we still struggled to understand what had just transpired in those eerie hills or how such a creature could have existed at all. In time, stories about the Malachi would fade from public consciousness, replaced by everyday fears such as car accidents or deadly illnesses. Yet those who had come face to face with death at its gnarled claws knew better. For them, the monster would forever serve as a reminder that danger often lurked closer than they thought. As for me, I remained in Lone Pine, continuing to protect those who called this quaint town home. But I still couldn't bring myself to enjoy the scenic beauty of the Alabama hills, a place that held dark memories of a terror-defying night. And whenever the wind whispers in a certain way, or an eerie howl on a far-off mountainside carries through the darkness, I brace myself to face whatever dangers might lie in hiding fearful of old ghosts that may still haunt our quiet town. About seven generations ago, my family settled in a quiet, secluded corner of upstate New York near the small town of Duval. This place has become known as one of the most peaceful regions, with lush forests and tranquil lakes. I work as a park ranger in one of the nearby state parks, which takes up most of my time. My name is Harold Jernigan, and my life took an unexpected and horrifying turn several years ago when I was working the night shift. The park covers a vast expanse of land, and on one fateful night in June 2014, at around 10.30 p.m., I was doing routine checks along the park's perimeter. Little did I know that I would come face to face with something that still haunts me to this day. The air was crisp and cool that evening, and the sky filled with billions of twinkling stars as the moon hid its glowing face behind some clouds. As I approached a heavily wooded area of the park that bordered Blackstone Lake, I spotted something peculiar, a pale figure hunched over on the forest floor, violently shaking. At first glance, it seemed like an injured animal or perhaps even another person who had lost their way. As a park ranger with extensive experience managing emergencies and rescuing lost tourists, my instincts kicked in to help whoever or whatever it might be. That area around Blackstone Lake was always full of superstitions and eerie whispers about strange occurrences among old-timers who lived there for ages. However, that never stopped people from visiting this captivating yet enigmatic region. As I got closer to the figure on the ground and started noticing smells similar to those of rotting meat and decay, I churned my stomach while I cautiously crept forward. The noises emanating from the being were guttural and primal. When I had closed the distance to no more than twenty feet from it, a guttural roar erupted from the creature that made me jump in terror. The adrenaline pumping through my veins gave me enough courage to shine my flashlight on the ghastly apparition before me, and I caught my first sight of the creature's appearance. Standing nearly eight feet tall and covered in sickly gray-green skin, it resembled a fusion between animal and human. Its bloodshot eyes met mine with an unsettling intensity, like seeing into the void, staring back at me. Details of its glistening, disfigured face was now visible, patchy hair, talon-like nails, and an elongated snout filled with razor-sharp teeth gritted together menacingly. This horrifying abomination was unlike anything I had seen or read in any biology books or field guides. The creature began to charge towards me, 
but I managed to run back to my patrol vehicle and speed off, feeling the force of it slamming into the side of my truck. On June 18th, at exactly 11.05 p.m., I encountered the fearsome cryptid that would later be known as the Blackstone Lake Beast. Following this terrifying event, several people who lived near Blackstone Lake disappeared or were found mutilated over the years. Grainy pictures and unsteady video footage captured glimpses of this sinister local legend as the years passed. Uncertain about its origin and motives for the gruesome acts it carried out, information about this fiend remains sparse. Had it been living in this area for generations, preying on unwelcome outsiders who dared venture too deep within its territory? What was this thing? Some unidentified hybrid species or a curiosity of nature gone horribly awry. As for myself, despite numerous sessions with psychiatrists and therapists who keep trying to tell me that I imagined it all, I know what I saw that night was real. The presence of something unnatural in the woods near Blackstone Lake casts an unsettling, evil shadow over the serene landscape. As time goes by, I can never fully escape the horrific memories of that night when I chanced upon this terrifying monster, which still remains at large. Haunted by my encounter with the Blackstone Lake Beast, I became determined to uncover more about this ghastly creature and attempt to put an end to its reign of terror. In my search for answers, I reached out to my friend and fellow ranger, Miles, who had been stationed in a neighboring park. The idea was simple, track down and record every victim's circumstances to create a pattern we could trace. Armed with our findings, we launched covert investigations covering the vicinity of Blackstone Lake from June 20th to June 23rd. On June 22nd, at precisely 3.15 p.m., we stumbled upon the mangled remnants of an unfortunate hiker. His body was twisted and torn like a ragdoll, his insides spilling onto the forest floor. The bushes around us rustled as if in response to our morbid discovery. Miles and I exchanged nervous glances before carefully drawing our weapons, me with my hunting knife and Miles armed with a tranquilizer gun. We intended to put up a fight if the inhuman beast reared its head once more. As we made our cautious way toward the unsettling sound, it abruptly ceased, leaving only an eerie silence in its wake. We ventured closer toward the lake's edge, where an ancient grotto lay hidden. The stench of decay was overwhelming. It was then that Miles noticed nearby marks that must have been made by the creature dragging its victims into this unsettling location like a graveyard. It was clear that we needed to act carefully and decisively if we were to keep ourselves and others safe from this grisly monster. On June 24, at 11.57 p.m., after endless hours of keeping watch over the area and planning our course of action, we set traps and strategic positions throughout the tree-choked landscape surrounding Blackstone Lake. The trap sprung on June 25th at precisely 8.37 a.m., signifying that the beast had taken the bait. As Miles and I approached, we saw the monster writhing in pain, caught in a snare infused with powerful sedatives. A glistening sheen of sweat coated its grotesque skin, illuminated by a beam of sunlight that had snuck through the thick foliage. And then it happened, the unthinkable, as this monstrous abomination began to transform before our very eyes. Like a gruesome chameleon, the creature's scaly skin melded into smooth, pale flesh as it shrank in stature and transformed into a man. A ghastly scene followed as, gasping his last breaths, covered in dirt and blood, he revealed his story. A descendant of a family cursed generations ago for meddling with dark forces, an entity that was ultimately betrayed by its creators. In the moments before his transformation, he expressed regret for those he had killed and maimed, 
an uncontrollable requirement for sustaining the curse over time. His words shook us to our core before his life slipped away. The curse dissipated with his dying breath, leaving only a fragmented echo of sorrow and desperation throughout Blackstone Lake. The spectral shadows cast by this monstrous form no longer plague this beautiful landscape. As mandatory as it was to have an ending to this harrowing tale, each loose thread was conclusively traced back to its mysterious origins. The truth is indispensable, but finding it puts to rest one painful and terrifying chapter of our lives. Forevermore. When patrolling that same serene expanse of wilderness surrounding Blackstone Lake, I make sure to close my eyes just a little bit more tightly so that any lingering memories or echoes do not seep into my heart and haunt my dreams. The one thing is certain, no matter how hard I try, some horrors persist beneath even nature's most tranquil surfaces. I still remember the time I volunteered to take part in a study on wildlife behavior near the remote Alaskan village of Attu. It was an incredible experience, though not one I would want to go through again. My name is Tahitian Grey Owl, and this is the chilling story of how I encountered something truly terrifying. In the third week of my research assignment, I started noticing something odd about the wildlife in the area. The usually abundant populations of caribou and reindeer seemed to vanish without a trace. There were no signs of predators, hunters, or disease, just an eerie quiet that seemed unnatural. One night, as I sat around a campfire with some local friends, we noticed strange noises coming from outside our campsite. It sounded like a mix between a high-pitched screech and footfalls crunching through the ice and snow. We brushed it off as just some stray animals wandering around. But soon, we started finding carcasses, mangled, torn apart remains of reindeer and other mammals, scattered across the land. Whatever had killed them had done so with savagery biting chunks out of their flesh and leaving nothing but bones behind. As we investigated further, word spread among the locals about an old legend whispered through generations. An unnamed terror haunted these lands, cursed by God or brought by ancient forces. No one knew for sure what it was, but some kind of monstrous creature that stalked its prey with unrelenting determination. I tried to stay skeptical about it all. After all, until now, science had served me well enough to explain any mystery in this world. However, even my logical mind couldn't ignore what was happening right before my eyes. The sightings became more frequent and closer to our camps. Large claw marks on tree trunks ten feet above ground level, mutilated prey strewn across desolate plains with hardly any explanation provided by known native species. The villagers were nervous, and their uneasiness eventually began to affect even me. It was one particularly cold and dark night when we heard the sound again, this time so close to our camp that it felt like the very air was shivering with terror around us. Those unsettling notes of screeching mixed with heavy thuds in the snow seemed undeniably ominous. We grabbed flashlights, knives, and whatever makeshift weaponry we could find and ventured cautiously outside to confront whatever or whoever was terrorizing our camp. We could barely make out a large figure in the darkness, a tall, hulking shape that seemed to blend into the shadows as if it were a figment of our collective imagination. It moved with incredible speed, causing us to barely keep up as we chased it into the forest. We followed it up until we reached a small clearing, where the creature had stopped to examine something on the ground. As our flashlights fell upon its features, I saw something I had never imagined possible, 
An immense beast with shaggy fur and long, sharp claws flexing menacingly from its muscular limbs. Its fierce eyes glowed red, reflecting and mocking our fragile humanity. Seeing us approach, the creature suddenly sprang into action, darting away at an unearthly pace that dwarfed any animal I'd encountered before. Our group was winded and exhausted from our pursuit through thick forests and icy grounds. We stood in that clearing, staring at each other, shock painted on our faces. In the following days, we attempted to rationalize what we'd seen. Maybe a bear or some other known animal couldn't be identified due to fear and harsh conditions. But deep down, we knew that what we'd encountered was far more sinister than anything found in nature's balanced ecosystem. Whether it was some primordial deity's cruel invention or a bygone creature cursed by fate itself, it remained unnamed lurking in the frozen shadows of Alaska's wild expanse. Something that generations of villagers knew in their bones all too well. Hearing a twig snap behind me, I whirl around to find nothing but a startled rabbit scampering away from the remnants of its burrow, destroyed by the monstrous creature's relentless pursuit of prey. We decided to confront this nameless horror once and for all. While we couldn't fathom how powerful it was, what we did understand was that no one would ever be safe as long as it lurked in the shadows of Atu. We devised a plan to lure it out of hiding by performing a ritual gathered from ancient village records, one that we hoped would summon the creature to us. The ritual involved burning specific plants found around the area, drawing rune-like symbols on the ground and chanting mysterious phrases passed down through generations. We waited until Tuesday at exactly 4.13 p.m. while the sun was setting, casting long shadows over the landscape. It was said to be the moment when the barriers between our reality and that of monsters were weakest. As we began the ominous ritual, fear clawed at my insides, but I held on to hope believing this could be the key to defeating this nightmarish beast. Slowly, as we chanted and carried out our performative acts according to local legend, an unbearable tension filled the cold air around us. We could feel an unseen presence coming closer and closer as if sensing our lures like bait presented on a platter. Then, just as our ritual hit its peak intensity at 5.37 p.m., I glimpsed a towering figure emerging from beyond the tree lean. It was here. This time its appearance showcased more gruesome detail. Large mangled horns protruding from its head and open sores that oozed some sort of black, tar-like substance. It gazed upon us with rage-filled eyes as it approached hastily but with caution. One villager in our group named Nuka shouted out ancient curses in her native tongue while brandishing an heirloom knife passed down in her family. I couldn't tell if the creature understood her, but it hesitated, seemingly sizing us up. For an agonizing thirty-two minutes, we remained suspended in the face-off, either side making a move. Then, with one sharp cry from Nuka, she charged toward the creature wielding her blade and cut through its foul, oozing flesh with forceful determination. Its response was vicious. It let out a guttural howl and swiped at Nuka with its lengthy claws, wounding her severely. But despite her injuries, she managed to stagger away to relative safety. Her distraction had been enough for some of us to set fire to the plants around our trap's perimeter. The flames roared high and fierce as they engulfed the creature while its screams pierced the air. We watched with bated breath as its body bubbled and cracked under the fire's intense heat. Miraculously, after an excruciating 21-minute struggle against death itself, the creature retreated into the darkness. We didn't have time to celebrate our small victory. We attended immediately to Nuka's wounds while others surveyed the damage caused by this encounter. 
A grim silence fell upon us all as we thought about what had just happened. It was clear that we hadn't killed it. We had merely driven it back into its lair. Yet we believed our actions had significantly weakened the abomination, or at least forced it to think twice before terrorizing Atu again. With heavy hearts but determined spirits, we vowed to remain ever vigilant and prepared for any future danger that threatened our village. Together, we learned what it meant to live on this land, resilient and united in spite of terror threatening our everyday lives. Though our foe had not met its end that day, at least now, within each of us resided a newfound strength, born from facing a monstrous evil previously unimaginable. And from that moment on, we knew that whatever roamed the shadows couldn't take away the light within us. As long as we stood united against it, our fear would never overcome us. The darkness lurking in Atu Forest had not won, but neither had the nameless terror truly lost. I've always felt like there was some unique force guiding my life. As a Blackfeet Native American, it's natural for me to attribute this to the ancient spirits our tribe believes in. I never thought, though, that my own curiosity would connect me to a piece of folklore far stronger and eerie than anything I'd ever encountered in my tribal heritage. It was August 6, 1998, in Glacier National Park. Montana. How could I forget such a beautiful place? Breathtaking landscapes and vibrant flora attracted tourists from all around the country. And as the owner of a hiking guide business, it's safe to say I spent most of my time in nature. That day started like any other, yet I was buzzing with excitement at the prospect of guiding a new group that had just arrived from out of town. Gary Two Rivers! I heard someone shout while approaching the visitor center. It was Dwayne, an old friend from college who had tagged along with the group as their photographer. Come on, Gary, Dwayne said with a grin. You need to smile more often. We're supposed to show these people an adventure they'll remember. We shared some good laughs as we got ready for the day's hike. Our group set out on one of my favorite trails where they could all appreciate the landscape's true beauty. As we walked through tall pine trees and sparkling creeks, everyone seemed relaxed and enjoying themselves. As morning turned into afternoon, we reached an area with a curious-looking large tree that seemed to be much older than its surroundings. The group noticed it right away, questioning its strange appearance. Susan, one of our hikers, said hesitantly, it looks almost human. From that point on, our previously cheerful atmosphere changed significantly. Even though no one could pinpoint exactly what felt off about that tree, everyone agreed it was unsettling. I didn't come here for ghost stories, whispered Mark, a slightly bleer man from our group. I'm just here to take some nature shots, not freak myself out. Despite the growing discomfort, we continued on. But the further we went, the more eerie whispers seemed to follow us. In an attempt to ease the tension while keeping everyone safe, I decided to guide them back to a more familiar spot. Back at base camp after a long day, the group couldn't shake their feelings about the strange tree they'd encountered. I went to consult with my Aunt Julia, an elder within the tribe and the village historian. You've encountered the Aniwai, she said with a grave expression. Many legends talk about this creature disguised as a tree, but you know the Blackfeet respect nature. With hesitation in her voice, she added, our ancestors have warned us countless times that if one engages in cruel acts towards Mother Earth, it awakens. Over the following days, I observed our group becoming increasingly anxious and paranoid. 
Their once light-hearted conversations became whispers of fearful speculations about what they had seen and felt near that eerie tree. On August 14th, Dwayne went missing. No one could find any trace of where he had gone. Desperate for answers, I confronted Aunt Julia again. She hesitated but finally confessed that according to the legend, Anwai isn't just attracted by disrespect towards nature. It's known for its vengeance towards wrongdoings committed by humans in general. In disbelief and grappling with this terrifying reality merging with my heritage's folklore, I did what I thought was best. I distanced myself from Anawai's territory and told everyone to avoid it at all costs. Years have passed since then with no more incidents. Most people have forgotten what happened on those unusual days. But deep down, I still live in constant fear of Anawai's name and the power it may still hold. As the years passed, I couldn't help but feel a growing curiosity about the Aniwai and its connection to the disappearance of Duane. It gnawed at me, despite the fear that enveloped me every time I thought about it. One late night, as I sat alone in my living room with only a faint glow from the nearby streetlight illuminating my apartment, I made a decision. I couldn't let this rest. I needed answers. I began searching for any information I could find about similar events involving strange supernatural entities or evil creatures. As I delved deeper into the rabbit hole of online forums and obscure articles, it wasn't long before I stumbled upon a group that claimed to have expertise in dealing with anomalous beings, the Peculiar Investigation Agency, PIA. Their website portrayed an odd mix of occult mysticism and real-world investigation methods. Intrigued, I reached out and explained my story. To my surprise, they responded quickly and agreed to meet with me. We convened at an inconspicuous coffee shop in town, where two seemingly ordinary individuals introduced themselves as Agent Monroe and Agent Browning. After discussing my experiences and what little information I had about the Aniwai, they suggested that we revisit Glacier National Park, specifically the spot where we first encountered the tree-like being. Although hesitant due to fear and uncertainty gripping me once again, I agreed. With each passing mile traveled towards Glacier National Park, these feelings only intensified. Once there, under a moonlit sky that cast eerie shadows upon our path, we carefully trudged toward the area where I had first spotted that unusual tree. Armed with equipment that ranged from EMF detectors to sophisticated night vision apparatuses, Agent Monroe and Agent Browning navigated through dense forest brush with ease. When we arrived at the location of our fateful encounter years prior, Agent Monroe suddenly let out a gasp. Our eyes followed the direction in which she was pointing, and we all caught a glimpse of a figure. The silhouette resembled that of a tall man, but with the horns of a goat protruding from its head. Shivering with fear but determined to confront whatever this was, I found myself stepping forward. As I did so, the figure turned slowly towards me and its piercing red eyes locked on to mine. I couldn't speak. My mouth was dry, and my heart pounded in my chest like never before. As if sensing my internal struggle, Agent Browning stepped up next to me. What do you want? He demanded with an unflinching glare. Why have you haunted Gary and caused so much distress? The creature didn't answer right away. Instead, it simply stared at us as if sizing up its opponents. Then it finally spoke in a voice that sounded like gravel being crushed underfoot. You humans are all the same. Always invading spaces that don't belong to you. You desecrate nature, harm innocent beings, and then cower in fear when faced with the consequences. The Aniwai turned its gaze back to me and addressed me directly. It wasn't just this land that you sullied, 
your species' wrongdoings have consequences. And now, judgment has fallen upon you. Why him? Agent Monroe interjected in a shaky voice. Why did Dwayne have to pay? The creature offered just one chilling response before fading away into the shadows. Every action has a price. As we return to civilization, processing all that had transpired, Agent Monroe tried her best to explain that these creatures were ancient guardians of nature, and their twisted sense of justice often meant punishing those they deemed worthy of retribution. I never gained closure for Duane's disappearance, or shook off the fear on EY instilled in me. However, I have since become a fierce advocate for the preservation of our natural world, knowing the price of our actions could be higher than anyone ever imagined. Even now, as I recount my chilling story to you, with every word filling me with dread I know that somewhere out there, the Aniwai lurks and watches, waiting to pass its judgment on those who continue to harm Mother Earth. It all started that fateful Tuesday, August 17th, in 2010, when I had been assigned to a small town in rural Louisiana. I remember it now as if it just happened yesterday. My name is Alexei McIntyre, and I used to be a field operative for the CIA, not exactly the most glamorous job. So there I was, sitting at the local dive bar, nursing a lukewarm beer when this old-timer sidled up next to me. Casually, we got to talking about everything and nothing, just passing the time, really. It felt like a relaxed day, that is, until he mentioned the strange disappearances that had been happening recently. It piqued my interest. I wasn't too worried at first. I mean, it's not like every disappearance is something out of a horror story. But then he told me that people heard strange sounds right before someone vanished. Muffled screams and guttural growls were just some of the descriptions at the time. Being an experienced CIA operative with my fair share of sketchy situations under my belt didn't mean I wasn't anxious about what he'd said. I decided to investigate further and found myself talking to more locals in town. To keep things realistic and not raise any suspicions, I pretended to be a journalist working on an article about small-town life in America. Eventually, one name kept cropping up in conversations. Janice Pearson was the last person who went missing. As luck would have it, Janice's best friend Olivia was working at the bakery in town. She shared numerous stories of their friendship and how they would often explore the dense woods at the edge of town together. But now she sounded on edge each time she spoke of her friend, as if apprehending danger lurking nearby. Just as I started to feel helpless about finding any solid lead from chit-chats and reminiscences, a turning point came when I heard an unusual piece of information. Janice Pearson had last been seen at the Rusty Kettle, a rundown bar frequented by bikers just outside town. It was time to pay a visit. As I stepped into the dimly lit bar, the tension was palpable. Maybe it was my presence as an outsider. After a few beers and discreet inquiries, I eventually struck up a conversation with Terry, a burly biker with tattoos all over his arms. We engaged in some classic banter before he turned serious and told me about the night Janice disappeared. Terry had been smoking outside when he spotted Janice talking to someone hidden in the shadows across the street. She looked startled before disappearing with them into the woods nearby. Within moments, he heard an eerie howling and raced after her but got lost in the forest. The longer I stayed in town, the more everything became muddled. Each horrific detail led me to another dead end, 
and I felt my anxiety rising along with genuine fear for my safety and those around me. In a desperate bid to uncover what lurked behind those trees in those awful woods, I gathered up my courage and ventured in alone. The darkness engulfed me as the wind whispered through the branches above. An icy grip of dread took hold and refused to let go as I delved into the unknown. Then it happened. Directly ahead of me, something not human appeared, and it lunged forward from the shadows. It snarled violently, revealing deadly fangs as long as my fingers. My adrenaline surged just as quickly as fear gripped me in its cold embrace. A thunderous crack echoed through the trees as I pulled out my issued pistol and fired off three rounds into its menacing form. It retreated instantly into the darkest recesses of the woods, wounded but not defeated. I managed to get back to town, sweating profusely and struggling to catch my breath. That night I called my assistant to explain what happened, demanding information about any creature from folklore known to terrorize regions like these. As it turns out, there was a cryptid lurking deeper in those woods, the Ruguru. A few days later, when I could muster the strength and courage, I ventured back in, this time fully equipped and prepared. The forest bristled with hostility as I sank deep into where the rigor stalked, but it seemed to be gone. That eerie sound couldn't be heard anymore either. Maybe it learned its lesson from our last encounter or moved on elsewhere. Regardless, I couldn't help but think about Janice and all the other missing people. I wondered if they had fallen victim to this ruthless creature or suffered a different fate altogether. I continued to take diligent notes and file reports back to the CIA, emphasizing the urgent need for further research on cryptids like the Ruguru. As I left that small Louisiana town behind, the unsettling memory of my encounter stayed with me. A part of me couldn't shake off the possibility that these inexplicable creatures might be lurking in other shadowy corners of the world. My journey back to normalcy was fraught with questions and curiosity, transforming my prior mundane existence as a CIA operative into a newfound calling. I began a relentless pursuit for answers, hoping to unveil hidden truths behind the seemingly supernatural events happening all too often across this vast country. As I delved deeper into this previously unknown realm of cryptids, Every new discovery fascinated me just as much as it terrified others. With each step forward, I strove to protect those innocent lives that lived unaware of the lurking dangers that were hidden right under their noses, and perhaps even prevent similar mysterious disappearances from happening ever again. Sometimes, life's just a matter of being in the right place at the wrong time. Or perhaps it's the opposite. I've always thought about that. You know how one small decision can change your entire life? Anyway, let me back up a bit. My name's Tahoma Locklear, and for the last 10 years, I've been working as a park ranger at the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. One evening after my shift, I met up with a few friends of mine. We usually hang out at this local dive bar named The Hollow Log. Now, the funny thing about that night was how we got into this deep conversation about American native folklore, specifically about some creature called Sheep Squatch. Now look, I'm a Creek Native American and proud of it, but I'm also a skeptic by nature. The idea of a mythical creature wandering around out there never struck me as anything more than old campfire tales meant to scare folks and keep them entertained on those long and lonely nights. That was until two days later, when I came across something peculiar during a routine patrol in the park. There was an area where it appeared as though something had been digging, 
massive claw marks were visible in the earth. It couldn't have been a regular animal. Nothing native to these parts was big enough to cause that kind of damage. At first, I chuckled at myself. Right, sheep squatch. I muttered under my breath, shaking it off as just another case of vandalism or some kids messing around in the park. That was until later that day, when I got a call from one of my park ranger buddies over in Cades Cove about livestock vanishing from Mr. McMillan's farm nearby. When my buddy mentioned how there was evidence of similar claw marks all over where the animals had once been kept, that's when things started to get really strange. My fellow rangers and I met up with Mr. McMillan and began to investigate his property for any clues as to what might have caused the trouble. Well, we found our answer later that night when we heard a gut-wrenching cry from the woods, an unholy, blood-curdling wail unlike anything any of us had ever heard. The tension between us all was palpable. Our fears were instantly heightened by that terrible sound echoing through the trees. We pressed on in our search, each of us knowing it was our duty to protect these lands and those who live here, no matter what. It wasn't long until we came across the body, or rather, the remains of Tommy Johnson, a local teenager who often hung around the park for kicks. His mutilated corpse told us all we needed to know, something incredibly dangerous was lurking out there, and it was up to us to put an end to it. What followed in the subsequent weeks were a series of attacks on humans and livestock alike, all of them brutal in their execution. Each time, we chased leads and hunted down possible hiding spots, trying desperately to find this creature before it could harm anyone else. We never got a clear glimpse at our antagonists, though. Only distorted pictures from game cameras and tales told by those lucky enough to escape alive. Rumors stirred that Sheep Squatch had finally resurfaced, just as my friends and I discussed that fateful night at the hollow log. It finally took one close encounter with this monstrous beast, the mix of goat and wolf-like features practically defying explanation, for us to recognize the impossibility of defeating it alone. We brought in specialists with knowledge of trapping such creatures in the hopes they could help us protect our home. Fifteen days later, our relentless chase came to an end. An early morning ambush led by that specialist team caught Sheep Squatch off guard. It issued its horrifying cry one last time before they took it down, putting an end to its terror here in our quiet corner of the world. Of course, the story spread like wildfire, far beyond these mountains and into national news headlines. In the end, I found out that our story of the Sheep Squatch had been dismissed as a tall tale, an exaggeration of the dangers we faced. But those of us who were truly there knew, for in our reality, it was a nightmare we won't ever forget. As the years went by, the legend of the Sheep Squatch and our grueling encounter gradually faded from public memory, becoming nothing more than whispers among the rangers and local townsfolk. I continued my work at the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, a constant reminder of that horrifying chapter in our lives. And yet, somehow, I found solace in preserving and protecting these lands, knowing that we had faced something beyond our understanding and emerged victorious. Our experiences during those dark days forged an unbreakable bond among us park rangers, a unity born out of adversity. Even now, when we gather around a fire on quiet nights, we exchange knowing glances as someone inevitably retells a twisted version of our story. No one will ever truly know or grasp what we endured in our pursuit of that monstrous creature. But therein lies the true power and beauty of life's unpredictability, finding strength within ourselves to confront the unknown and emerge resilient venturing forth to wherever life's currents may take us next.
I've always had a penchant for collecting antique trinkets, a hobby I attribute to my father, who had an astonishing collection in our family home. My name is Nolan Brinkerhoff, and I work as an investigative journalist at a local newspaper in a bustling part of Denver, Colorado. In between chasing stories and exposing truths, I would often frequent the antique shops scattered throughout the city, scanning shelves and admiring various items that promised to add character to my growing hoard of antiquities. It was one dreary Thursday afternoon when I made the acquaintance of Jack Townsend. He was a fellow journalist at a rival publication, but he seemed genuinely intrigued by my collection. We hit it off immediately at a local pub, where we spent hours exchanging tales of our journalistic exploits over pints of bitter ale. A dogman? You're kidding me! Jack laughed as his voice echoed in the empty bar. It was late, well past midnight, and we found ourselves to be the only patrons left of an old watering hole frequented by writers. Dead serious, I replied waving off his skepticism. Marcella Knight told me about it. Marcella was another colleague who had heard whispers of a monstrous creature prowling around the Denver suburbs. According to her sources, this beast appeared to be a combination of man and dog, something akin to a werewolf from ancient folklore, leaving behind mutilated remains in its wake. Jack raised his eyebrows skeptically but eventually gave in. All right then, let's look into it tomorrow. The following evening, Jack and I made our way deeper into the suburbs, armed with nothing more than notebooks and cameras. We were eager and gritty journalists searching for truth among gossip and hysteria. Eventually arriving at the scene where one of the most recent maulings took place, we stepped out under the cover of darkness to investigate. A police officer patrolling the scene eyed us suspiciously as he approached, shining his flashlight on both of us. Hey, what are you fellas doing out here? Jack quickly fished out his press badge and displayed it to the officer. Investigative journalists, we're just looking into some recent reports. We aren't here to cause any trouble, promise. The officer seemed hesitant at first but then nodded in agreement. All right, just be careful and don't disturb anything. We still haven't caught whatever's responsible for these attacks. As we continued examining the scene, the air was heavy with an unusual tension. Jack excused himself to talk to some witnesses who had purportedly seen this dogman on one of his rampages. Suddenly, he returned with an old man who swayed nervously by his side. The man's name was Morris Caldwell, a retired farmer who spoke in a halting voice riddled with fear. I saw it with my own two eyes, he began. I swear! It was all fur and muscle, like a man and a dog fused together into some unholy abomination. Morris' trembling hands fished out a crumpled photograph from his pocket, handing it over to me with a shiver. The image depicted ghastly claw marks on the trunk of an old tree, clear evidence of something sinister. As we listened intently to Morris' account, Jack and I knew we had stumbled onto something much darker than urban legend or wild fancy. Our determination fueled our progress as we dug deeper into various incidents across the city's outskirts, connecting the dots between bodies found torn apart or missing entirely, and their homes exhibiting signs of forced entry. Days turned into weekends spent piecing together the unsettling details of this inexplicable dogman phenomenon until one evening, when the truth came back to haunt us. Morris Caldwell had been found dead in his home. This time, there was no mistaking the marks left on his body. The twisted limbs, the gnawed bones, and the blood that stained his floors were evident beyond any possible denial. The dogman had struck again, tearing apart an old man behind locked doors. 
As I stood there, my stomach heavy with dread, Jack looked at me somberly. Is it ever going to end? All I could do was glance at the gruesome scene before me as a shiver crept down my spine. For the first time in my career as a journalist, I was left without words in the face of a story that held no answers and gave only horror. That night after Morris' death, Jack and I couldn't sleep. We were desperate to find a connection between the victims and the dogmen. We scoured the internet, local libraries, and any public records we could get our hands on. Finally, after weeks of research, we stumbled upon a lead. During the 1800s, an experiment took place in a secluded lab just outside of Denver. An impulsive scientist was conducting experiments on fusing animal and human DNA. His work was heavily criticized within the scientific community and eventually shut down. But what if this man-man's work didn't end there? What if his experiment somehow survived and is now terrorizing the people of Denver? Armed with this newfound knowledge, Jack and I decided to visit the lab where it had all begun. The building was dilapidated, with ivy gripping its walls as if to hold it together. Approaching the ancient laboratory with caution, we both felt uneasy but also desperate for answers. As we opened the creaky door, a stale smell assailed our nostrils, leading us to cover our noses instinctively. And then we saw them, thousands of old, dusty journals covering experiments that had taken place in the lab during its heyday. For hours, we searched through the documents until we came across one series of entries that stood out from the rest. The scientist, whom we deduced to be long dead, had been obsessed with creating the perfect fusion of man and beast. One highly detailed account described his success in combining canine and human DNA. As horrifying as it seemed, this dogman creature was no mere myth. It was a scientific abomination created out of pure hubris. And as disgusting as it appeared, I kind of felt sorry for it. That night, Jack and I decided to confront the dogman. We would wait for it in an area where several recent attacks had taken place, hoping to capture the monster on camera and gather enough evidence to prove its existence once and for all. We were there for hours when suddenly Jack grabbed my arm and squeezed it tightly. We saw it. The dogman emerged from the shadows, a horrifying mixture of human-like limbs covered with coarse fur and the undeniable figure of a dog. Something in me snapped, and instead of fear, I felt pity and an odd determination to somehow get through to this creature. As bizarre as it seems, I tried to communicate with it. I stepped forward, both trembling hands in view, to show I meant no harm. Is there any humanity left in you? Are you able to understand me? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. The beast growled lowly but showed what appeared to be an inkling of recognition in its eyes. Please, I continued. If there's any part of you that's human, you can't keep doing this. You don't have to be a monster. It seemed as if my words somehow reached through the twisted facade of the beast before me. With one last sorrowful howl at the moon, it turned away and disappeared into the dark night. Jack and I stood there in stunned silence for what felt like an eternity. We had faced the dogman head-on and lived. And somehow, my desperate plea had worked, or at least given it pause. The attacks eventually ceased. No more dismembered bodies or signs of gnawed bones were found near Denver's outskirts ever again. While our story would never make it into print for obvious reasons, be they lack of proof or disbelief from our peers, Jack and I knew truthfully what had happened those many nights spent chasing shadows. And though we never saw the dogman again, we would always carry that eerie encounter with us as a grisly memento of the risks involved in our pursuit of the truth. 
As all that was left of the tormented laboratory scientists, maniacal experiment disappeared into the ether. My name is Jeremy Tillman, and I have always had a penchant for collecting antique items. It started with old coins when I was a child, and soon my obsession grew into a vast collection of rare trinkets and memorabilia from various periods in history. I'd be the first to admit this isn't the most thrilling aspect of my life, but it makes for an unusual passion in today's increasingly digital age. I'll never forget the day that changed everything, August 7, 2019. I was at a local flea market in my hometown of Philadelphia, and something caught my eye. It was an old map, worn around the edges and likely dating back to the early 1900s. My curiosity peaked, I paid the vendor and left with the mysterious map in hand. As I studied it closer, I noticed peculiar markings that led to a secluded spot deep within the nearby state park. On a whim, Against my better judgment, I called up some friends, Diana Restrepo, Travis Oliverwood, and Cassidy Montrose, to join me on an impromptu hiking trip to explore the mysterious location. As we ventured deeper into the woods that fateful day, we stumbled upon something oddly fascinating, a set of stairs. The staircase appeared out of place and inexplicable, devoid of any logical reason for being there. Nevertheless, we couldn't help but investigate further. When Diana began climbing the stairs with childlike curiosity, Travis playfully chided her for taking risks without considering potential danger. Diana! Get down from there! He demanded. Oh, come on! Live a little! She rebutted with a mischievous grin plastered on her face. Despite initial doubts about exploring the odd staircase structure, eventually all four of us ascended to the top step, where we discovered a hidden entrance sealed off from plain sight. That was when our seemingly innocuous adventure took a dark and foreboding turn. As we ventured through the narrow passageway revealed by our discovery, we were faced with scenes of utter horror, lifeless bodies in various states of decay, some suspended from the ceiling, others sprawled across the damp, musty floor. This gruesome tableau was accompanied by the nauseating odor of rotting flesh. None of us could believe our eyes, our heart rates quickened, and our minds frantically searched for an explanation. Had we stumbled upon the secret lair of a serial killer? Or were we crossing paths with an esoteric cult unknown to us? Diana fell to her knees, nearly vomiting out of sheer terror. Upon regaining some composure, she muttered, What? What is this place? Breathing heavily, Travis responded, I don't know. But we need to get out of here right now. Frantically navigating our way back towards the entrance, we stumbled upon a small room adjacent to where we had found the hidden passage. Inside was a table piled high with cryptic notes and papers, crime scene pictures, journal entries detailing acts committed against victims, and an array of evidence highlighting the atrocities committed by those who had previously occupied the space. As I skimmed through some of the unsettling content in front of me, my eyes landed on one particular piece, a detailed drawing bearing a striking resemblance to Diana. Look at this, Cassidy whispered as she held up an eerily similar portrait of her own face. It seemed whoever was behind these vile acts already knew us and had targeted us explicitly. A feeling of dread washed over us as we fled from the sanctuary that housed these unspeakable horrors. We knew we had to warn others about what transpired in that unholy place and vowed to bring those responsible into custody. 
The next day at the local police station, after sharing our chilling experience with Detective Harold Gallagher, we received intel from a reliable source close to the department. Listen, I'm not supposed to be telling you this, but the recent victims' files show they were all members of a radical group called the Crimson Circle. The informant divulged. The detective believed the evidence pointed to a deranged individual among the group who was systematically picking off its own members as part of some demented initiation ritual. We left the station with our minds spinning with unanswered questions. We continued our search for answers on our own terms, and as weeks passed, stories began to emerge from various sources, stories that were whispered in hushed circles, chilling tales painting the Crimson Circle as a shadowy cult linked to unsolved murders and other violent crimes. We knew we had to expose them, but we were also aware that doing so could place our own lives in danger. Despite our fears, we decided to dig deeper for the sake of justice. Our search led us to a house on the outskirts of town, rumored to be a meeting place for the Crimson Circle. We decided to stake out the hideout at night, parked across the street in Travis's minivan, cautiously waiting for any strange activity. Hours passed without much happening until suddenly, several hooded figures entered the building. Damn it. I knew they were up to no good. Travis whispered nervously. As adrenaline fueled our drive to unearth the truth, we armed ourselves with makeshift weapons and slowly approached the ominous dwelling. Diana picked the lock, and we silently slipped inside. The atmosphere inside was suffocating. An overwhelming blend of fear and malice seemed to seep through every crevice. As we crept down a dimly lit hallway lined with mysterious symbols drawn in blood, we began hearing faint cries for help. They must have another victim. Cassidy gasped. We followed the sound and came upon a locked door guarded by a hooded figure who held an ornate ceremonial dagger. Before we could intervene, he raised his weapon and slashed his own throat, falling dead at our feet. I kicked open the door, and our eyes met with pure horror, a girl tied down to an altar, trembling with fear. Without hesitation, we untied her and raced back out with her in tow, barely evading several members of the Crimson Circle who pursued us relentlessly. We managed to deliver her safely into police custody and finally saw some semblance of justice when Detective Gallagher arrested key members of the Crimson Circle. However, the criminal organization proved far more deeply rooted than initially presumed. Many within its ranks maintained powerful connections that allowed them to elude punishment and vanish without a trace. Knowing we barely scratched the surface of the Crimson Circle's network, our lives had been irreversibly altered by the nightmarish discoveries we'd witnessed. Fearful that repercussions loomed over us, we reevaluated our priorities. Travis signed up for self defense courses, Diana moved cross country and adopted a new identity and Cassidy began researching occult practices to better understand what we were up against. As for me, I continued my pursuit of the Crimson Circle, working with Detective Gallagher in an unofficial capacity to bring down the devious organization once and for all. Months passed, and I couldn't shake the eerie feeling that I was being watched. One night, alone in my apartment, I received a message instructing me to meet someone at an abandoned factory on the outskirts of town. Although I was fearing a potential trap laid forth by the Crimson Circle, I also recognized this as potentially vital information they would risk slipping by. Upon arriving at the factory, I was met by a man standing in the shadows. His face was obscured by a hood. I cautiously approached him. I have the information you need, he whispered, and he handed me an envelope addressed to Diana Restrepo. Just as he slipped away into the shadows from whence he came, 
Inside were photos of Diana's mutilated corpse arranged in unspeakable configurations, just as we had discovered bodies during our first chilling encounter with the Crimson Circle. My heart dropped as shock and paralyzing dread washed over me. I realized that this monster was signaling that none of us had escaped its grudge. Not Travis, not Cassidy, not Diana, nor myself. The grotesque memento also served as a harrowing reminder that the Crimson Circle never forgets and never forgives. Criminals living in an untouchable realm beyond semblances of justice. I continued working with Detective Gallagher only to find myself one step behind the organization at every turn, slowly becoming more and more unhinged by the fear of the Crimson Circle lurking around every corner. And so, my once ordinary life succumbed to the darkness that had ensnared me as I continued my relentless pursuit of the Crimson Circle, a shadowy evil that consumes everything it touches, including myself. Sometimes it's the silence that speaks louder than words. That's a lesson I learned the hard way. My name is Ethan Gallagher, and I'm a search and rescue officer working in a dense forest in Oregon. The job usually involves hiking for hours to find lost hikers or people who've succumbed to nature's wrath. But what happened to me and my partner, Dave, was anything but ordinary. Day in and day out, we would go on our regular routes, radios constantly crackling with static and trivial conversations about the latest sports news or someone's failed cooking experiment. Small moments of camaraderie that kept the loneliness of the great outdoors at bay. Little did we know that things were about to take a dark turn. The first signs were subtle. We noticed strange markings on some trees over several weeks' time. Following standard procedure, we documented them and dismissed them as unusual but innocuous animal activity. But later on, murmurs among fellow search and rescue officers revealed similar occurrences elsewhere in the forest. Looking back now, it was like one of those slow-burning thrillers from the 1970s when you don't realize how much danger you're actually in until it's too late. As days turned into weeks, our once lively radio chatter began to be punctuated by bouts of silence, creating an eerie atmosphere we couldn't put our finger on. It all changed the day we found Stephen Madsen, an enthusiastic wildlife photographer who had been reported missing three days prior. The discovery was anything but trivial. Stephen wasn't just dead. He'd been brutally mutilated his limbs angled unnaturally like a twisted work of art. The nature of the injuries was beyond anything I'd encountered in my years as a rescue officer, a profile that didn't match any known animals operating in these woods. We searched desperately for clues and answers that would help us understand the menace lurking around us. One day, when visiting the wildlife ranger office, I overheard a conversation between an old-timer and two youngsters about a local legend. My ears perked up, and against my better judgment, I engaged the group in conversation. Apparently, there was an old tale regarding a creature nobody could quite describe, a beast spoken of only in whispers among locals, something feared but never confronted or understood. The idea seemed far-fetched until I recalled those peculiar markings on the trees and the abrupt radio silences. Desperate times call for desperate measures. My skepticism began to dwindle as each new piece of the puzzle seemed to fit in with the others. The creature was known to be relentless, cunning, and completely immune to fear. It was said to track its prey over extended periods and strike without warning or remorse, accepting nothing less than a grisly end for its victims. We remained vigilant but continued our daily tasks, though deep inside we knew something sinister was lurking out there. 
My partner Dave also started to notice things that didn't make any sense at all. Eerie shadows cast without a source or distant echoes of movement that ceased abruptly. The growing paranoia reached its peak on one fateful night when we received a distress call from fellow search and rescue officer Emma Wilkerson. She spoke frantically into her radio as she pleaded for help. The blood-curdling screams that followed haunted us long after they were silenced by what sounded like an ungodly screech. We fought against agonizing sorrow as we found only pieces of Emma's body at the scene. In the months following these grim encounters, investigations determined that several individuals had fallen prey to this malevolent creature. One moment alive and well, the next snuffed out by something that defied logic or reason. At long last, we came face to face with undeniable evidence of this nightmare's existence. A cryptid known only as the Whisperer, rumored to leave an eviscerated trail in its wake. Months later, I received a mysterious letter from an anonymous source reportedly carrying relevant information on the Whisperer. To this day, I can't be certain of the truth, as no tangible leads have emerged to verify the creature's origin. Yet the unnerving feeling that invisible eyes follow my every move persists. Whoever roams these woods now should be aware of what may lie in wait beyond the next shadow. It's our job to keep pushing against the unknown and protect those venturing into nature's embrace. But as for the whisperer, whatever it may be, the uncertain answers will continue to elude us. Our once casual conversations have been replaced by constant vigilance and uneasy silence, the innocence of our camaraderie fading into the background. The forest we once proudly protected now feels like a prison of unspeakable dread, its beauty tainted by the sinister presence lurking within. For all those who venture into these woods with hopes of adventure and tranquility, take heed of the gentle whispers carried on the wind. We may be the ones tasked with guarding nature against humanity's encroachment, but in these haunted shadows, we too are prey to something darker, an unseen predator we alone must face. As I reflect upon what transpired during those chilling months, I'm reminded that sometimes it's not just the silence that speaks louder than words. It's the stories left untold and the horrors left unspoken that truly define our character when confronted by the unknown. Chaos is silent. It's the serenity before a storm that wreaks havoc. It all started during one of my routine search and rescue jobs in Aokigahara Forest, not too far from Lake Crescent, Washington, a place known for its heartbreaking beauty masking the darkness within. Looking back, I never expected what was lurking behind the shadows to crawl into my life and leave a mark deeper than I ever imagined. My name is Cassius O'Donohue, and I am a seasoned search and rescue officer in my late thirties. My life's been dedicated to helping others and patching up their disasters, so when faced with my own, I wonder if this would be my penultimate challenge. I remember setting out for that job after receiving a report about a lost hiker in the woods. Jake Moretti, my colleague whom I've come to call a friend over the years, cigarette perpetually dangling from his mouth, joined me on this journey as we began our trek into dense foliage. What do you think happened to that guy? Jake mused between puffs. It was impossible for me to ignore Jake's nonchalance, but I continued onward without entertaining his theories. The last missing hiker case still haunts our nightmares. The reality of it is too grim to discuss amongst us. As we walked through the thick vegetation with rescue gear secured tightly on our backs, we started noticing multiple abandoned campsites right off the trail. Something didn't feel right, or maybe we were just paranoid due to past experiences. 
The cold wind sent shivers down my spine as it snaked its way deep into the heart of Aokigahara Forest. It felt as if the trees themselves were watching us carefully, whispering secrets that could not be contained any longer. Hours passed by without any sign of the lost hiker or evidence leading towards his whereabouts until, there she was. Standing in the distance was a woman with long, flowing hair and vacant eyes that looked hollow as if drained from searching for a soul lost in the void. Hey, lady! Are you okay? I yelled out. No response. She stood as still as a statue, an eerie sight in juxtaposition to the calm rustling leaves surrounding us. We cautiously approached her, not knowing what kind of scene we had walked into, only to find out she was holding a bloody scalp. As we tried to retrieve some information about the mutilated trophy she held, the woman broke her silence and whispered a name, one so cursed it sent shivers down my spine. William Breckenridge is the name of a known folklore villain who resurfaced now and then, but I never paid much attention to or gave credence to it. We couldn't waste any time. With every second ticking away, we immediately scoured through websites and forum discussions, trying to find complex connections that could maybe lead us back to William. After days of investigation when everything seemed like grasping at straws, we managed to decipher the pattern of his recent attacks, luring unsuspecting hikers into Aokigahara forest before mutilating their lives mercilessly. And then it hit me, the abandoned campsites. It was William's gruesome handiwork that stood hidden beneath our ignorant eyes. Fueled by newfound determination and adrenaline pumping through our veins, Jake and I confronted William during his next malicious deed. He looked like any other man on the surface except for one key detail that set him apart, an air of menace anyone could recognize, a predator lurking amongst prey, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Thoughts raced through my mind as we stood eye to eye, each possible outcome more terrifying than the other. And then suddenly, without warning, he lunged forward, claws extended, ready to brutalize another victim. But this time, he had met his match. We fought tooth and nail, the weight of entire lives lost to William's blood-stained hands weighing heavily on our spirits. Battered and bruised, we emerged victorious as William lay motionless on the cold, unforgiving ground, finally surrendering to his own vile fate. Nothing felt quite the same after that day in Aokigahara Forest, a memory too entrenched to let go. William Breckenridge had terrorized people for long enough. His reign of terror was finally unraveling before our very eyes. One thing's for sure. That case couldn't have been just folklore or mere coincidence. In the aftermath of that harrowing encounter, Jake and I found ourselves grappling with the reality of our profession. We had been trained to save lives and protect others, but we were not prepared for the darkness that lay hidden in unsuspecting corners, waiting for a chance to consume us whole. We sought solace in late-night conversations by the fire sharing stories and mulling over what had transpired, though we knew there would always be a part of us forever changed. Our once clear-cut world of search and rescue now seemed like an intricate web of fate, mystery, and unspeakable horror. News of William's defeat quickly spread through hushed whispers amongst officers at our station. Some expressed relief that such a blight had been eradicated, while others exchanged cautious glances. Would another malevolent force rise where he once stood? Still, life continued around us, as it always does. Missing person cases were no longer just numbers on a spreadsheet. They were personal. The menacing shadow William had cast still loomed over us as we ventured into the unknown each day. Months turned into years as Jake and I performed our duties with a renewed sense of purpose and vigilance. Time began to blur the wounds in our memories, 
but beneath it all lingered an unspoken understanding that darkness wasn't completely eradicated from the world. It simply retreated to wait for another chance to strike. Today, as I stand by one of those abandoned campsites in Aikigahara Forest, I see a note nailed to a nearby tree. Scribbled over its wrinkled surface is a single line. Beware those who pray in silence. My heart clenches tight. I know there is more to confront out there within these seemingly tranquil woods. With steely resolve, Jake by my side, and ready for whatever may come next in our search for missing souls, we march deeper, ever vigilant and prepared for the inevitable. The day it all began, or rather, the day it all ended, was just like any other. My name is Trevion Kingler. I'm a hunter by trade. I spent my life in the Vermont woods tracking and trapping deer and rabbits, living off what Mother Nature provided. It was a life cloaked in solitude and raw purity, with nothing but the scent of pine needles, earth, and honest sweat as my company. Yet on this ordinary mid-September day, something far from ordinary happened. It began as muscle twitches near my left eye, faint at first but intensifying until there was undeniable pain. I dismissed it as fatigue or dehydration. Middle-aged men trudging through forest terrain couldn't afford the luxury of complaining about minor aches, after all. But then the forest went silent. The woodland creatures ceased their chattering. Only complete soundlessness filled the air. No insects humming, no leaves rustling, just nothingness. A feeling of dread spread slowly through me like icy tentacles reaching into my core. I wish I knew then what I know now. That was my first encounter with him. Him, the stalker. That's what I named him days later when his true terror unfurled across my existence. His first victim, whose death I bore witness to because there were many before him and many more to follow, was a wayward white-tailed doe. I found her pinned upside down between two towering birch trees, blood trickling down in a grotesque waterfall from the cavernous gash on her neck. Her eyes were forever frozen in shock and fear, which mirrored my own feelings upon seeing her lifeless body. Thereafter began my dangerous game with the stalker. He teased me with traces of his cruel handiwork, twisted carcasses of creatures strewn across the once untouched beauty of nature that was my home and livelihood. Each gruesome scene escalates in horror and intricacy from those preceding it, from petite foxes strung across branches like distorted wind chimes to entire deer families eviscerated in bloody tableaus amongst lush ferns beneath the forest canopy. With each new discovery, a grim realization started dawning on me. The stalker was not just killing these animals. He was strategically placing clues for me to find them. He was watching me every step of the way. He took pleasure in seeing me grapple with fear and helplessness. How did I find out who he was? Three days after my futile 911 call, met with disbelief and mockery from the dispatcher, under the moonlight's unforgiving illumination, I saw him. Or rather it. A dark figure of staggering height lurked at some distance among the trees, its body grotesquely elongated and wiry. It moved swiftly yet lightly between brush shrubs, blending seamlessly into the surrounding darkness as if becoming one with it, an unseen predator stalking me from within pitch black shadows. Days turned into weeks of living under constant vigilance while delving deep into local folklore to find answers that law enforcement refused to provide. My research led me to accounts of older hunters who spoke warily of forest shadows, 
lethal creatures who once hunted our ancestors, driving them away from these ancestral lands until they disappeared entirely within mythology's forgotten chambers. Only their name lived on, Kin Loss. Today marks ten months since the stalker, in which Kin Loss perpetuated this game while keeping its own identity shrouded in ambiguity. Is it malice? Curiosity? Only time will reveal. Sorry to cut it abruptly, folks, but you know how things go around here. Something doesn't seem quite right outside. Stealing myself, I stepped outside, feeling as though an unseen weight had been placed on my shoulders. I didn't want to face the creature again, but curiosity and a thirst for resolution left me with little choice. As I treaded cautiously through the woods, my surroundings grew eerier by the minute. The usual cacophony of woodland life remained absent, replaced by an oppressive silence that seemed unnatural for such a landscape. Whispers of unease carried across the winds, and soon enough, I came upon another one of Kinloss's macabre displays. A mutilated raccoon lay sprawled across a cluster of rocks like a twisted work of art. I swallowed hard at the gruesome sight and continued on my way. The further I ventured into the woods, the more I wondered if I was just following a trail meant to play with my fears. But suddenly, as if sensing where my thoughts had wandered, Kin Loss emerged from the shadows. The creature was even more chilling than my first encounter with it. It stood before me, towering over ten feet tall now, its slender limbs like gnarled branches reaching down toward me as if longing for something it could not have. My heart hammered in my chest as it approached with deliberate strides, never speeding up. Its movements were precise and calculated a horrific dance fueled by ominous intentions. What do you want from me? I asked boldly, masking my fear behind a facade of bravado. For a moment, Kin Loss hesitated before emitting what could only be described as distressing laughter, guttural and low from its barely animate form. While its face remained expressionless and shrouded in darkness, it was undeniably the antagonist's response to me. Answers! It hissed gutturally in an impossibly deep voice that echoed through the trees and chilled me to my core. Answers? I echoed in disbelief, barely believing I was engaging in a conversation with this dreadful entity. The stalker then did something unexpected. It knelt before me, bringing its nightmarish visage closer to my face, and whispered something that knocked the breath from my lungs. I am a part of you. Your fears, your regrets, your guilt, they have manifested into this form. You've held on to them tightly for so long that they now seek liberation. I gazed upon Kinloss as terror-stricken tears fell from my eyes, unable to fathom this unbearable truth. Was this creature a symbol of my inner turmoil? Did I unknowingly create it? I looked deep into its face and made an intentional decision. Breathing steadily, I let go of the fears and anxieties that had haunted me throughout my life. Gradually, kin loss began to change. Its monstrous appearance seemed to wilt away replaced by an amalgamation of animals from the Vermont woods I had hunted in for so many years. As the last remnants of its frightful form dissipated, I felt a weight lift from my chest. I stood alone in the woods that had once been an integral part of my existence. The atmosphere felt lighter and renewed as if I had been awakened from a terrible nightmare. That wilts away with you. I whispered as Kinloss vanished for good, finally releasing me from the horrors it had unleashed upon me. As I left the eerie woods behind and stepped back into my life, a profound resolution dawned on me. We all have our shadows, unseen companions born from the darkness within us. It is up to us to face them head-on 
and conquer them before they assume control over our lives. At that moment, fear no longer claimed dominion over me, and having truly faced the black shroud surrounding my heart, I was finally free. My name is Thaddeus Kowalski, and I've been a park ranger at Lassen Volcanic National Park in California for nearly seven years now. In those years, I've seen my fair share of wild animals and encountered some strange situations. But the events that took place in the summer of 2018 still resonate with me, leaving me perplexed and slightly terrified. It was June 22nd, Around 2.03 p.m., when I received a distress call from a group of hikers who were horrified to find the remains of another hiker just off the trail. I rushed to the coordinates they provided, trying my best to mentally prepare for the scene that awaited me based on their descriptions. When I arrived, my heart dropped in revulsion at the grisly sight before me. The body was mutilated beyond recognition with entrails strewn across the dirt like a scattered road map, while blood soaked into the earth like an ominous stain. It was almost as if an explosion had gone off from within him. The days following that grim discovery were full of rumors and hushed conversations among my colleagues. It appeared that maulings like this one had occurred sporadically over a span of decades. They claimed it was a massive thing responsible for these gruesome deaths, but no one ever caught more than a fleeting glimpse, let alone identified it. What unsettled me most was how invested everyone seemed in keeping their encounters under wraps. Then on July 12th, at 8.37 p.m., while patrolling near Manzanita Lake, I crossed paths with another ranger named Calliope Demetrius. She had just received a call about two missing campers. Leery from previous encounters with this unknown predator, we cautiously investigated the campsite as night fell and shadows deepened around us. The campsite was abandoned, with tents torn open like a can of sardines and crimson smears across the ground. It was then that we heard the chilling howls echoing through the trees, shaking us to our core. With our hearts pounding and our breath sinking in shallow, quickened bursts, we cautiously stalked toward the sound. A rustle in the nearby bushes made us freeze, our eyes scanning in terror for what was sure to be an earth-shattering revelation. The moonlight illuminated a massive form emerging from the brush as it dragged a limp, mangled corpse behind it. Time seemed to stop as Calliope and I finally caught sight of the creature or animal we hadn't dared believe existed until now. It resembled a mangled bear twisted with elements of a wolf that had been sent through some bizarre evolutionary path gone awry, its eyes burning and seemingly aware of our terrified scrutiny. The monstrous abomination snarled at us with an almost human-like cunning before darting back into the foliage, taking its macabre prize with it. The image of that horrifically disfigured beast is now seared into my mind forever. In the aftermath of that encounter, Calliope poured through files and eventually discovered similar reports over 30 years old. Accounts told stories about a brutal creature, part bear, part wolf, stalking people deep within the park's wilderness. Some were reported missing, while others were discovered in gruesome disarray. To this day, I still don't know what it really was or why it came here. Perhaps it's nature taking revenge on those who disregard its signs and enter its domain without caution. Whatever the reason may be, each time I step foot on those trails, knowing that hellish beasts could lurk around any corner, my survival instincts kick in, and despite my training and intuition, I am crippled by fear. It's currently August 2nd, 1.15 a.m., 
and I just received a call about reports concerning blood-curdling screeches echoing through the woods near Manzanita Lake. My heart sinks, says Calliope, and I prepare to venture out into the night, uncertain if we're walking straight into the lair of the creature that has haunted us ever since that fateful day in June. As we grab our flashlights and take our first steps toward the ominous darkness, a chilling feeling surges through me. It's as if an unseen force watches our every move, anticipating what horrors are about to unfold. Mid-action conclusion. As we continue down the dimly lit path, all our senses are heightened, knowing full well that every nerve in our body is screaming for us to flee. We swallowed our fear and pushed forward, determined to put an end to this nightmare plaguing our park. Upon reaching the source of the screeches, we discovered a bloody scene, unlike anything we had witnessed before. The creature had dismembered the two missing campers, their limbs intertwined with branches like a grotesque ornament. It was evident that the creature was not hunting out of necessity but for some twisted pleasure. Forcing ourselves to look beyond the carnage, we noticed strange markings etched into the surrounding trees. The symbols were foreign and unfamiliar to us but seemed to hold some significance for the beast. It soon occurred to us that this creature was not some bizarre offshoot of evolution, or even a natural being at all. As Calliope gathered her thoughts, she muttered something about ancient folklore and Native American legends she had stumbled upon during her research. She suggested that the beast could be the manifestation of an ancient deity seeking revenge on mankind for encroaching upon its sacred territory. Though we were wary of this theory, we couldn't dismiss it outright. And so, we delved further into investigating this possibility. On August 5th, at 3.40 p.m., after contacting a local tribal elder who agreed to advise us on how we could confront this supernatural menace, under his guidance, we learned of an old ritual meant to appease the vengeful spirit and hopefully put an end to the gruesome cycle. It required us to gather specific elements that symbolize respect for nature's power, everything from sacred stones embedded with fading engravings to specific herbs plucked under moonlit skies. With all necessary ingredients in our possession by August 7th at 11.25 p.m., we prepared ourselves emotionally and mentally for the ritual that would take place at midnight where the first remains had been found, the site being crucial for reaching out to whatever force had sent this monster forth. We began the ritual with reverence, chanting the ancient words as our tribal guide had instructed. The atmosphere was heavy with tension and anticipation as we performed each step of the rite with a solemn determination that gave us an odd sense of unity and purpose in confronting the beast. Upon completing our final incantation at 12.03 a.m., we braced ourselves for an answer, a sign that our desperate plea for peace had been heard. Seconds stretched into minutes that felt like hours with only the thrumming in our chests betraying the passage of time. And then it happened, a deafening silence swept through the forest as if it were holding its breath. Suddenly, a hair-raising howl shattered the quiet, and our hearts skipped a beat at the sound of approaching footsteps. The creature emerged into the clearing where our ritual had taken place, its monstrous form silhouetted by pale moonlight. Once again, we were confronted with its gruesome amalgamation of bear and wolf that seemed to seethe with rage and malice. But this time, we noticed something different. Its eyes no longer burned with anger but flickered with uncertainty. While it continued to snarl at us, we stood firm, desperately clinging to our hope that the ritual had somehow reached its mark. We stared back pleading silently for understanding and mercy. Whether it was a moment of shared consciousness or simply an acknowledgement of defeat, something shifted in those fear-filled eyes. The creature gave one final howl before retreating into darkness as if to bid us farewell. 
As much as we pass through relief upon witnessing this departure, an uncomfortable truth lingered around us like lingering shadows. We would never fully comprehend what we'd witnessed, nor could we offer any guarantees if it would return or not. In the end, we remained tormented by an unsettling realization. Nature held forces far beyond our understanding or control. Now, the only constant in our lives is the grim awareness that deep within the park still resides an enigma beyond our reach. Lassen Volcanic National Park seemed different to us since that fateful night. An eerie air of haunting silence and whispers that circulated among the already fading memories. While our hearts still pound at every unexpected rustle in the underbrush or dissonant call echoing through the trees, we press on as park rangers, our eyes forever scanning for signs of the creature's return.